find that our game creators still struggle to get the respect we deserve as a legitimate form of creative self-expression. We've made a lot of progress, uh, in part thanks to all of you in this room, but we still have a long way to go. And in order to keep our mission going, uh, the Academy depends on the support of its members, uh, its member companies, and its board of directors. And we're very lucky to have a board of directors that are composed of some of the most distinguished and successful uh, people in our industry today. So I want to thank the board for their support. I'd like to thank our members and our member companies. And there's one particular person I want to call out for recognition, and that is Martin Ray. Martin uh, has been the president of the Academy for the past six years and recently took a position in the private sector. But Martin's devoted an enormous amount of time <clears throat> to making the Academy great, to building uh, the Dice Summit and the awards show into what you see today. So Martin, I'd like to ask you to stand up and everyone please give Martin a big round of applause for his years of contribution to the Academy. And I also want to make sure to thank our very generous sponsors. Uh, none of this would be possible without our sponsors' generous support. And you'll see our sponsors' presence all around at our different, whoops, don't look at that, at our different events, look at that, at our different events uh, and areas throughout the summit. I really encourage you to give these sponsors uh, your support and consideration just like they've supported us. There are also a number of activities and initiatives that you may not be aware of that the Academy is involved with. Uh, one of them is our partnership with the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. Now, the Strong is a museum that's devoted to all forms of play, but they do devote an enormous amount of time and space to video games and interactive entertainment. If you're ever in the upstate New York area, I definitely would encourage you to go. And I also want to say a special thanks to Raleigh Adams, who's a long-term head of the Strong Museum, recently retired, but he's uh, here with us today. Raleigh, uh, thank you for your support. And I also want to, uh, there we go, let you know about our foundation. Uh, some of you may not be aware that uh, the Academy also sponsors a charitable foundation. The AIAS Foundation is, uh, has a unique mission of its own, which is to promote a more inclusive and sustainable interactive industry. And they do that through a combination of education, career development, uh, collaboration, and mentorships. Uh, there are a number of young people at the uh, summit this week who are Foundation Scholars, sponsored by the Foundation. These are some of the best and brightest young people trying to get into our interactive industry. And it's important for us to continue to bring in fresh blood and fresh thinking. So if you see those young people around, I'd encourage you to uh, give them your support and encouragement and advice. We need to invest in the future that we want to see, and the Foundation is a big part of that. I do also want to remind you, Dice Europe is coming up later this year, September 10th to the 12th. Um, the last two years we had it in Barcelona. This year we're moving it um, to just outside of Lisbon uh, in a resort town called Cascais. This is a really beautiful place to hold a summit. Um, we know we'll have the regular speakers, roundtables, and social events. We also try to make this a much more spouse-friendly event than what you may be used to. That doesn't mean we're not spouse-friendly here but we uh, go out of our way to make sure that your spouses can be part of a lot of our social events uh, throughout the DICE Europe Summit. Uh, registrations will be open soon, but if you want to get a head start, you can go to the front desk now and sign up. You really don't want to miss this. Uh, we will be continuing with our eSports tournament, which got great response last year, sponsored by Face It. Last year, we were in the arcade area and we played Quake. This year, we're upping the ante. We're gonna bring it here on the main stage during the breaks and at lunch, sponsored by Face It again, and we'll be playing Quake World. And you can see we have some uh, great industry luminaries here competing for uh, the prize. Sean Dunn was last year's winner. He's back to defend his title. So I expect some very fierce uh, competition. I also want to call out our media partners. Uh, we have two really important media partners. Uh, one is our longtime friend of the Academy, Variety Magazine, that's back supporting us this year. And also this year, IGN will be our exclusive broadcast sponsor. IGN is putting us on more platforms than I could ever hope uh, to keep straight, so I have them here. Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, 
PlayStation, Xbox, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. I think next year they'll be streaming to the uh, Nest digital thermostats, but that's not quite, that's not quite ready this year. Um, for those of you who arrived yesterday, we had a number of different competitions. Uh, we had the uh, Top Golf Tournament sponsored by uh, Louisiana Economic Development. And the winners of the golf tournament were Rafael Ruland, uh, Patrick Timoney, Rob Crombie, Brian Hartman, Aaron Thimbolt, and Mike Donahue. Uh, the go-karting was sponsored by Wargaming. console lifecycle with brand new IP uh, is really remarkable. Uh, so Jeff is going to tell us how that happened. Jeff is a game director and Overwatch vision holder. I love that I'm trying to tell you who Jeff Kaplan is. Like, there are two people in this room who doesn't know who Jeff Kaplan is, I'd be surprised. Uh, but Jeff was also a game director for World of Warcraft, and he's also the subject of one of the most hilarious mashup videos on YouTube you'll ever see. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it trust me, when you go home, just look him up on YouTube and you'll see what I mean. Uh, Jeff, come on out and show us what you got. Thanks. Fantastic. Here's the shirt. Thank you. What's up, everyone? How you doing? I'm glad I could be here to host your hangover. Um, I want to say I'm extremely humbled to be in front of so many of you. You guys have created experiences that have made me so happy as a gamer. So on behalf of all gamers out there and myself, Thank you for what you guys have done. I also want to give a shout out to my team. It's always a little awkward at Blizzard because everything we do is a team effort. So whenever we put one of us forward, I like to remind everybody that everything we do at Blizzard is a team effort. And I think a lot of you guys who work on team-based games understand how important the team is. So to my team, I'm honored to be speaking on your behalf. Hopefully, I don't screw it up. So world building is the theme of this year's DICE uh, Summit, and it's one of my favorite things about video games. It's, it's probably the area that I feel most comfortable in. So I was very excited to be uh, asked to talk about world building as it relates to Overwatch. So what I want to do is start with a concept uh, from one of the movies that we made called Recall. And in this movie, it features a doctor named Harold Winston who has a baby gorilla on the moon. And at one point, the, the baby gorilla had never seen anything beyond just boring moonscape his whole life. And he has this moment where he shows baby Winston what planet Earth looks like. And he says, never accept the world as it appears to be, but dare to see it for what it could be. And I feel like this, more than anything else, really sums up the world building philosophy on Overwatch. And I'm going to come back to this later on. So I just wanted to share this with you and remind you of it. So the story actually begins with the project before Overwatch, which was a, a project called Titan. So Titan was to be a successor MMO to World of Warcraft. It's something that we began development on in 2007. And for various reasons, we ran into a lot of trouble on the project. Um, and ultimately, in May of 2013, we had to put an end to the, to the project, which was very rough, because at that time, the team had grown to be about 140 developers, and we were really emotionally invested in what we were trying to do with the game. So as May of 2013 rolled around, we got the team in the room, 140 people, 
80 of us were told that we would be permanently relocated to other teams within Blizzard. We'd go on to work on Diablo, Hearthstone, World of Warcraft, Heroes of the Storm, StarCraft II, etc. About another 20 of the developers would be long-term loans on those projects. And what long-term to us means is anywhere from six months to two years. So you weren't going to come back to the, to, to the Titan team anytime soon. What was left was a group of about 40 developers who were given the task of come up with a new idea for a Blizzard game in six weeks. And if we came up with a concept that was compelling enough, we would move forward and we would make that one of our next projects. If we didn't come up with something that was super compelling, we too would be redistributed to the other teams at Blizzard. Needless to say, it was a very daunting, almost devastating sort of mindset that the team was in because we were unsure of what our future was going to be. And it was during this time that Overwatch was born. Now, I've been at Blizzard for almost 15 years, and I always thought in the early years of working at Blizzard that one of the dreams that I had as a Blizzard developer was having the opportunity to come up with a new Blizzard game. It seemed like it would be the most fun, uh, sort of inspiring activity. But fast forward to May of 2013, we were going through that process in a period of sort of despair. There wasn't a lot of hope on the team. We were very nervous about what our future was. So we started off with an ideation process. And we came up, we, we decided to sort of split our six weeks up into these two week blocks. So we spent two weeks on an MMO that was in the, uh, another Blizzard universe that we haven't made an MMO in. There's a lot of choices for you to figure out which it was. Um, and then we also spent another two weeks on a brand new uh, MMO that took place in a completely uh, new intellectual property. And during this time, almost on the side, we started cooking up this idea that became Overwatch. And where the idea came from was we had an amazing artist by the name of Arnold Tseng who was drawing these fantastic character designs. He had done many of them back on Project Titan. And we were sort of looking at his work. And then at the same time, as we were doing these MMO uh, pitch ideas, we had a class designer by the name of Jeff Goodman who had also been an encounter designer, did all the big raid bosses on World of Warcraft. And he had all these amazing class designs. And we started to think about, you know, well, what if we took Arnold and Jeff, you know, strengths and put them together? And that really led to the project that was to become Overwatch. So this was an early rendition that Arnold did of what the Overwatch lineup might be. And some of these characters were actually taken from the project before, which was Project Titan. Um, and there was a lot of inspiration that we had taken from Titan. In particular, Titan was a game that wanted to take place on planet Earth. And we had this uh, sort of concept of a future worth fighting for that was coined on Titan, but we were never able to figure it out and make it work. Um, fast forward to Overwatch, and we were starting to figure it out more. We had a really talented artist by the name of Ben Zhang, who, this was in, um, I think, June of 2013, where he created this concept picture. We, we started talking about how we wanted Overwatch to play and how we wanted Overwatch to feel. And Ben made this image that I think really holds up today for those of you who have seen Overwatch and knows what the game looks like, this was almost like a guiding light image for us about the game that we wanted to create. And I need to say this for our subreddit so it doesn't implode. No, the, the hero in the center is not the hero who you think, think it is. Thank you for putting up with that. Um, so as you guys know, Blizzard has um, been fortunate enough to work in some very exciting IP spaces and world building is something that we really enjoy doing. It's one of our favorite things. Um, we've been fortunate enough to explore high fantasy in the Warcraft universe. We've been lucky enough to go to high science fiction in Starcraft and then also gothic fantasy in Diablo. And I think any Blizzard developer feels very comfortable in these spaces. If you were go to go up to a Blizzard developer and say, hey, we need an idea for a Diablo dungeon, or we need an idea for a StarCraft planet or a Warcraft zone, this is our natural comfort space. 
But with Overwatch, like with Project Titan, we wanted to push ourselves into a new frontier that we hadn't explored. And at Blizzard, that challenging frontier happened to be planet Earth. Um, and it was really daunting to us. For a while on Titan, we really struggled. Our developers would often ask the question, uh, what's cool about planet Earth? We love these fantasy universes that we explore. We love these science fiction universes that we explore. But what is so interesting about planet Earth to us that we can make a Blizzard game that takes place there? So our first step was to sort of study, you know, how were other games approaching planet Earth? Or what was really going on in, in gaming around planet Earth? And we found, I mean, there's a lot going on. Um, and when you put things like uh, sports games to the side uh, for a second and look at the universe building that was happening there, there was some incredible stuff. So, you know, starting off, um, an obvious one is post-apocalyptic. And some of the most beautiful games of our era uh, were post-apocalyptic. I look at a game like Last of Us, which I think we can all agree on is, is pretty much a masterpiece or a Fallout 4 um, so some incredible work being done in this space, and it didn't feel like there was a lot of breathing room for us to make a new statement. It felt like a very daunting place for us to go. Um, equally daunting to us, because some incredible games were being built in the space, was realism. Um, I think I've lost more hours of my life to the Battlefield and Call of Duty series than anyone. I've frequently told the story about how World of Warcraft production literally shut down for a week when the Battlefield 1942 Wake Island demo came out. I'm not sure how many of you remember that, but we just stopped work and uh, pretty much bombed each other for a week. And um, we actually, it was one of those moments where you get the team talking to you, like, okay, that's enough Battlefield, guys. It's time to get back to making World of Warcraft. So um, we decided, you know, like with Titan, we wanted to go back we wanted to finish the challenge and um, finish with this, wor this future wor worth fighting for. Um, we weren't seeing a lot of games exploring the space of what is near future Earth, but in a sort of positive, hopeful way. And this is the place where we wanted to be and we wanted to explore. So as we embarked on this journey to, to world build what was to become the Overwatch version of Earth, we actually started with World of Warcraft and we looked back on some of our basic tenets of world building from World of Warcraft. And the pictures that I've uh, chosen to show behind me are very deliberate. It's the human starting area of World of Warcraft, for those of you not familiar with it. And it, it encompasses Elwyn Forest, Red Ridge, Duskwood, and Westfall. And these areas are unique because they each have their own special story, but the variation is what was important to us. Um, they very deliberately, our art director on Overwatch, who happened to be the art director on original World of Warcraft at the time, always talks about color theory of location. And these areas in WoW are very deliberately green, red, yellow, and blue. Um, it has an immediate emotional impact on players. Uh, for those of you who played World of Warcraft, I always use the example of that moment when you wander from Elwyn Forest and you cross the river into Duskwood, you immediately have an emotional change that happens in you. You know something different is happening. And we really want to take this concept of variation and bring it into this new world we were building for Overwatch. The other lesson that we learned from World of Warcraft is what I like to refer to as the Burning Crusade lesson. So Burning Crusade introduced a new planet to World of Warcraft, one called Outland. It was very familiar to players of Warcraft 2. They had seen it before. Um, and, and it was familiar to Warcraft 3 players. But Burning Crusade was very interesting to us from a developer standpoint. And I think a lot of game developers and a lot of you in this room, we have a hypersensitive geek radar. And what I mean by that is, we are extremely attracted to things that are different and sort of challenging, more so, I think, than your average person. So we have the, the concept art that I'm showing behind is for zones like Hellfire Peninsula, Netherstorm, Shadow Moon Valley, and Blades Edge Mountains. And immediately, as game developers, we responded to these areas. Like, these are the coolest places ever. I can't wait to build them. I can't wait to go there as a player. 
Well, what we found out over time is that environments like this can actually be very oppressive and fatiguing to players. And in a game where you hope that players spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours, you kind of need a visual and a tonal break from the oppressiveness every so often. So in Burning Crusade, we started to see players hanging out more and more in Nagrand or going to Terracar Forest or even back to starting areas like Stormwind in the old world because they found places like Netherstorm and Shadow Moon Valley so utterly oppressive. So this was a lesson we immediately thought of with Overwatch. Our goal was to make the game very approachable. We wanted it to feel as inclusive as possible. We wanted as many gamers in the world to feel like Overwatch was a place that they were welcome. So when it came to world building in Overwatch, we started to ask the question, okay, we're making this game that takes place on planet Earth where would you want to spend time on planet Earth? What's cool and fun? So what are some vacation spots? So Santorini, Greece, uh, which is the place on the left, um, someplace I've always wanted to go in my life, uh, literally dreamed as, as a fantasy for me, like, wow, it'd be so great to go there. It looks so beautiful. I've seen so many pictures. And on the right is our map called Ilios, which is our homage to Santorini, Greece. So we started really with this concept of um, you know, visit places that people have always wanted to go to uh, and might not ever have the opportunity to get to in their lifetime. If they're gonna spend hundreds, and, hundreds or thousands of hours there, make it somewhere you want to be, not somewhere you're uh, uh, oppressed by. We also wanted to be um, hopeful. I have talked about how a bright, hopeful uh, vision of, of planet Earth was what we were sort of after. Um, so my slide has not advanced correctly, so we're having a technical moment here. Um, so Iraq was another place we wanted to go to. Um, now, if you look at how Iraq has been portrayed in video games for the past 10 years, I would describe it as usually war-torn, a place of conflict, uh, a place of little hope. But Overwatch takes place 60 years in the future, and we were asking ourselves on the Overwatch team, could we imagine a better future for Iraq? Is it really necessary to show dusty streets or bombed out buildings anymore? Haven't we seen enough of that, um, not only in video games, but in the world? So can we please imagine a better future for Iraq? So the Overwatch vision of Iraq is that a, one of the most technic, technologically advanced cities in the world exists in Iraq, and it was built by a, a group of scientists and researchers hoping to make an even better future for people on planet Earth. So that's, that was our vision of it. Um, and where all of this is going, it's sort of that old cliche that Fantasy is greater than reality. Um, and there's nothing new here. It's, it's all about uh, tapping into the imagination of your players. And your players can imagine things far greater than, than we can build them. Um, and we really wanted to, to run with this, this kind of idea that fantasy is greater than reality. Um, and I have a couple stories that, that I think sum this up better than, than any others. So one is the story of Hollywood, which is one of the locations in Overwatch. Now, I grew up in Southern California. While I was in college, I interned for four years at Universal Pictures. And when I was a teenager, I used to hang out on Melrose Boulevard, going into the vinyl record stores and trying to buy imports. God, I'm fucking agent. I just realized. <laughs> so records were this thing. No, I'm just kidding. But um, so I spent a lot of time in Hollywood growing up. And when it came time to make a map in Overwatch that took place in the US, uh, myself and Chris Metzen, who's the creative director, really wanted to do something in Hollywood. We thought it was one of those strong fantasies of you know, people who weren't from California or who had never been there probably would like to spend some time in Hollywood. Um, and we're very fortunate at Blizzard to have an amazingly talented environmental art team. Um, but our environmental art team is uh, comprised of a lot of foreign folks. So we have um, people from Belgium, Sweden, Portugal, Brazil, sort of the list goes on, and none of them are from Southern California. 
So they start building this Hollywood map, and it's looking amazing. Like, they build the streets of Hollywood, and we're just blown away at, like, what their vision was for that map. But when it came to work on the back lot portion of the map, um, they didn't really know what a Hollywood back lot was. So we sent them up on a day trip to one of the studios to check out the back lot, get an idea of what sound stages look like, that sort of thing. Um, and it was fantastic. They got a ton of great reference. But there was this unfortunate moment where they drove through Hollywood on the way home. And they get back to the studio. And they start redoing the streets of Hollywood. And they're, and they're saying just they did this totally different concept. And they're like, we got it all wrong. It doesn't look anything like what we were building. And we were panicked because, it, it, honestly, it looked kind of shitty. You know, the, the new version, it looked like Hollywood. <laughs> And we went back to them and we said, like, no, I, I would rather have the Hollywood as it appears in the mind of the guy from Belgium or Sweden than the Hollywood that exists in the, in the, in the real world. We're not after realism. You know, for those of you who know, we have a map that takes place in London, and we, we have an EMP garage under Big Ben, which makes no sense whatsoever. So it's not about realism. It's about that fantasy. Um, similar story with the Mexican map that we built, which is called Dorado. So we knew for a lot of reasons Dorado was an important story location in Overwatch. We had a hero coming up that was from Mexico. We had a movie that we were making called Hero that takes place in Mexico. And there was a lot of storytelling we wanted to do in this area. So myself and the assistant uh, game director, Aaron Keller, were looking at locations in Mexico uh, to, to build. And we started with Mexico City, but it just didn't work for us. Mexico City is a very contemporary, urban, sort of modern, what you expect it to be type of city. And the map we needed to build had to be coastal for gameplay reasons. We needed the edge of the map to be um, open. So we wanted a coastal town. It had to be hilly. And we wanted there to be a lot of color in the map. We really wanted there to be color, but we were kind of ignorant about you know, the area besides like, you know, Mexico City, we live in Southern California, so we're familiar with, you know, Tijuana and Ensenada, but none of them were, were really hitting what we wanted. So uh, being the utmost top researchers in the industry, we went to uh, Google Images, <laughs> and we typed in, this is literally like, you can type this in right now on your phone if you want, colorful Mexican town is what we typed in. And we, were, we weren't even looking at the picture. We were just looking at the thumbnail pictures. And we're like, this is it. This is perfect. It's so awesome. This is exactly the, the version of Mexico that we, we wanted to, to build. And like I said, we hadn't even blown up the picture. But the one that we talked about the most that really fit the, the gray box block out of the map that we had was this one right here, um, which was just gorgeous, this like coastal seaside town. After we had completed the map, I think it was about two months after, um, someone came up to us and said, um, why are you calling, why did you use Manarola, Italy as your reference for your Mexico map? Um, and I think this kind of is very exemplary of the idea that Overwatch is not about the reality of what the planet is. Overwatch is much more about what we hope the, the world would sort of be. And I promise the citizens of Mexico when we make the Italy map, we will only use reference of Mexico for that. Um, so Chris Metzen, who is our creative director, uh, he's since retired and I miss him dearly. I hope he comes back to us. Um, has a quote that I just love, which is that Blizzard is a hero factory. And he sort of means two things by this. One, um, we, if, if we had to align ourselves in terms of the type of heroes we create, they're lawful good paladins. Um, if you look at Uther, if you look at Thrall, if you look at Raynor, they're all kind of, they, they fit a type. But also that we try to make our players walk away from our games feeling like the hero. And Overwatch, more than, than the, um, the environments that we built, Overwatch is more about the heroes than anything else. Um, and I think it's interesting to talk about how heroes are a part of the world building process. It's not just about these environments that you're building. So, Approachability is one of the top things we care about. We want as many people to feel included and welcomed in Overwatch as possible. So for that reason, each of the heroes has to have extremely distinct gameplay mechanics and also extremely varying skill levels required to be good at those heroes. 
We want some heroes to be very approachable, very easy for players to pick up and play, and other heroes have an extremely high skill cap because we care very much about hardcore skilled players as well. So there's a great variety there. The other sort of obvious thing is the visual design. It starts with the character silhouette and how the character gets modeled, but also includes how the character gets animated and posed. We wanted you know, characters to be very visually different um, and you could recognize them from anywhere on the battlefield. But even more than sort of the gameplay and art mechanics behind how these heroes worked, we wanted there to be heroes that felt approachable to each person. We all like different things. We're all attracted to different things. That's one of the beautiful things about humanity and making a game on planet Earth is how awesome the differences are. Um, so we started getting into the backstories of all these heroes. And we found it to be really, really fun to sort of explore different countries and how different people from different countries might think about one another um, and, and how they're all going to interact. And it became really fun. And what's weird to us is that Overwatch started to spark lots of discussions about diversity. Um, it was a very hot topic during the development of Overwatch. I think it's still a very important topic um, in, in today's gaming world. And so there was a lot of discussion about diversity. And um, we've been both praised and criticized um, for some of our decisions when it comes to diversity. And I think it's really interesting that people think that diversity was the goal of the Overwatch team when it was not. Um, what we cared about was creating a game and a game universe and a world where everybody felt welcome. And really what the goal was, was inclusivity and open-mindedness. We wanted there to be um, this feeling, and, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, and I think they've agreed with it, that um, you know, when I say like you, you might be from somewhere that we haven't represented yet in Overwatch, um, but you could imagine there being an Overwatch hero or an Overwatch map from your area um, and it seems totally plausible. Like, it seems like at any time I could be represented in the game. It's this sort of open-mindedness and inclusivity that were the goal of Overwatch. I think diversity is a beautiful end result that you get when you embrace inclusivity and open-mindedness. Now, we, the, the subject of stereotypes comes up um, frequently. If you are making, we found it, like super challenging to make a game on planet Earth. Azeroth and Sanctuary and the StarCraft universe are far safer. But as soon as you say somebody's from a location, like I probably pissed somebody off from Hollywood today. <laughs> but um, as soon as you say somebody's from a location, um, everybody gets very sensitive. Um, so we've tried to, in many ways, challenge a lot of stereotypes. So I'm not going to tell the story of each of the heroes that I've put up on the screen behind me. But in some way, each of them challenges a stereotype. Anna on the far left is particularly interesting to me because she is a sniper. She is an older woman who is a mother and has a very complicated uh, story with her daughter about whether or not she did the right thing by the way of her daughter. So as you can see, there's not a lot of games you know, featuring older Egyptian mothers who happen to be snipers. Um, we went out of our way to sort of challenge this notion. Um, in December, we wanted to kind of put a thank you out to our community, so we made a comic book uh, written by Michael Chu, our lead writer, that was called Reflections. And we wanted it um, to feature all of our heroes in their home life. We show them you know, in these uh, adventurous movies all the time and doing all these cool things in the game, and we want to show them in their home life. And Reflections um, happened to reveal that Tracer had a girlfriend at home, not a boyfriend, like some people expected. And this is all part of what we on the Overwatch team just think of as normal things are normal. And it's important to show normal things as normal so they become more normal. And um, a lot of people had expected other characters to maybe be representative of the L LGBT community, and maybe it wasn't Tracer. And to us, what was important about Tracer was that she was this badass time-traveling hero first and foremost. Um, I, I was preparing for this talk, 
and I, I took a moment to study some of the shooters over the past 10 years. And as I was looking into these games, and these are some of my favorite games of all time, I play more shooters, I dare say, than anybody, and I, I've poured more hours into these games um, than uh, I'd like anybody to really be aware of. <laughs> um, and I've had so much fun, but I started to notice a trend like as I put the box covers together of these games, and the trend seems to be grizzled soldier dude. Um, and it made me think about um, just how different Overwatch was in so many ways that, you know, when I look back on the past 10 years of great shooters, um, and I'm not trying to say that Overwatch is a great shooter, but um, we aspire to be, um, it's very different to have an LGBT character on the cover and also one who's a female. Um, so it's something that we're pretty proud of. Now, don't think for a second that we don't also embrace stereotypes. So um, I've never had an American come up to me and complain about the horrible representation of Americans in video games. It's actually, um, it's more sad that I think a lot of us Americans see ourselves like this guy back here when it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, really what was happening through this whole process is that the world that we were building and the heroes that we were creating no longer belonged to us. So the fans of Overwatch through fan fiction, through cosplay, through the most amazing fan art that I've ever seen, started to take over the world building and the intellectual property uh, for us. You can ask the Overwatch fans who's dating who in the Overwatch lineup, and it's actually kind of amazing. They have stories for, for all of the heroes and, and what their love lives are, um, and we love it. We think it's the, it's the best thing ever, that it belongs to them. We now think of ourselves, you know, Blizzard and the Overwatch team, we are just the custodians of the universe. We're taking care of it for what our community is gonna create moving forward. Um, and at the end of January, we saw something very special happen. There was an international uh, march for women's rights that, that took place all over the world. And the thing that really caught our eye was that in Seoul, Korea, um, during the march, somebody was flying this flag that had the symbol for Diva, who is our, our character from Korea, who in some way challenges stereotypes and, uh, and in other ways embraces them. Um, but we saw this flag flying for D.Va, um, and we looked into it more, and there was this, um, nas this national foundation uh, for D.Va, which was a feminist foundation for women's rights. And what really started to fascinate me when I looked more into this, I started to read their charter, and I don't expect you guys to be able to read any of this. Um, but it's the last sentence there. So we decided to act for feminism under her emblem, they're talking about D.Va, so that in 2060, someone like D.Va, Diva could actually um, exist, which I thought was just amazing. And it sort of came back to um, that original point that I was trying to make of never accept the world for as it appears to be, but dare to see it for what it could be. And that was exactly what was happening in, in Korea. In no way do we aspire to be a political game. We have no political motivations whatsoever. Um, but it's fascinating to see that the values of the Overwatch team are now being embraced and owned by the community um, in their own sort of positive way. And I, I wanted to end with my team because um, this is my team today and it's obviously bigger than the 40 people that we started with. Um, and a lot of that is because um, we've had a decent launch um, and luckily we didn't get dispersed to, to the winds. Um, we still exist. But I talk a lot about Overwatch and um, sort of the people that it's touched and the type of world that we tried to build. Um, but I want to remind people that, and I hate to use the word because it sounds negative, but we started building Overwatch from almost a selfish place. And what I mean by that is you had a team that was faced with little hope and a lot of despair, and we felt like there was um, failure. It was kind of a dark situation that we were in. And to almost pull ourselves out of that dark situation, we imagined a bright and hopeful world, um, and it all became true. It was sort of a fairy tale ending. I don't want for a second to discount the importance of realism in video games. I think it's extremely important for us as an industry to keep pursuing realism because we need to show people what the world is like. 
Likewise, I hope there continues to be an awesome pursuit of post-apocalyptic games because it's very important for us to imagine what could end up being our future if we're not careful. But I hope in some ways that the Overwatch experience of the Overwatch team uh, stands to show that there is room for positivity and inclusiveness in our industry as well. Thank you guys very much. I hope you enjoy the summit. Thanks a lot. Do you want to They told me don't ever touch the clicker again, so I'll take the hint on that. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, we have a very uh, unique and different presentation coming up next about the interaction between art and science. Uh, Warner von Braun used science fiction artists to illustrate his vision of moon exploration, and the inventors of the flip phone point out that a lot of their inspiration came from looking at the communicators on Star Trek. So there's always been good interaction between art and science, but what does that mean for us uh, in the interactive field? Uh, to help talk about this, uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Jeff Norris, who's a mission, missions operation and innovation lead at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. This guy's job involves driving a car on Mars. It doesn't get much cooler than that. And he'll be joined later by Rob Cunningham, uh, who's the CEO of Blackbird Interactive, and Aaron Kabitz, uh, the CCO. They originally formed Relic, uh, co-founded Relic, and then have gone on to uh, co-found Blackbird Interactive at Relic. They created the Homeworld series, and they've continued that at Blackboard with uh, Homeward, Homeworld Deserts of Karak. Uh, so, Jeff, if you can come out, tell us about your vision. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I lead a lab at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory that is focused on the control of robots and spacecraft. Um, I've spent the, most of my past 18 years at NASA helping to explore Mars. But today I'm gonna be talking about world building and art and how art has intertwined with some of the greatest human exploration expeditions in history. Now, I think a lot of the people here this morning would very much like the world to recognize games as a proper form of art. After all, the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences has arts right there in the middle of its name. And if I were to ask why, I think some of you might say, well, Jeff, games can be achingly beautiful, like this. They can tell enthralling stories, like that. They can make us laugh, maybe even occasionally make us cry. However, if you'd like games to be recognized as a great form of art, I'm afraid that some of you, not all of you, are gonna need to step it up just a little bit. See, great art doesn't just move us as individuals. It can move entire societies. Great artists have inspired riot, in revolution, this great artist inspired the greatest act of human exploration in history. Chesley Bonestell, an artist who studied art and began his career in architecture, producing beautiful visualizations of buildings like this one, 1930, of a building in New York. These were glimpses of the future, but just the very immediate future showing people what their city would look like if this building were built, helping to motivate the investment and the approval of those buildings. But Chesley was drawn to the romance and the storytelling of Hollywood, and that brought him to the West Coast where he painted matte paintings or, or set backdrops for some of the most celebrated Hollywood films like Citizen Kane and, and others. Chesley's other great love, however, was space and space exploration. And he found a way to blend those two passions of art and exploration for the first time in this painting for Life magazine, which many of you may have seen before. And if you haven't seen this particular painting before, you've seen pictures that look like this before. And you probably, when you look at it, you might get a feeling like it's a bit cliche by some modern standards. And let me assure you that when Chesley first painted this, it was by no means cliche. This was the birth of space art. 
Everything you've seen that looks like this really can be traced back to Chesley and some of, of his colleagues producing these kinds of paintings. This is Saturn as viewed from Titan. It was the first of many paintings that he would produce, and each of them he approached with equal parts of artistry and science. Carefully researching every detail, this is Saturn from Mimas, every detail by consulting the best astronomers of his time, pushing right up to the limits of our scientific knowledge, and when that failed, making the most educated guesses that he could. To the, 19, to the people of the 1940s, it looked almost as if photographers had been sent into space. Many great scientists and explorers trace their moment of, of inspiration to Chesley Bonestell's paintings. Carl Sagan said, I didn't even know what other worlds looked like until I saw his work. He also directed some of his talents to science fiction. He produced covers for science fiction magazines like this. Many science fiction authors counted Bonestell among their greatest inspiration. But his work reached its heights when he was introduced to Werner von Braun, NASA rocketeer, key leader within the Apollo program, or what would become the Apollo program. Werner von Braun was trying desperately to sell the idea of a human expedition to the moon. He'd written many articles about this subject, but his words finally came to life with the illustrations of Chesley Bonestell in a series of articles produced for Collier's. This is not a magazine that exists today. In fact, it's not really clear that there's a magazine that exists today that's really like this, but I want to emphasize this was not a science magazine. This was not a magazine for science fiction nerds. This was an, a magazine for everyday Americans, read by the average American. And in simple, plain English, brought to life by beautiful illustrations produced by Chesley Bonestell, Werner von Braun laid out the specific ways that we could accomplish a human expedition to the moon and beyond. If you take a look at Bonestell's work here, it's fantastic, it's exciting, it feels um, marvelous in its depiction of these events, but it also, and perhaps most importantly, felt plausible. It felt within reach, it felt like something that we could do and should do, something that was almost our birthright, a time that, something whose time had come. Interestingly, von Braun and Bonestell did not stop by just depicting the next step of going to the moon, but the steps beyond that, an exploration to Mars. This illustration shows all of the components that would need to be assembled in Earth orbit before mounting the expedition to Mars, and everything that would arrive there on Mars based on the best science of the time to achieve the exploration act on Mars. That act of not just thinking about what was coming with the next step before us, but the leap beyond that, I think made those immediate next steps feel all the more plausible and all the more reasonable because they were motivated by this longer range vision, one step along a far greater journey. Bonestell took us all the way down to the surface of these worlds with these, what might feel somewhat fanciful by, these, by even today's standards, depictions of how a colony might appear on Mars. Now, at the same time that Bonestell was producing these amazing illustrations, many other things were being drawn, many other works of fiction were being made, and by the way, 1950, we need to have a serious talk about gender roles in uh, your films. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that these works weren't important or that they weren't enjoyable but they served a very different purpose. It's the difference between two dudes in space helmets, one of them is a space wizard in a galaxy far away, the other one is just trying to grow potatoes. <laughs> it's the difference between explaining away every inconvenient challenge, any problematic plot point with magical powers and, and technology so advanced that it feels like magic. It's instead choosing to live within just enough of those rules that you leave your audience feeling not only thrilled and excited or scared or delighted, but also with the impression that this was something that could happen 
perhaps even in their lifetimes or in their children's lifetimes. And so, I love that the game industry produces works that are packed with aliens and ray guns, and I'm gonna keep buying them and keep playing them, but there's also an enormous opportunity awaiting those who might choose to fill this great void in the industry today, to tell stories with this amazingly powerful medium that aspire to something a little more than delighting and entertaining, but to inspire as well. This brings me to the core question of this presentation and of the project that we're gonna share with you, which is what would Chesley Bonestell's work be today if produced using the amazing, almost magical medium that you all work with every day? But rather just ask that question. I reached out to the Academy and to some folks like Randy Pitchford, and was very fortunate to find a studio willing to volunteer their time to explore that very question, to just dip our toes into the idea of using this medium to create an exciting and plausible vision for the future of human exploration on Mars. And I'm so excited to unveil our results today. Please join me in welcoming Rob Cunningham and Aaron Cambeets from Blackbird Interactive to the stage to share Project Eagle. Hi everyone, I'm Aaron. Good to be here, man. Thank you. Um, it's a deep honor and pleasure to be here. Thank you to Mike and the Academy for having us and um, to Jeff for doing this collaboration. And to follow Jeffrey's fantastic talk is uh, deeply humbling, so let me just get that out of the way right away. Um, on behalf of everyone at Blackbird, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, we're excited to show you Project Eagle. Um, we initially hooked up with uh, Jeff, and our plan was to make a base on Mars using the Deserts of Karak game engine. Um, so we immediately started being game designers and started doing game design. We started with some small habitation modules, shuttles, things that uh, might populate the world. And we carried along in this way for a little while, but it started to dawn on us that maybe this wasn't quite Chesley Bonestell sized. Um, so we decided to try and take a bigger bite out of the future. There we go, that looks a bit more like a Chesley-sized thing. <laughs> and I'll admit, the first time I saw this, I, I, I was a little concerned. <laughs> I said, a little how, further future than you had expected. How big is that dome, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can't out-influence Chesley Bonestell, but we can out-dome him, maybe. We can out-dome him. We can out-dome him. Uh, um, we started designing a city around the dome. And uh, you can see in the next few slides some of the urban planning designs we, just, we did. I want to point out uh, things like sulfur piles and perchlorate piles. These are things that came out of our phone talks with uh, JPL about the plausibility. Um, the soil in Mars is full of perchlorate. That's kind of bad stuff. But it's full of sulfur, too, which is great because you can make concrete of it. And I'll also, you'll also note that there's uh, lots of solar panels. We thought, well, you know, our Mars colony is going to be sort of a sustainable green colony. So what did, uh, what did Jeff say? Yeah, I nah. said, I'll oh, bury a couple of nuclear reactors. Yeah. That's what we do, so yeah. that's what we did. Yeah, a fission reactor instead. One thing I'll point out, by the way, is that um, the terrain that you see and you're going to see underneath this, this is all real data. Uh, we gave uh, Blackbird orbital data and surface data of, of a region on Mars called Gale Crater, which you're gonna see in just a second. And um, we also gave them all of the reference material we could about our current plans for human expeditions to Mars. And throughout the concept art and through the experience itself, you see the DNA of the exploration architecture that NASA has come up with, but evolved and extrapolated to a point 100 years in the future. So here's some more base layout designs. You can see the dome complex taking shape, some access roads around the terrain, and in the top left there, the launch facility we had to brainstorm what kind of launch facility uh, would accommodate a base like this, and a lot of it would, of course, be underground. Here's it's a nice little warm night. place to live in the cold, dark yeah. Martian night, of course. And we also started doing some vehicles and started populating some scenes. You know, we love vehicles at Blackbird, of course. That's one of the things we do. Here you can see the Curiosity rover and a more Martian movie-like lab rover. Um, and then we thought, okay, well, if we're going to go mega dome world, there's gonna, there are going to be vehicles at this base that are way bigger and cooler and more utility-driven than a, than a lab rover. So we came up with these uh, vehicles here. You can see the yellow utility trucks. 
very similar to the deserts of Karak vehicles, of course, uh, and then the big red earth mover. I'll mention that that lab rover uh, is very similar to the current design for our multi-mission space exploration vehicle. So there's a lot of, a lot of DNA in that one. Mm -hmm. All of these back and forth design sessions took place with Jeff over, over Skype um, almost daily. And you know, it never got old saying we just got off the phone with NASA. We, we, dropped, <laughs> we dropped that one a lot. Yeah. Um, here you can see a concept sketch of two utility vehicles moving away from the dome. Um, it was pretty exciting to see these come together in a way where it felt like the human presence was uh, well established, but not yet routine, I think was the way Jeff put it. So after planning and thinking and dreaming and imagining, um, we went ahead and we made it. So let's go to the live demo now. So again, as Jeff pointed out a second ago, uh, what you're about to see is a 3D representation of Gale Crater. Um, Jeff and his team at JPL provided the radar data for the topography and the geography, the, the model, um, and of course the satellite images to recreate this location in, in, a, in an accurate and authentic way. Here's Gale Crater. You can see the little roads emanating away from the base as the camera drops in, and here we are at Eagle Base. Welcome to Eagle Base. It's a small, uh, semi-permanent or permanent colony on Mars. Uh, as you can see from the overlay, it's slightly centralized, but it also has some outbuildings and lots of structures spread out over the desert. It's not just a, a big dome with people, but it's a, hopefully a thriving little community. Now, if you look out into the desert to the north, is it to the northwest? Just to the north, yeah. Over out in the lonely desert, you'll see a plinth, a monument. And that monument marks the spot where 105 years ago, Mars Curiosity touched down. Because as of today, this is the year 2117. And there are 5,592 people living in Eagle Base. Unless and anyone's been born. Uh, no, I don't think anyone, the population count is right up here in the left. Is I don't think that has changed. Um, Jeff, perhaps you can tell us where Curiosity is now. It's somewhere over in these, these dunes or mountains? Yeah, the base is set at a place called the Murray Buttes, and uh, Curiosity today is heading up kind of in the direction of what's called Sagan Observatory uh, on, their, uh, on their map uh, towards those, those little foothills of Mount Sharp, which is the five and a half kilometer mountain that you see right there. We also have the, what we call the census manager map. So here you can see the Mount Sharp data, uh, topography data. Curiosity would be somewhere up here in this road area. And I love this view because uh, everything in the base, if you click on it, it pops up descriptions of them explaining, for example, how the colony produces oxygen and food, uh, where launch and landing takes place, what's inside that giant dome. Um, I love also that you can see the subsurface structure there. Maybe you guys can talk more about that. Yeah, uh, so the colony produces air, water, and food in a number of ways, but mm, some centralization and some decentralization. You'll notice the dome in the center is where many of the people live, but it's also the colony's biggest reservoir of breathable air and uh, clean water. But you can see outside of the dome, if you want to zoom in, Rob, on the there we go. There's auxiliary living quarters and also algae ponds, things like communications towers. Now these living quarters are of course uh, partly buried to shield the residents from radiation, but they're built around a light well so that people have daylight. I think people need daylight. So looking at the underground, underground view, you can see the main well is a little bit deep there. So this is one of the times we consulted with Jeff and his team at JPL to find out how deep you would put a well to get to a liquid aquifer on Mars. Uh, and just to be clear on that, we don't exactly know, but uh, we do believe a couple hundred meters down, uh, there's a good chance that a colony like this could find a source of liquid water. We've just got to discover evidence for water on Mars about 300 more times before you know, right? There you go. <laughs> So now I'm just playing around. Uh, one of the cool things was working with Unity 5.6 Alpha was it's got this cool lighting timeline. So you can just set up four lighting scenarios and just kind of toggle between them where it kind of scrubs time lapse style to the next lighting setup. So here we can see sunrise about to take place. You see the Martian sunrise is kind of going, I think, at super speed here as the sun breaks across the mountain. And we go full day, 
take it over tonight and you can see. Rob, can we catch the uh, sunset? Yep, I think it's coming up right here. Sunset there you go. blue. Yeah, blue sunsets on Mars. On Earth, we have red sunsets and the sky looks blue. Um, but on Mars, the sunsets are blue and the sky looks a little red. So we also wanted to build a colony that looked like it had a little bit of history. The dome is the most recent, it's the biggest structure. But along that sort of central boulevard, you can see uh, outbuildings. And then here at the end, this is the old E-Town. This is the, probably the first place that a colony was established. It's the classical sort of pods and halves and things. And behind it, you can see the original landing field. But way behind that, out in the desert, you can see the new launch facility. Rob, why don't we go there? We're going to zoom in and check that out. So the elliptical landing area here was, uh, we originally we had a big long landing strip like the shuttle would use, but Jeff and his team advised that the atmosphere on Mars is so thin, you wouldn't really get a lot of uh, lift on a, on, a, on a winged body landing, like on a run, runway. So we like the lifting body shape. As you can see, here's our little, our little launch vehicle sitting in its underground facility waiting to launch. And um, the idea was that it would come in and land vertically, sort of SpaceX style, land on that elliptical area, then be relocated, taxi along, and then go down to the underground works here where you can see it gets services refueled and gets sent back up into space. So we can trigger that movie. So I hope you can tell we had a lot of fun thinking, planning, and imagining. This is like the world's biggest sandbox. Thank you. And now if we go back home to uh, sunny Las Vegas. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>I want to thank Rob and Aaron so much. It's been just a privilege to work with, with Blackbird on, on this project. And uh, one really awesome thing oh, is, is that uh, Project Eagle is here uh, at DICE. So in the arcade, we have it set up, and you guys can play with it, poke around and find all the secret little things that have been hidden throughout that base. And I hope you can see in Blackbird's work the spirit of what Chesley Bonestell produced in his time. And I'm hoping that it could inspire even one of you to do something else in this vein, to, to reach out to uh, the consumers that might be very excited by this kind of a vision, this kind of an experience. I'll also be challenging NASA to find new ways to engage with people like you to help tell these kinds of stories. There's a whole universe, I believe, of journeys to write an, an experience out there, and I'm looking forward to what you create. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic, thank you. Well, that was great. You, you get a, a sense of it's, if it's going well, when the back, well, they give you the clicker back there, trust me. The backstage crew is sitting there looking at the monitors going, oh my god, wow. That's always a good sign that a presentation is going well. So we're going to have a, a break. We've got two options for you. Uh, we have the networking break uh, in the arcade sponsored by ISM. And then we're going to have the first round of the Face It tournament for Quake World. So we have Min Kim from Bonfire Studios. He's waiting backstage. And Shilliman Bird from Tencent, if you can run up and get ready. Uh, two men enter, one man leaves. Uh, come back at 11.30 to continue the program. Thanks, everybody. Hello, so I'm here, I'm Dan, this is Anna, and uh, you guys may have heard we have some Quake World action going on, which is, the game's pretty old, but we did this last year and it seemed to go down pretty well, and we've been upgraded to the stage. 
Absolutely. This is the, the second annual Face It Quake World Tournament. We're really excited to bring it your way. We have some gaming VIPs that are here to face off for mostly pride, Dan, at, at this old game, but really kind of stepping into the shoes of, of an eSports phenomenon right now. Yeah, I think this is the game that kind of started things for many people. I mean, I, I, would, I wouldn't be a commentator or, or even an eSports or a you know, professional player at any point any, you know, without Quake, Quake Worlds. It, it kind of defines you know, gaming for me and for many other people. And I think for these guys, it's hugely nostalgic. I think many people consider it the grandfather of all FPS, actually, along with Doom, of course. Absolutely. I mean, if, if anyone watching is not familiar with Quake, what would you tell them about what's cool to watch in the game? What are some things that they could pick out? It's brutal. It's savage. It's really fast-paced. It is unrelenting and it's in your face. And I think that's, I mean, that's what, you know, this the deathmatch genre, right? They created the, the genre deathmatch. That's, that's the best way to uh, put it into one word, I think. We're going to be watching these players face off and they're going to be trying to kind of emulate the best Quake players ever. What are some of the moves that we might see them do or some of the things that we might see them try and fail at that we should watch for? Okay, so the, I think the, the, the most fun thing we saw last time around was uh, uh, last time we had uh, the map Aerowalk, and uh, that map had a red armor, which is you know, one of the most important items to pick up to keep yourself you know, stocked up and winning those fights. And to get that, you actually had to do a rocket jump. And you know, everybody knows what a rocket jump is these days. And again, a rocket jump, that's something that actually came from Quake as well. So it was quite fun to see everybody trying that out, because it's, it's no easy you know, movement trick. So we'll see you know, who's been practicing their rocket jumps. I mean, I already know that a few, few people already learned last year that that's pretty important. Well, we do have some returners from last year and some new faces. Should we take a look at the brackets yeah, now? Yeah, let's have a look. Let's do that. So behind me, you can see the bracket of all of our players we're going to be welcoming. Our first match is actually not at the top there. It's down a little further. We're going to welcome Min Kim and Shellaman Bird, who are welcome out on the stage anytime now. They can come on up when they're ready. Oh, we have Min Kim already over here. Let's give him a big warm round of applause. Welcome Min Kim. And we don't have Shellaman yet, but... We will have him soon. And as you can see, lots of big recognizable names. We, uh, we had many of these last year, so hopefully you recognize a few of them now. Yeah, and this, this will be pretty brutal, I think, because, again, we have a, a best-of-one single elimination format. So, yeah, two players enter, one player is going to go home. Their dreams will be shattered, and uh, that's very unfortunate because that tr the trophy's pretty, pretty nice. And last year, actually, it was Sean that won the trophy, and Min Kim was in the, the finals with him. So I think uh, Min Kim's going to be you know, looking to get off to a good start here. You know, coming to a tournament like this is really fun for me. I've kind of grown up in esports over the last few years. You know, we talk about esports years as, as though they were very long because esports has not been around very long, really, in the scheme of, of video games. But uh, I come to a tournament like this, it's really fun to kind of do competitive gaming without uh, necessarily having so much on the line. It's a little bit relaxing. A lot of times we're dealing with pro players where you win or your career is over, where these people have careers to, to fall back on, I would say. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it is, it is a very cool uh, point to bring up, actually, because it used to be about the LAN parties, you know, sleep, sleeping on hardwood and floors in a room with, you know, 100 other nerds. You know, that's, that's what it was all, all about for a lot of people, just loving the passion of the game and, and the prestige of winning. So it's nice to kind of dial it back into that because the esports e phenomenon has really kind of just well-winded out of nowhere and just taken over everything, I think. I mean, that's, again, why I have a career, you know, standing up on stage talking about video games, so I'm pretty, pretty thankful for that. Yeah, while we're waiting for Shalman, let's hear a little bit about that career for, for people who might not know. What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? So I actually started out with commentating Quake live matches, basically. Really? I used to be a professional Quake player a long time ago, uh, very like, like over 10 years ago, and I eventually found my way back into it when eSports started to take off a little bit, uh, thanks to Face It. Um, and uh, I've just been commentating ever since then. I think people know me from CSGO, actually. And it's gotten to the point now where you know, we were doing contracts with Turner Sports, you know, broadcasting on TBS, uh, E-League, e maybe some people have seen it. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been watching any, any TBS, but it's been there on Friday nights. So uh, last few months, and uh, they just did a big major as well. We had over 2 million concurrent viewers um, across a bunch of different platforms for Counter-Strike matches uh, in a broadcast across television, across you know, Twitch, and all other streaming uh, options as well. So it's, it is incredible, um, and, I've, and that's basically what I'm doing. I'm just commentating and doing, talking about video games. Yeah, I saw some of those records being broken. The concurrent viewership for Counter-Strike was mind-blowing. I mean, I work full-time at Twitch, and the office was all abuzz. Are you seeing these numbers? That's so cool. And did you ever think when you were commentating Quake way back in the day that you were going to be involved in something that that many people would see? 
Honestly, I've thought, <laughs> thought about quitting many times <laughs> because it was very, very tough in the early days. I mean, before the last couple of years, I mean, it was, uh, I think, quite hard to make, make a career for, for many people. I mean, I think, I still think journalists have it uh, uh, pretty brutal. Uh, it's pretty brutal for a journalist, I think, these days still. And uh, you have to be very, very good to make it. But at least we have all these different platforms these days to make it. And there's so much more infrastructure to actually make a career out of uh, esports and so on. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I thought about quitting a few times, but then, you know, it, things took off. So. Thank, thank, thank God for that. <laughs> well, you know, we have, we have time because we're waiting on one of our players. And I think one of the coolest things when we talk about esports and when we have time to chat is kind of hearing some of the fun stories from the past. And you mentioned that you thought about quitting a few times. I know that I've had some hilarious exploits as I actually lived in the Evil Geniuses team house when they had a, a, a team training facility in Arizona. So I have some good stories about living with uh, 8 to 12 young men who were practicing esports all full time. So do you have any fun stories specifically or generally just about what it was like to kind of come up with esports? Uh, well, I, th I think I can kind of relate a little bit uh, to your experience there because when I joined Face It, we were you know, it's a little company. We're based in Milan. We're trying to do things on, on the on the cheap a little bit, um, as you know any startup would. And so we kind of fit everybody into well, five or six of us into one little house. And uh, it's it's kind of a cool little house. It had actually, uh, even though you know there were basically no rooms, it was it was a big bachelor pad for one you know really awesome bachelor. He had loads of money to spend on that bachelor pad. Had a jacuzzi. Had you know loads of like neon lights all over the place. But we were five guys living there with no money. So it was like kind of weird that we had a jacuzzi there. But we lived there for a year and a half. And uh, I don't think it anybody like, used it. Oh. Sorry to interrupt you there, Dan. But it looks like we have a fill-in player. Nice. Come on up. How's it going? How's it Who going? is this? It's, uh, it's good to see that we have people ready to step up yeah. in times of need. Actually, here, I'll, I'll jump to this side. And who are you, my friend? I'm Gerard Block, Chair One Accessories. Awesome. And uh, how are you feeling about coming into this match? Uh, surprised, but ready to get to work. Awesome. Well, I'll let you get seated, and I think Dan's going to have a few words for you here in a minute. But in the meantime, I'm going to go uh, speak to Min, so you guys get settled. And it looks like, Min, you have something to say. Give me just one second to make it over to you. Uh-oh. Uh it looks like Shellman is on the way. He's texting his opponent, so we'll see how that goes. But in the meantime, uh, Min, how are you feeling about this match? I know you're kind of a veteran to the Face It Quake World Tournament. Uh, I'm pretty horrible at this game, so, you know... It feels very weird to put my hands on this game that I played such a long time ago, but now I think Quake is on its 20th year now. Yeah. It's really nice to get back to it. Yeah. It, you know, I remember you doing pretty well last year, despite saying that you were, you were not a skilled player. Yeah, but if you looked at my fingers, they were like crossing each other and shaking and yeah. Do you remember what your standings were last year? Could you tell everyone how far you got? I think I got destroyed by Sean Dunn, who's like an ex-pro player. And this year, I'm not feeling very good because the designer for the map is in the tournament. So that's... That, that's kind of unfair. <laughs> well, you're, you're going to be playing either against Shalaman, who is coming in late, or against kind of a ringer that we're bringing in as a sub. So does that make you feel more or less confident? About the ringer? I don't feel very confident at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Well, any moves that would really exemplify your play style that we should be watching for? You know, should we see anything that's like, ah, that's the min special? Yeah, missing a lot. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. Warm round of applause again for Min Kim. Thank you guys so much. Dan, do we have time to chat a little bit with our, our player, Gerard? Yeah, I think so. All right. Just uh, doing the setup a little bit here. So, Gerard, yes. when was the last time you played Quake? Back in 1999. Uh, I was on Heat.net uh, in a Quake clan back in the day. So do you have any other FPS experience other than, uh, well, well over a decade ago? Yeah, yeah, active now. Big fan of Titanfall. Excellent, nice. So, I mean, how does this game feel? I mean, you, you just sat down for about five seconds, so you're probably not really equipped to answer that question, but does it, is it already bringing back some memories? You, you're feeling that nostalgia? Oh, yeah, yeah. Starting with the rocket launcher is my jam. And Ken, you're going to be playing Min Kim. He, he's, he's not very confident, apparently, from his interview, but he did make it to the finals last time, so how do you think it's going to go? We shall see. I got to dust off the rust. All right. So I think we'll get, let's, uh, Gerard, get back to setting things up. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how this one's going to go, Anna. You never know. When you have someone <laughs> stepping up out of the crowd, we had that last year, and he ended up winning. So you know, good old Sean, who we'll, you know, we'll be seeing him uh, later on. Yeah, you know, I've seen this technique that Min is employing here, this like, oh, I'm not very good, you know, trying to just kind of Get, get his opponent lulled into a false sense of, of comfort, but I feel like we've got kind of a dynamo over here. 
Yeah, it's very possible. I mean, it's a different format this time around as well. We have, again, that best of ones all the way through. It's uh, seven minutes instead of 10 for a match. We're going to be playing on uh, Quake 3 DM6. So it's actually a map from uh, Quake 3 Arena. It does look like we are starting things off here. So Great. And Min, are you ready to get into the game? Awesome. All right. Well, guys, we are going to head backstage. Dan will be taking you through the action as your commentator, and we'll be right back. All right. I'm just going to start, go backstage. All right, the count has begun and we are into the match. So let's see uh, if Min Kim uh, is going to be in the shape he was, his, uh, his final run shape that we saw last year, or whether we'll be off to a bad start here for him. And it is a much bigger map than last time. Arrowwalk was the map we previously played on, and it's a map where you can, you can always find your opponent, you can always get the sound cues, and it's very clear uh, as to what's going on you know, fr from that perspective. DM6, it's a little bit more complex, bigger map, a lot more uh, verticality to deal with in certain scenarios. And uh, we'll see you know, Min Kim just moving around the center of the map currently. And there it is, he's gonna spot Gerard. So this is uh, an important uh, situation for Minkim. He's got some good positioning. He knows Gerard is below him. It's a spot that, uh, oh, it's, and there you go. He's got the first engagement by the Red Armor. He picks it up in the middle of the fight, but the Rockets can make all the difference. And both players in this format will be starting with all of the health, the armor, all the weapons, just to make things a little bit easier. But these Rockets do so much damage that if you take a couple, and even if you pick up that Red Armor, it's all about that exchange. And I think Gerard got, uh, got away much better off in that one. Did so much damage to Min Kim. We can see just down to 11 health after that exchange. And uh, he will be picking some additional health up. But trying to find some more health before he gets into the next engagement is absolutely critical. On a map like this as well, a bit slower paced, a bit harder to find your opponent, those frags are going to go much further than they would have done on a map like Arrowwalk, where it's much easier to trade frags back. <coughs> You can see Min Kim desperately looking for that armor. We'll find a green. The problem with the green armor is that it's not nearly as powerful, not nearly as resistant to damage as the yellow and the red armor. The yellow is the second tier, and the red armor is the, the prime armor that you're going to be wanting to take. It gives you 75% protection in this game of, uh, from damage. So you actually only need 50 health to use all of the red armor. It's another spot there from Min, Min Kim where he will find Gerard, but again, you And once again, we can see Min Kim actually uh, Gerard catching and pulling out the axe. That is a very bold move there from Gerard, just swinging that axe around, taunting Min Kim. And at the moment, he, still, he kind of has Min Kim still on the run. Min Kim not confident to take engagements with such low health and armor. So again, doing the intelligent thing here, just trying to bide his time, get that red armor going before he is confident to take a fight. I believe we have a mega as well on these big pillars. There's the yellow once again. There it is, the mega health. So Min Kim finally, after a good few minutes here, is in a really nice position where he can take a fight from health and armor. However, there's a lot more that goes into having a good fight, and it is uh, in the shots. And once again, Gerard landing a very nice rocket. So maybe we're going to have one of those situations like we had last year with Sean. We get the stand-in coming in and actually doing a really good job so far. However, he does have to make the frag. And we will switch to Gerard's perspective now. <coughs> and see how, how he's going to be uh, faring in uh, finding his opponent. And so far you can see Gerard's doing the smart thing here, just trying to occupy the center map initially, see if he can get some information as to where his opponent is. And unlike some of the other games in the series of Quake, you don't actually make steps, uh, footstep sounds when you're running in this game, so it does make it even more difficult to pinpoint where your opponent's going to be. But prediction, of course, is... Uh, Always going to be one of the most important skill sets in this game. Understanding, you know, exactly how your opponent is thinking in his current position. You know, where is he going to choose to go? And we did tell the players, you know, what maps were going to be coming up in this tournament. Well, it's just one map, uh, Q3 DM6. So they had time to kind of practice and get you know, familiar if they didn't know it. But here we go, another engagement. Min Kim's actually going to find Gerard. And this is the first time Min Kim's really taking the fight to his opponent. And Gerard's actually trying to back away, he's trying to use those rockets defensively. It's lo not looking too bad, actually, doing some good damage going in again in this fight with 25 health. But Min Kim will come away with the first frag. We have a mere two and a half minutes left as we get uh, our picture back onto Min Kim. You can see Min Kim, he took a lot of damage from that fight, so he's going to have to stack up again. He already has the yellow armor under his belt. He didn't uh, grab the Mega, it wasn't spawned just yet. 
It will be spawning relatively soon, but you can see Min Kim just going straight for that red armor. Again, in a good position to take a fight right now. And he is definitely looking pretty strong, but it can all turn around very, very quickly indeed if he takes a couple bad rockets. Again, they do so much damage in this game. It's 110 damage for a direct rocket. But there is the 200-200, very stacked up indeed. So it's going to be very problematic here for... Mr. Gerard to get himself the frag, but he's going to go in and find the engagement by the red armor. Min Kim not having any of it, falling all the way back here, just trying to keep his opponent at arm's reach for now. And there it is, he's going to find Gerard, and this is very problematic, getting pinned into the corner there. Can Gerard capitalize? Looks like he's having some problems in doing so. Min Kim will be able to back away somewhat safely, not actually finding the jump pad to get into safety. And Gerard finds himself the frag straight back. And now there's some problems here for Min Kim. He lost his lead. And Gerard, although he's going to have to stack up again, find that red, find that mega. And again, let's not forget that Gerard just stepped up here. And he will be likely quite familiar with uh, DM6. But uh, he will not have had that preparation time that Min Kim would have had. So it's going to be perhaps a little bit more difficult for him to get his bearings as to you know, where he needs to go for that armor, that health, to get the good positions as well in the engagements. And here comes Min Kim. I think he heard the drop down there from Gerard. So Min Kim looking to try to get that frag, to get that lead. But a closest one out. We're in the last minute here. So this is a very important engagement. Pulls out the boomstick. Not quite the ideal weapon of choice there as Min Kim tries to push the issue. The lightning gun comes out. So much damage coming out from Gerard. And Min Kim having a lot of problems here, finding the right shots to take down Gerard. Giving Gerard so much time here to work in the damage and chip away at that stack of Min Kim. He will be falling back onto the red armor. So despite that very awkward engagement, Min Kim's still going to be fine, actually. He's going to be very happy with that. I'm sure he, that was a, you know, a very intense situation. He was probably sweating bullets in that fight. But everything is going to be all right in the end. 20 seconds left, and uh, we should have the overtime coming in. Let's see if Min Kim can find the frag before that point. It's very important here for Gerard to try to stay alive into the overtime. That will give him a lot of extra time to you know, work out you know, the positioning, try to get some armor and health together. But in comes Min Kim, and we have that overtime. So another few minutes here for Gerard to survive, to try to find a way back into the lead. And Min Kim once again, just allowing Gerard to slip away. And once again, it's very important to try to pinpoint all of these sounds that your opponent makes, all the pickup sounds, if they use drum pa jump pads, or if they drop down from a position like that, it is audible. Gerard just swooping in, stealing away the red armor. That lightning gun did a lot of damage as well. Gerard has put himself in a great position to get the lead right now. He's also found in Kim in center map. Can he just uh, continue the pursuit here and capitalize and make the frag happen? Looks like he's just still at arm's length from in Kim. Min Kim actually able to escape here, and he's actually going to find himself the red armor as well. Another situation for Min Kim where he is going to be pretty pleased that he, su he survived that one. I think Gerard had a very strong opportunity to make the frag happen there. And once again, we can see Gerard, you know, controlling that center map position. You can see so much. You've got a good vantage point to take engagements. Oh, I think he missed his opponent there. Min Kim just sliding around the side there, finding himself some good rocket damage onto Ger Gerard. And now all of a sudden, Gerard, is he going to commit to this? The red armor's up, so he's going to go for it. Steals that away mid-fight. Pulls out the super nail gun. Again, not the ideal weapon of choice. You primarily just want to fight with the rockets and the lightning gun in this, in this game. It's, uh, they are very, very, very powerful in respect to the other guns. The rocket, again, 110 damage for a direct hit. Really big area of effect on the splash damage. The lightning gun does 30 damage per cell. So big, big damage on those guns. Everything else in comparison is uh, pretty, pretty lame, actually, <laughs> if, if I was to be blunt. Either way, we do have the nail gun in hand for Gerard at the moment. I mean, ammunition is actually an issue as well to an extent, especially if you're in a position like Gerard's, where you've been alive for quite a long time. Again, you do spawn with all the, uh, the ammo and, and the lightning gun ammo and the, the rockets, sorry, but it does run out very quickly if you're not careful. So Gerard, we can see he picks up some rockets here. He's got five rockets, no lightning cells. This is a problem because despite having a good stack to take a fight, the ammunition might be quite limiting here. So he's going to need, he's gonna need to be very, very accurate with these rockets. Two rockets being launched there, not actually connecting with all that much damage. I don't think any at all, in fact. And Gerard will make his way back to the red armor. So we might even see another overtime here between these two. Gerard making this really difficult for Min Kim. Again, Min Kim said he wasn't very confident, but he did make it pretty deep in the last tournament. So 
So Mega has been picked up by Minkin. That, despite not having the red, that will even things up. That's a great rocket there coming in from Gerard. And again, this, is, this could cause another situation where we might have a bit of a gentleman's agreement, as it were, to sort of have no engagements until the overtime is hit, because neither player might be confident in taking that fight. Minkim does have all the lightning gun cells at the moment, and we are following him right now, which is very important. And he's got 10, almost 10 rockets, so he's in a very good position to take a fight and close it out. We'll have to see if he's able to do that, though. It's going to take some time to perhaps find Gerard again. Gerard seems to be much better at finding Minkim generally and, and creating those engagements. And you can see him, again, sticking to that center map position, so that past experience that he's had with Quake and other FPS is really coming and shining in this tournament so far. And Kim, again, just on the chase. Gerard, very good at, uh, at uh, the evasive maneuvers there. Knows when he's beaten the fight, just backs away, as you would want him to do. And again, this is, uh, I mean, there is a DM6 in Quake World, and this is not it. Of course, this is the Quake 3 edition, made by Tim Willis, actually. Not this exact port, of course, but uh, the original Quake 3 version of Campgrounds. So it'll be very interesting to see uh, how Tim Willis does uh, later on in the tournament. So Min Kim, once again, taking that red armor. He's been really good, actually, on those red pickups. However, we have some nice pressure coming in here from Gerard with that lightning gun. You can see the damage is just unreal, but those rockets. Eventually, Min Kim's just going to chip enough away at Gerard to take him down. Really nice frag coming in from Min Kim. That could be the kill that does land him the a victory here. We'll have to see if he can hold on for another minute and a half. Again, we know he's good at picking up those reds, but right now Gerard is there. This is really problematic. Min Kim cannot stick around here. Gerard can't actually take the red because he's so stacked at the moment. He's already full up on armor, so that is going to stay up for the time being. And that might be something that potentially could be stolen away by Min Kim. And interestingly, if you're in Gerard's position, you could actually just do some self damage with the rockets. You know, hit yourself, you know, fire rockets uh, against the wall, and you're standing next to that wall, and uh, chip away your armor, then pick up the red. Make sure your opponent doesn't grab it. Because right now, as we can see, Min Kim not only grabbed the red armor that was left up, previously. He's, he's picked up a Mega now as well, and he's trying to fight on the Red Armor. This is perfect here for Min Kim. Even if he takes extra damage, he has that Red Armor to pull back onto. Ammunition is a bit of a problem here. He's going to try to back away. He was in a good position to take that fight, but Gerard is just unrelenting in the pressure, continuing to march forwards here, not allowing Min Kim to get away. Min Kim realizes that he's uh, in a good position there with that advantage. Doesn't want to give it up. Doesn't really want to take the fight. And Gerard now is going to be pushing the issue. Again, the nail gun, it's not going to do too much damage. There are rockets at the disposal of Gerard at the moment. He's got nine rockets under his belt to use to just fling at Minkim to try to get that frag to equalize into another overtime. We'll have to see if he's able to do that. Trying to navigate across the pillars, able to get all the way across. Super shotgun in hand, not doing too much damage here. It looks like Minkim might be good for this. Just 15 seconds left in this one. Can he hold on? He's got good positioning, dropping back in on the red armor. There's not a lot in uh, the stores there as far as ammunition is concerned between rockets and lightning gun cells for Gerard to work with to get that frag. And he's not, he's very far away from Min Kim at this point as well. So two seconds left, one second, and there you go. Min Kim will secure the first victory here of the Face It Quake World Tournament at the DICE 2017 Summit. Congratulations, and let's hear it for Gerard jumping in at the last second, putting up a great fight. And of course, let's hear it for our winner, Min Kim. Now, Min, you, you told us that you weren't very confident going into this match, but it looks like you were able to pull it out. Was that just inspiration given to you from Gerard, or were you just being super modest? I, I didn't feel very good playing it, to be honest. <laughs> I wasn't hitting anything, it was right on screen. But you were able to win, so what do you think made you come out on top? Uh, running around a lot and avoiding stuff and disengaging. Yeah, it looks like that. I could, t I could tell he was a better shot than me, so I had to just keep running away. So you had to hold on to that advantage at the end as long as you could, yeah? Yeah. All right, awesome. Well, you're moving forward in the tournament. Do you know uh, who you're going to be facing next, or do you hope for one of the two? Who's up there? It looks like you will be facing either John O'Connell or Tim Willits. I'm guessing it's Tim Willits, and I'm guessing Tim's going to destroy me, so yeah. All right, well, best of luck moving forward in the tournament. Again, congratulations. And Dan, why don't you come back on up? Thank you very much, Min. And uh, Dan, what did you think of the match?
It was really interesting because, again, like the, the pacing is very different to last year because we had Eric with much, much uh, closer quarters map. They can always find each other. So, we could, you know, as Min said, you know, he realized he had to go for the disengagements. had to understand, okay, I'm being beaten in the fights. There's a lot of ways to, to kind of get out of the fights on this map. And what was kind of cool for me to see is he was very good at understanding, you know, the kind of routes he needed to take to try to stack back up and get on the red armors because he wasn't approaching from bad positions and so on. So, generally speaking, you know, Despite me not hitting the shots, and maybe he'll warm up to that a little bit as the tournament progresses, he, from, a, from an understanding perspective of how to be you know, positionally on the map, he did a pretty good job, actually. It was great to watch these two face off, and we're going to have lots more games coming up. Thanks again to our competitors, and thanks to you for watching. We're going to take a quick break, but Mike will be back on stage in five minutes, and our next match will go live at 1.20 today, so don't miss it. Thanks to you, Dan. Thanks to you all, and we'll be back soon. Bye-bye. Emotional storytelling is very important for us because we humans are story animals. We consume stories, we talk about things in the form of stories, and we remember things in the form of stories. We start telling each other about stories before we could even write. You know, when you create an entertainment experience, when you create an art piece, you want it to be remembered, you want it to be told to more people. The best way to make people remember your game is to create a strong story it stays in their memory longer and has bigger impact. So it is, it is almost the most important thing uh, when you think about making a video game. Games some years ago were really focused on mechanics exclusively and people just wanted to test their skills. And I think the more it goes, the more people need a reason to fight or to shoot. And, and the story is that reason. So um, it's also interesting to see that games with a good story, with good narrative in general, um, are the games that have the higher com completion rate. People want to know what's going to happen and, and they want to see the end of the story and that's what really keeps them um, playing until the end. I can remember uh, this rather profound moment when I was playing a bunch of games on the Amiga that I realized that for me personally, you know, storytelling uh, was going to be most perfectly realized in, in gaming and something that was interactive. Uh, on the trajectory, once I was working, you know, Eco was another standout moment, mainly because there was this beautiful concept about, you know, a boy rescuing a girl. And at the core of the gameplay, that lives in this mechanic of, of literally holding her hand and pulling her through the environment. And so there was this realization then as well that gameplay can, can underwrite a narrative idea in a way that makes you understand it and feel it and respond to it in this much more living way. Uh, and so that was kind of profoundly influential. What excites me about telling stories in games is that added layer of interactivity. We could be making web shorts or comic books or you know maybe movies, but I think there's a lot of really cool ways to tell a story that you can only tell in a story now. And there's a bunch of stories now, that, at least the ones that I'm interested in telling, that can only take place in a game. I think one of the challenges uh, in our young medium in terms of storytelling is is kind of earning our narrative chops. You know, a lot of games fall into the trap of kind of doing and then storytelling, which is sort of something happens and something else happens and then and then and then and then. It's just a series of events, which isn't a story, right? A story, and this is sort of something I've, I've, I'm, I'm echoing from uh, the guys that work on South Park, right? Is this idea that it has to have therefores and buts, right? That idea that stories are about reversals and complications and consequences, not just about a series of, of plot events that occur. And so I think as we, as we mature as a medium, we're, we're finding our feet as storytellers and learning about how, you know, 
story and art is about surprise. It's about the unexpected, right? As opposed to feeling like, you know, you set up, set up a plot and it's gonna, you know, get a good step through the plot and end where you expect to end. It's all about that journey. And that's, if we do that right, ideally, this is the effect where people don't even want to put the controller down because they have to see what happens next. Just like when you're sort of sitting on the edge of your seat in a film, you know, that's what we want to do with these games. Story in game, isn't necessary. I think you can have a lot of games that work just fine without stories, but for the kinds of experiences that I'm personally interested in, I think stories uh, are a way to take the abstract world of a game, which, I mean, when you look under the hood, it's just a lot of, you know, collision volumes and physics and triangles and, you know, wave files and, and this very um, abstract computery thing and to make it something that sort of bridges the gap a little more uh, to the lived experiences that hopefully most of us have as human beings. The audience in the last 20 years I think has um, in many ways a lot of it is growing up um, because you have people who were playing games 20 years ago who are still playing games today. They've grown up and I think they're um, looking for a deeper experience, uh, yet at the same time hoping to have as much fun and relaxation and I just want to get stress out when I'm playing a game. But I'm looking for a deeper experience. On top of that, you have all the new players who are coming in who don't have that. So it gets to be, I think, as the industry continues, you're going to find that the games themselves are going to get more diverse because some of them are going to start catering to an older audience who's perhaps looking for a little more. Um, and the others are still catering to the younger audience who wants to have a great experience as well that's more suited for them. Hello. まあ、映画と小説とは違ってゲームはインタラクティブなメディアなんで、えー、ストーリーテリングをいかにして、えー、プレイヤーからその、えー、と一緒に、えー、二人三脚でストーリーテリングするかっていうところは非常に難しいんですけどそこが一番面白いところでですね、えーとまあ、プレイヤーが、えー、感じながらそれをストーリーテリングと。Ladies and gentlemen, our program will pick up momentarily. If you don't mind taking your seats, we'll pick back up in just a bit. ストーリーの中にプレイヤーを飛び込ませることで、他のメディアではないその没入感というのがそういうのができますので、そこに一番力を注いでゲームを作ってます。For the longest time, I think in the storytelling medium, it was so much about uh, you know knowing what your audience saw on the on the screen. The, the the camera would frame something. You would get exactly the thought that you have in your head and the words that were written on paper through to the to to the uh, to the audience. And at that point, it was only left to the audience to basically you know realize whether or not they understood everything. In cinematic storytelling, games, the interactivity changes all of that. You don't know how they're going to perceive. What you're writing, because they might not interact the way that you expected them to. A scene might basically play out because it's a, it's a, it's a scene that's happening basically right around the player. They might just miss it because they might be looking at something else in the game world, and that's where like the boundaries. I've seen a lot of people come from the cinematic, traditional cinematic side, and not being able to kind of make that leap to the interactive side because they expect the player to do something just like they would expect the audience to do something, but oftentimes the the player does something completely different. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always been incredibly passionate about storytelling in games. That's part of what I think drew me to game making versus just game playing. And, uh, you know, when I think about sort of the games I first started playing, uh, you know, Day of the Tentacle was one of my, my first uh, sort of more story based games. And there were games like Myst. And I look at where we are today, particularly as you. Look at the indie game scene and VR and all of these opportunities. I think for telling story in different ways,、um, it's amazing. Like I think it's really started to inspire game developers to think about narrative in the games、um, differently and also to to sort of embrace it. I think before it was always、um, let's make sure the story doesn't get in the way of the game, as opposed to thinking about how the story really amplifies the game experience. And today there are. A bunch of games out there that are just unapologetically narrative driven. And I think you see on the technology side sort of incredible advances in 
uh, graphic fidelity and animation fidelity. And at the same time, you're seeing game developers really Doctor. hone their craft as directors of, of performance. I've been making, working in games for like 10 years now, 11, 12, too long. Um, but uh, something I found that I think is really cool is that at least over the past like three to five, this, I don't know, this chunk of time, the tool sets and just sort of like how to make a game has really flattened out. And you have like two person teams that don't have a dedicated coder making video games. You have 200 person teams that have obviously everything under the sun making games. But because the tool set is like standardish now, you have a, like a more like diverse set of voices that feel like they can make a game. You have, again, like the one indie or the giant group and everything in between. And I think that's just a byproduct of like Unreal and Unity and tool sets just sort of being a solid paradigm. So once you learn one, you're like, oh, I can just do this now. Like it's, it makes sense the same way. Like, Ladies and gentlemen, like once again, please take your seats. Like, digital cameras and non-linear and once again and ladies and gentlemen really please welcome so to our stage mike of fisher of hi everybody i think they're still chasing a few people uh in the networking break but we're gonna go ahead without them they hold you guys back you don't need them so our our next speaker is graham divine from magic leap uh i'm not going to explain magic leap to you if you don't know what it is you're probably in the wrong conference you probably wandered over from magic and you're already missing the um innovations in rayon seminar. So if this isn't for you, go ahead and go back out. Uh, if you're here with Dice, uh, Graham Devine is chief gaming wizard at Magic Leap. Uh, Graham's an incredible individual, has started working at the industry at age 16 on a port of the old Atari pole position game. And he's worked on games since, including Seventh Guest, uh, Quake 3, uh, Halo Wars, and also worked on the gaming platform uh, for the iPhone and iPad at Apple, a really unique renaissance man. So I will let Graham take the stage and tell you a little bit about his top secret project. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Well, let's talk a little bit about Magic Leap and mixed reality. So, I always start with this slide in every single talk that I give. The only reason to give a speech is to change the world. It's a reminder that I put in front of myself that it's important to actually say something important up here. So what do I do at Magic Leap? What is a wandering wizard? That's kind of a weird game, you know, job description. And there's me. I did all my hangouts like that on Halloween, wearing a wizard hat. And uh, it was very strange. Rony was very upset and uh, you know, very glad, very happy. But um, a wandering wizard goes around from office to office at Magic Leap and looks at everything that everyone's doing, looks at the big lasers and what does that do, and talks about what does mixed reality mean? And what does mixed reality mean in two years when there's still lots of awesome devices, there's still phones out there and still screens out there and iPads? What does it mean in five years? when mixed reality is beginning to take over and mixed reality is you know, starting to be in more places. In 10 years, when mixed reality should really be everywhere. People are often, Graham, that's crazy. But it's not. I mean, the smartphone, the, Apple, you know, the iPhone 1 came out 10 years ago, and now we all have one and we can't live without it. So 10-year revolutions are possible. We have this handy-dandy you know, definition of mixed reality. It's actually important. Mixed reality is the mixture of the real world and virtual world so that one understands the other. This creates experiences that cannot possibly happen anywhere else. And that's really important because a lot of people think that mixed reality is just putting photons in front of you that aren't involved in the world. And those experiences are going to exist and they're going to be cool, but those experiences will always be better on a console or on an iPad or on a smartphone. The unique opportunity of mixed reality is to interact with the world directly. It understands and comprehends the world, lives in the world with you. And if we start to make experiences to do that, then we're on to something cool. So we have, you know, a lot of people like mixed reality is really augmented reality. We kind of have these three realities that we talk about a lot. Virtual reality, I'm in a Viper flying on a Battlestar Galactica and it's cool, I'm somewhere else but I can't see my friends. Augmented reality, which has been around for a while, 
which doesn't understand or comprehend the world, understands where you're at and maybe the direction that you're looking, but everything that overlays on top of the world is just an overlay on top of the world. It doesn't actually interact or mix things with the world directly. Mixed reality, which does comprehend the world, there is a sensor set that understands this is a door, this is a table, these are these words in front of you. And so mixed reality can actually interact directly with the world and put things into it, onto the sofa, behind the sofa, onto the table, under the table. So mixed reality is very different than augmented reality. So I think a lot about four things, and we'll talk briefly about each of those, we'll focus on games. I think about games, I love games, I've made games all my life. I think about media, what's it like to consume Netflix, what's it like to have Netflix? Communication, what's it like to communicate with people, especially the generational differences that we have? And information, what's it like to perceive information on our device? So games. If you Googled augmented reality a year ago, you got this image, which is now very low res up there. But it's a very poor image of gaming and augmented reality. It's doing two things very badly. One, it's using a virtual D-pad. And when I was at Apple, I railed against the virtual D-pad. And game developers would say, the Graham, your, the iPhone and iPad's going to fail unless you give us a joystick. And I'd say, no, you're touching the world on the other side of a piece of glass. It's going to be more awesome. The other thing that it's doing is it's presenting a point of view in a game which is actually makes the game worse. This is just a demo. You'll never actually play this game. Um, you know, game you know, point of view on, on those games is quite different. But as we all know, game developers have moved on, and now there is no virtual D-pads really in touch games. We've all learned to touch the other side of the world. We do evolve. Back in the 1990s, Super Mario 64 came out. Super Mario 64 changed the game industry. We could make 3D games before Super Mario 64, but generally not on the console. Not because we couldn't, but it's because we felt that the audience, the mass audience, would not be able to comprehend three-dimensional levels. It wouldn't be able to know where the, where the jump pads are or, or jump to a platform over on the other side of the screen when you couldn't see it whilst I run towards it. Up until that point, everything had been two-dimensional, showing the whole puzzle on the screen at one time. Super Mario 64 challenged that concept, made games 3D. Now I'm on the other side of a piece of glass being Mario in a 3D world. Unfortunately, game design has not really moved on since then. The worlds are much more beautiful. The graphics are much more stunning. But the world is still on the other side of a piece of glass where I play Master Chief, Laura Croft, and I'm on a halo, or I'm you know, in um, you know, the jungle somewhere inside a, t inside a tomb. The challenge of mixed reality is to move game design on again, and it's really hard because now the games happen on our side of the piece of glass, in our homes, to us directly, or at least the very cool ones will. So at Magic Leap, I often talk about a concept called Ghost Girl. This is just a concept of a game that we have, and there's you know, my ghost Alice, and I talk about how this would actually interact with you. And so in this game, we start with wooden cubes, which are real. The wooden cubes, you, you're learning to play with those, and you're learning to make words, you're doing the tutorial, and you're slowly learning more and more about what it means to actually you know, use a real world object and have mixed reality understand what it is. But in the next room of your house, you're starting to hear noises and lights are going off, and the, the tutorial's continuing. And the, those lights and noises get louder until eventually you go and look. And there in the room, in the next room over, is a ghost. And she's standing there in front of you. And she looks directly at you, because she can, because we know where your eyes are looking. And she points directly at you, which we can do. And then she points past you, behind you. And you look behind yourself. And there on the ground is an outline of a dead body in your house. And you turn back to look at Alice, and she's gone. In your ear, you hear, will you help me? And so now you're on an adventure in your own house where a ghost is helping you solve a mystery that happened to you directly. And you might remember to go back into your living room and go get the wooden cubes to start communicating with the ghost. And Alice and you slowly go on adventures together. She'll teach you things along the way, like card tricks. She'll show you how to do a magic trick with real playing cards. You know, here's a magic trip that you can do. So when your friends come over, they're like, well, how'd you learn that? Well, it's the ghost standing next to you, actually, that's showing me how to do it. Or ghost, or Alice, she's in mixed reality. Or I'll be sitting watching Netflix on my TV and watching Stranger Things. 
And I look over to my side, and there's Alice hanging out with me, and she's watching Stranger Things. She says, well, no one really calls it the Upside Down. Not anymore. And it's not really like that. But this concept they have of putting you know, um, your Christmas lights up on the wall, we should go do that. You should go get the Christmas lights out of your attic. So we go to the attic, we get the Christmas lights. We put A through Z under them. And all of a sudden, we're experimenting with communicating with the other side. My friends come over. Why have you got Christmas tree lights with A through Z under them? Well, I'm communicating with the other side. I'm on an adventure with Alice. I'm doing things in the real world. These are not possible on a console. These are not possible on a laptop. They're not possible on an iPad. These are things that can only happen in mixed reality. Plus, I've made you unravel all of your uh, Christmas tree lights, which is cool. So mixed reality games will inspire and delight the audience. Media is something I think about a lot, because often pe when people talk about mixed reality, they're like, the killer app is Netflix, the killer app is screens. And I'm like, no, Netflix is awesome already. Netflix is really cool. On my TV set, I'm about two seconds away from watching Stranger Things with a beer in my hand, and it's cool. But one of the other things I think about all the time in mixed reality is how can I get hero moments on my device? Hero moments because the only acceptable launch on a mixed reality device is when I wear it and people don't go, take that off. I should be on stage right now. If I, if I was wearing one, you'd all go, this is going to be a better talk because Graham's wearing a mixed reality device. It's the only acceptable time that you can actually start having mixed reality devices in the world. So I think about hero moments where you can do that. This happened in the past. We had uh, GPS units that would go out you know, in, in the 80s, and you were the hero if, if you had a GPS unit because people knew where, the, where, you knew where the road was, and people liked you. But not hero modes as well. And we have passive and active applications. A passive, act, a passive act application is, I happen to know this thing because I'm wearing the device. An active application is, I put the device on to play Halo. And here we have an opportunity with Netflix to have a passive application. Because the other thing I do is I look up IMDb. And all of a sudden, because I have a device on, a passive application, whilst I'm watching Netflix, can tell me who the actor is, who the actress is, who the music is, what episode this is, what's the summary, what's happened before. I can go find these things out passively. And my wife's like, oh, that's cool. I don't mind you wearing the mixed reality device. But we're a long way from Netflix. I believe Netflix will be there. We'll have screens, which are theater screens, which are awesome, and, 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 you know, that we want to be there. But we have to make that 10-year journey to get there. My TV set's already pretty cool. So mixed reality will be the better preferred source for media consumption. Communication is very hard. Communication, mixed reality is you know, you know, an avatar hanging out with me, a projection of something, Google Hangouts in front of me. But, but communication changes dramatically generationally. My parents, they like to talk to each other or on the phone. I like to talk on Skype and, and video. My daughter likes avatars in games and so forth and uses Snapchat. The generation that follows six and seven year olds has been used to pictures all their life of high photonic quality. And that's challenging because you know, their world is very different than mine. Growing up, I used to pay for photographs twice. I used to pay for the film and I used to pay to develop the film. And so what a system that was. Um, and so I attach value to photographs. Even ones I take on my phone, even though they're free, they still have a bias. I still have a bias towards them because they used to cost money. My daughter doesn't. So Snapchat to her is like, it's just a moment, Dad. It just throws away. It doesn't matter the photo saved. For those six and seven year olds, they're very used to high photonic quality of thousands of pictures of themselves. And so communication for each of those generations is quite different. Avatar presence might be fine for my daughter, but the generation that follows requires a photonic presence that we can't yet do. So communication is actually a very hard problem for mixed reality that we must solve. So we want to communicate with our families by mixed reality. And I want to think about each of those generations as we do. Information is something that you know, people think about in mixed reality all the time. It's the number one thing that I get when I ask people, what do you want from mixed reality? The number one thing is like, I want a person's LinkedIn profile right here. And boy, that would be cool for about half a second. Because then you know the person's name. You know what they're going to say. You, you, you know what their name is. Now you want context around the information, around the conversation. You want to have a better conversation because you, you are in mixed reality. And you want the other person to say, I'm going to have a better conversation with Graham because we're in mixed reality. 
Um, and here I think about the five mile rule. The five mile rule is, is a rule I have about applications. The five mile rule is I'm five miles away from my house and I've forgotten my smartphone. Will I go home and get it? Well, yeah, I need Twitter. I need, you know, I need my calendar. I need to text my, you know, my family. I need my email. The five mile rule around, you know, now I think about the five mile rule for my Apple Watch. Well, no, I'm not going to go home for five miles. There's nothing on my Apple Watch that's really worth going home for. Well, how far away? I've locked a door to my house. No, I am in the kitchen and up, you know, my watch is upstairs. Maybe, maybe that far. It's not far enough. And we need to be talking about the five mile applications for mixed reality right now. We may not be making them. We may not understand them all. It may take 10 years to get there as it did with the iPhone. But if we don't talk to what the use is actually going to be, the mixed reality will fail. The mixed reality information also has to be something where I put the device on and no one minds that I have it on in a room or in a conversation. It has to be acceptable to wear the thing in public, to wear the thing outside, to go to have conversations in it. Because we want conversations to be better. People want that LinkedIn profile. If you Google uh, you know, augmented reality, this is what you get. This is terrible, this is crap, this is awful. This is just information on top of the world. You will use this example once. This is not a Yelp app that you will go and say, oh boy, I must bring that up and see what's cool. This one's slightly better. This one's the French metro system. This one starts to show some directionality, but it's not integrated with the world. It's the, it, it could also be a tourist death trap, I suppose, but it's one of those. Then of course, the best example of augmented reality right now is Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go's awesome. You know, it's, you know, it, it places things into the world. I have the camera on, and it's cool. But do you remember the teaser trailer? When the stuff was actually in the world, when the stuff actually splashed in the water, it went behind the bridge, and it was hiding out with the plants? That's the even cooler version. And so mixed reality versions of Pokemon Go will be even better still. So with information, I will be more informed and aware of where I am and what I'm doing. This is the world that we have to kill. This world sucks. This world must die. We must destroy this. When you go to concerts or when you go to a school play or when you go anywhere, you know, graduation, people all lift up their four-inch phones, hang it over their heads, and take video of what's in front of them. And you've got to be present in those moments. You have to be present at your school play. You have to be present at a concert. You have to be present at a graduation. Watching a two-dimensional image record it is not being present. So if I, I can do one thing with mixed reality, it'd be to, to, it'd be to return presence to the world. I think that's vitally important. Platform is also important. This is perhaps the most important point of my talk. A mixed reality must be a separate platform. It has to be as different as television. It has to be perceived as being differently as television is from radio, as radio is from newspaper. If it's perceived as an add-on to a computer, an add-on to a console, and not an add-on to a mobile device, it is, it is not truly perceived as a separate platform. The public has to perceive it as something completely different. And as developers, we have to treat it differently. We have to use different words around it. You, you know, we can't say App Store. We can't you know, look, look at it as a mobile device. We all know how much mobile software costs. It can't just be an add-on to a computer. It can't just be something that, that, that depends on already existing infrastructure on computers or consoles. We need to create a compelling platform that people will line up for for four days at Best Buy, in the rain, in the snow, and go and do that. And I think we've seen recently that you know, if it's not a platform, it's just kind of seen as an ad, a, an accessory. And we need mixed reality to be something quite different. The challenge is for the game industry is that we're the only ones who can do this. Software, up until now, has been on a two-dimensional screen. Almost all of it in the world hurries up to show you something and then waits for the user, just like this PowerPoint. But in mixed reality, I'm walking around the world. I'm integral to the world. I'm moving through, through the world. 
And so those applications have to do something interesting with that as well. They have to live with me. They have to have context around me. They have to, to know that it is morning or it is afternoon or it is night or it is, you know, I am in a meeting or I am shopping. They have to do interesting things. And the only industry that makes computer software that actually interacts with you constantly is games. And so those UX designers, those game designers, those programmers, the, the, the tools that we use will be the tools that will fill every vertical in mixed reality. So yes, I'm at a games conference, but I'm looking at the future of mixed reality in front of me. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much. Humor is one of the hardest emotions to capture in video gaming. You know, we're great at emotions like excitement or fear or frustration. A lot of games are really good with frustration, but humor is very elusive. You know, I had the chance to play the first game from Squanch Tindo, a VR experience called Accounting. It is literally fall down funny. You betcha. It was really magical how they were able to capture that and to create an entire studio built on the premise of putting humor in games is something that's uh, very brave and very daring. So we have the two co-founders of Squanch Tindo here to talk about how they made that happen. And moderating this discussion will be Jeff Keeley, a video game journalist and host of the Game Awards, whom I'm sure you all know. Uh, he'll be talking to Tanya Watson, a Squanch Tindo co-founder and former colleague of mine, oops, former colleague of mine from Epic Games, where she was a producer on the Gears of War series as well as Bulletstorm. Uh, fun facts on Tanya, she was a, formerly a professional Counter-Strike player and a champion level DDR dancer, so a woman of a uh, number of different talents. Uh, my notes on uh, Justin Roiland are more limiting. It just says kind to children and animals. Uh, but I do know that he was also the co-creator of the funniest TV show I've ever seen, Adventures of Rick and Morty, where he also provided a lot of the voices. He's an enthusiastic gamer and lending his skills to the new Squanch Tindo product. So Jeff, Tanya, Justin, come on out, and let's show us what you got. Fantastic. Thank Good you. to see you. Hello, everyone. Hey, thank you. Tanya and Justin. Uh, well, it is great to be here at DICE 2017. And when I, uh, Mike kindly asked me to moderate this, I was so excited because uh, you know, I've known Tanya for a long time. And Justin, uh, of course, we know Rick and Morty. Um, and I think many folks in the audience are fans. How many people watch Rick and Morty? Crowd? Hey, all right. Thank yeah. you. You're amongst your people. <laughs> um, well, we know you're busy working on season three. I saw a tweet that there's a script for episode one, so it sounds like you're in the midst of all that, <laughs> we right? We just started writing. <laughs> no, we're posting, so it's, it's not too far. Yes. All right, well, um, that's great news, but we want to talk about Squanch Tendo and the fact that, you know, something I've always admired about you, Justin, is that... Uh, You've, you've been a gamer for a long time, we're getting into that, but you've really approached getting into games in such an interesting way and working with awesome people like Tanya, and we'll talk about some of the other partners, but whenever I, I, I've seen you at events over the years, and it's been clear that you really want to do this right if you do something in the gaming world. Let's talk, by way of background, we know obviously all the television stuff you've done, you know, amazing voices. Gaming, has that been a part of your life? Yes. Beginning? Uh, no. So much so that uh, I've missed deadlines due to uh, gaming. So who, who do we blame for consumer, season three being late? Yeah, all of you guys. <laughs> uh, w w yeah, I, I've I've spent hours and hours and hours, probably I don't know thousands maybe, throughout the course of my life gaming, um, and uh, it's it, it's actually really humbling to even be up here talking in front of this room because. I'm sure everyone in here has contributed to my uh, entertainment over the years um, in one capacity or another. But, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, just a student of games and not really even knowing that, just, yeah. you know, just by consuming them over the years. Um, yeah. What, like, what type of games do you, do you like 
humor, humor in your game? Do you like RPGs? Act like what's everything? Um, I mean, Advanced Wars, uh, Shadow of the Colossus, Grand Theft Auto. Um, you know, uh, every everything Nintendo. You okay. know, just just about. Um, so I I'm the all. Studio the... name seems to be <laughs> inspired by Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, uh, exactly. Squanch Dento maybe will change Dento. it. <laughs> That's what we're thinking so about. you obviously have played a lot of games over the years. Um, you know, I think I've been interested in the space. I think I first met you probably through I think Cliff maybe or something years yeah. ago, and you were hanging out kind of with game developers. When you decided, hey, I maybe want to do something in games, how did you approach the idea? I mean, the studio with Tanya eventually happened, but when you first started thinking about games, what did you want to do? Like, it was VR, honestly. Yeah. Um, I, I had been, you know, like I said, just a lifelong gamer, um, and when I, st when, when I started dabbling in VR, just, you know, experiencing some of the things that, that, that you get to experience in VR, um, something in my brain just, yeah. a switch flipped. And, uh, it immediately I was like, I, I want to create something for this. Like I, I, and it wasn't just a sort of, you know, fly by night, you know, hobby that I'm gonna that's gonna sort of die out. I knew immediately like this is this is a powerful powerful medium. It's transformative. It's it's um, the sense of presence, the sense of being somewhere else is just, and it's also the thing that I've been daydreaming about my whole life. Like I remember having conversations with my friends, uh, you know in like seventh grade and you know we're talking about you know VR you know and what like can you imagine and really what we were talking about is what exists now yeah. um, so to be able to play in that space and be experimental in that space and like just come up with all kinds of amazing weird things that you can take people and 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 have them experience uh, is really really exciting um, yeah, and then Tanya, you know, you obviously have worked on a lot of big games that uh, everyone's familiar with, from you know Gears, Bulletstorm, a lot of work at Epic. Um, teaming up with Justin on this, obviously, Epic was an early sort of you know thought leader in like mm -hmm. VR, Tim Sweeney, th you know, seeing that as the future. Um, tell us about you know the idea of founding this studio with Justin. Yeah. Also, just even meeting him, which I see, probably through Cliff, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the um, it was really interesting timing for us. I had just left Epic, and I knew um, even before I'd left that I really wanted to get into VR and find a pathway into it. And I'd had my my VR eye-opening moment um, at a conference where I tried the Vive the first time yeah. and had that transformative experiment uh, you know, experience. And it was that realization that I was like, I have to do this. There's no other choice, like I have to find a way. And so I went to E3 as a way to meet people that also wanted to do this. I was looking for someone, yeah. you know, to start something with. And it was just by happenstance, I was um, playing Lawbreakers at, uh, you know, at Cliff's booth. Right. And we were just hanging out and ran into uh, Cliff and Justin's agent. And right. we were talking about this. And he said, you know, I have someone who's been looking for someone for a long time. Um, do you want to talk to him? And I was like, who is this guy? You know, and they were like, oh, yeah, have you heard of Justin Roiland? And I was like, yeah, of course I've heard of Justin Roiland. Yeah. Justin who? Yeah, I was like, I don't know who that is. Um, and Justin called me a week later. Wow. And we, over many conversations, it was, gosh, probably over about three or four weeks. Yeah, um, yeah. A lot of talking, how would this work, you know, were we compatible? Yeah, it was pretty clear right right away that that there was definitely a, a strong mutual uh, sort of goal in mind, or just you know what we wanted to do in the space. Um, it's funny because it, it all sort of like it all kicked off through Valve and Chet and all those amazing guys there. I we, I did the vo uh, the Dota two voice pack, the Rick and yep. Morty voice pack, and by way of that, I got to go uh, and visit Valve, and I planned that trip. A couple weeks before GDC 2015, where they announced the Vive, so I had no idea yeah. that I was going to be going and getting to try the Vive like fresh off the presses. I mean, it was like, you know, it debuts at GDC, and then a week later I'm there. Yeah. And um, and then I, I tried it. Obviously, like same thing. Tanya, you know, just my mind was completely blown. And I was no stranger to VR. I mean, I was like. I had the DK1, the DK2, uh, Oculus, so I was like very much um, 
you know, constantly in that. But the room scale thing just like threw me for a loop. And, uh, and then those guys were, Chad and, and, and all those guys that were super, super helpful in like giving me names of people to talk to. Like if you're really serious, here, you know, here's, here's some connections. Yeah. Go see what you can make happen. And I did just that. And then it was like, then I, and then I was um, like Ophir at, at UTA, Ophir Lupu, uh, was helping me. And, and yeah, I met with a ton of people and then finally met Tanya. Yeah. And it was just like like minds. Immediately we clicked. And then, yeah, we had a bunch of conversations, and it sort of led to uh, the formation of Squanch Tendo. You know, Squanchrosoft was on the table, uh, <laughs> Squanch Station. <laughs> all of which coming soon. Yeah, all of, the, all of those Great were choices. Squanch Santo. <laughs> we were, we, it didn't make much sense. <laughs> so, what I love about the way you approach the studio is, you know, the people you're working with. Um, like the first game, which some of you may have played, Accounting, which you guys put out um, last year. Yeah, that was, it felt like sort of a, a bootstrap project that you guys just wanted to experiment with VR, and you worked with someone who, you know, you guys probably remember the Stanley Parable from a couple of years ago, which was a great game that, you know, was on Steam, incredible narrative, amazing. voiceover, yeah. just came out of nowhere, and people were like, this is an incredible story. And William, one of the creators of that, teamed up with you guys. So it's like you're making so many right decisions, I feel like, in terms of the people you're working Partnerships, with. Partnerships, yeah. Um, to think about, so how did, like, how did you get, like, you guys had this studio, how do you get in touch with William? So William lied. I was, in, I was in the Respawn building, and uh, I didn't know, I, I was just, I, I was like, I saw some guys going up an elevator with, like, you know, Respawn shirts, and I was like, what the fuck? So I followed them up. And, uh, and then I kind of peeked and I saw them go and I was like, it was the respawn offices. And it was in the most weird, like the weirdest location in LA. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, so I, I, I started texting or tweeting. I was like, does anyone work at respawn? Like I'm in your building, I would love to meet you guys. <laughs> uh, are there any Rick and Morty fans, you know, or whatever? I was trying to just any leverage I could to, to go meet people. And uh, William responds and he's like, I work at respawn. And I'm like, Awesome. So I immediately like uh, you know follow him, and he DMs me, and we st and then the first thing he says is, "I'm really sorry, I don't actually work at Respawn. <laughs> I'm very sorry." Uh, but then I realized who he was, and I was like, "Oh, well, this is this is amazing. I'm a huge fan." And then um, we just began skyping and just talking about VR. We we're talking about all kinds of stuff, locomotion and you know, uh, narrative and, you know, just really awesome conversations. And we both sort of, again, like very like-minded, very, very curious and interested about the same types of things and the same, same type of experience that, that we could bring to VR. Right. And uh, so we planned the game jam, you know, and uh, it, it was very much a game jam. Like him and Dom, uh, came, his, his art uh, lead artist came and it was the three of us, and we just like, you know, over four days, we we just we ate weed chocolate. I'm gonna admit it a little bit, uh, and and uh, we just made this insane experience. And um, and then and then of course he got into a horrible. He got hit by a car in April. It was horrible. He he, yeah. he tweeted that on April first. So I Do you believe him? I didn't believe him. I was like, ah, he's full of shit. That's his sense of that's his sense yeah. of humor. And then he's like three days later, he's still. Like talking about it, and I'm like, wait a minute, did you really? Are we sure it happened? You never know. <laughs> no, it, ha it yes, it happened. It it was horrible, but he's fine now. Okay. But anyways, that's a bit of a cul-de-sac. But um, yeah, we uh, we had a blast making that. And it was like just fun. It was just like pure fun, pure like let's create a, a, a an experience where we can transport the player continually throughout the experience to new locations. And really, the most important thing was, for me anyways, was like I wanted to. Uh, being like such a massive fan of gaming and a massive fan of VR uh, and having bought uh, every single uh, VR experience, even up to now, I'm, I think my Steam VR uh, number is, is almost at 300 games, which is ridiculous. Wow. Uh, but I really wanted to inject character, you know, uh, have, have some weird characters in the spaces, um, have some sort of guide, you know, like that's sort of walking you through the game, or not really, but just it's very Alice in Wonderland because they're not actually mm -hmm. walking you through the game; they're just kind of screaming at you. But it was, a, but it was, it was such a fun collaboration. Like, like William's a genius, uh, and working with him was just such a delight. And uh, I, I hope to do it again for sure. Yeah, I, like when when I first played it, the thing that 
struck me about it was the the density of the experience. And I think a lot of VR games are you know very cool and experimental with the gameplay, but the way you sort of use narrative and voice and character brings the world to life. And it you know even though sometimes they're contained spaces, I love sort of the it's a possibility space where you can sort of pick up something, see how something's going to react. It reminds me a lot of the old adventure games where I'd be, you know, clicking around to see, you know, what the text prompt was when you yes. click on yeah. this, or you know, even the old uh, shooters where it's like uh, Duke Nukem, where you'd be like, "Can I really play pool on this table? Let me go space bar here," and like pushing the limits of kind of the environment. Yeah. yeah. And I thought you guys did a really interesting job with that, Tanya. When you're thinking of kind of you know VR and the types of experiences you want to build, is that like one of the kind of you know guiding principles of Squanchendo is like, let's do narrative-driven experiences? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, you know, that you mentioned that, because, like, even in pairing up with Justin, it, we both feel like this is almost like, it's not a reset point for games, but it kind of is for VR. Like, we get a chance to come up with totally bizarre new ways to implement things and do things. Like, you know, my, my whole background is in production. And I'm used to, well, A comes before B, B comes before yeah. C, you know, and this is kind of the way it goes. Um, and with accounting and with all the stuff that we're currently making, you know, we've completely reset that paradigm and said, well, wait, like, let's rethink this. Um, especially because as a studio, we want to make these character-driven games that are not just fun, but they're funny yeah. um, and have lots of different, like, surprising interactions um, that you wouldn't really expect to have happen. Um, and so accounting was really like our test bed for that. Uh, and thankfully William is so awesome, right? Like these guys came up with so many brilliant, you know, ideas. But that's that's 100% the goal of the studio moving yeah. forward. And we would love, we're, we're currently experimenting with a long form. I mean, that's less of an experiment, but we have a long game, like a yeah. traditional, you know, game length game that I can't talk too much about yeah. that we're in development VR, on. VR, right? Yep, for yeah, VR. VR. Um, but then we're also, we'd also love to make more games that are like that dense yeah. experience. Short YouTube. form, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, like, like accounting. Like books. accounting and continues to experiment with the new way of doing things and like right. the discovery of mechanics and narrative and design. It's funny because the, the you mentioned the point and click genre and I, I, f I find that that's sort of, uh, it's back in a weird way in VR. It's different though. Right. It's tickling a part of your brain that, you know, is completely, it, it's not, it's a different part of your brain that gets tickled when you're looking at a screen in your living room and a, yeah. you know, that, that disconnect. When you're actually in the space and you physically lean down to pick something up, and then a character comments on the thing you're picking up. Yeah. There's something just so weird about that, um, and uh, it's super simple. It's 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 not it's not it's not anything that hasn't been done really well many times before in gaming. But to right. but to experience it in VR, it, it really does um, hit you differently. It's it, yeah. it resonates really. You know, and, and if the character can just be insane too, you know, yeah. like the tree guy, just like fuck you, fuck you, get out of here, like constantly, you know, like, and then you pick up the thing, and he's like, hey, that's my thing, that's my thing, and then you pick up the other thing, and he's like, that's my other thing, or you know, what? It's all like just you know, just triggers and yeah. hooking all that stuff up to to interaction, but it does it does have that point and click feel, you know, where you're just sort of in a point and click game, you're like grab this, use here, and then a character yeah. says something funny. Right. And, and in some cases, at least when I was much younger and playing a lot of those games, sort of at their, at their peak, um, you know, I was doing a lot of that. Like, yeah. I'm going to try everything and see That's what what, Especially character. when it's funny. Yeah. You want to put, like, a, even, like, when you, you guys may or may not know, he did the voices in Valve's The Lab um, with the sort of slingshot game. Yeah, the yeah. Cores there, and it's like, I would just sit there, like, you know, wait for the dialogue to finish, how much more they yeah. before I fire the core, because you want to you yeah. push the limits and see how far yeah. you can go and like get all the, you know, all the funny lines. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And then, or you can, you know, just whip it, you know, yeah. just go right away, and then there's sort of an interesting replayability factor there. It's yeah. like, I, I still haven't heard every single yeah. core, uh, well, that's core voice. That's the Easter egg aspect of it. Yeah. Of like, let me see what happens when I do it's this amazing. or that. It's yeah. amazing. Um, and you want to find all the humor, and as you said, those moments where characters are reacting. One thing I wanted to ask you guys about was, you know, the, as you said, it's primitive now, where it's like pick up an object, someone will react to it. When you have characters in these worlds, tell me about sort of your thinking about, you know, how, how does a character act or react to you? Because I've had moments where certainly, you know, you have these characters and you want, you know, like in Batman or something, you want to walk up to them, and you, you want to slap them, but you can't. Yes. They're like, they can't react to you. So like, yeah. is the next layer, do you figure out how do these, you know, 
characters not only react to things you're doing in the environment, but sort of what you're doing with them and that interaction? Yeah, I mean, even just an experience as simple as being in a room with a character and just spending your time on just every single possible thing that character could react to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you use gaze tech, you can use like, you know, collision points and stuff, but uh, that would be amazing if, if, if you spent uh, a bunch of time and you just, rather than, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, ex exploration or whatever, it's just you and a character. Right. It's like, okay, right. what, what things can I do? Maybe a few objects in the room, yeah. but it's like, what things can I do to elicit new responses yeah. from this character? Maybe it's to try to get the character do, to do something, you know, it's, but you have to figure out how. Yeah. Grabbing his arm will elicit a, a different response or uh, smacking him or, you know, pet, petting his head. I mean, those, the, the, that's, that's all, um, I mean, that would just be super amazing. I mean, I would, I would play something like that for, <laughs> for a really long time. Especially if it's funny with a cool, and that's where I think, you know, yeah. cool mm -hmm. character, cool voice brings it to life. And, yeah. and it's funny because, like, the, it, it, our studio, like, the, the, uh, we can't too, talk too much about the, the, the bigger long form game we're making, but <clears throat> I, I, there was a period of time where I was going away from comedy, you know, and just sort of thinking about it differently and maybe a little more horror, uh, not, not like Resident Evil style, like scary, but just more eerie. And uh, I think even going down that road, it was just, it kept going back to comedy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I just, I'm so drawn to like absurd and and comedy um, that I realized pretty quickly. I'm like, no, let's 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 not let's not try to do this. Well, I think too with VR, there's such an opportunity for how you can interact with characters that we didn't have um, prior to this point. Like yeah. being able to stand next to another human being that's your size, right? And you can see right into their face and walk around them as they're talking yeah. to you and see how they react to you and even in accounting, there's like a really simple thing um, that that we did that was so cool with Tree Guy with the phone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you want to tell it? Yeah, it's it's super simple, but it, it it was one of those things that when we first played the the build, um, and this was like you know three and a half days in working on like we're insane, you know, <laughs> three and like, a half days, uh, very little sleep. But but uh, William had hooked it all up. Uh, and uh, we played through it. You, you get to the tree world, and tree guy's screaming at you, and when the phone rings and you answer the phone, his, his audio switches over to, like, who is that? Who's that on the phone? Who is, that's my phone. Who is that? Who, who are you talking to? It just goes on and on and on. And, uh, and then after a little bit, you hear William and Dom on the phone, and, and they start asking, who, who is that in the background? Who's that screaming in the background? They're both at the same time asking who the other person is and it's so weird because it's like uh, that, that that to me is the like one of the highlights of the of the experience because it's just it, it really it, you're not expecting that and there, it really does feel like everything's alive and, and yeah. it's so weird it's such a simple thing though um, but it was so effective and but that's the magic of VR right it's it's not just um, you know, sitting and watching an experience, it's being a part of that experience and feeling like this is really kind of like something that would happen in real life that tricks my brain yeah. into no matter how absurd or how crazy or how fantastical into believing that this world yeah. is, exists and it's my world, right? Yeah, you hear, people you. Say, you hear people say I was in VR, not I was playing VR. Right. You know what I mean? It's, You're it's in almost it. like uh, it's just this crazy transformative medium. Yeah. I want everyone in this room to start making more VR games so that I can play more. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I mean, obviously, you know, VR's out there. It's, you know, it's building um, lots of games. But I think, as you said, the narrative aspect of it is something to me that I feel like there are lots of experimental things. And, you know, Tilt Pressure is really fun to go in and amazing. press that way. Yes. But when you look Space at... Space Pirate like, Trainer, time, amazing. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, and that stuff. But, you know, you, you see those experiences, then you imagine layering narrative on top of that. Yes. Yeah. Pirate Trainer, but with cool characters and all yep. that, which yeah. is where it's going to go, mm -hmm. yeah. I think. But, yeah, you guys have done some early work in that, which I think is really um, impressive. We should also mention that... Uh, there is a Rick and Morty VR thing coming out, which, again, another really cool partnership is with the guys who did Job Simulator Alchemy. at Alchemy Labs. Yep. Um, you teamed up with those guys yes. to do that, which is not, not Squanch Tendo, the separate thing, but... Yep. Adult Swim Games is publishing. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, again, those guys are geniuses uh, when it comes to the VR medium, especially 
when it comes to packing uh, a room densely yeah. with just interactivity and all kinds of experimentation. Yeah. Um, That's going to be incredible, I feel like, with yeah, those and, and, and in that world. Yeah, and the, the Rick and Morty game is, 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 is very much that. I mean, yeah. it's, you're, you're, you're in the garage, you're in Rick's garage, That's and tough. there's so much crazy stuff to do in that, in that space. Um, and then, of course, you know, we have, we have the ability to portal to other places, yeah. uh, which is really awesome. And it's a really, it was, it was something actually I remember talking forever ago with William about and a few other devs about uh, just sort of pontificating about ways to locomote players to new spaces in VR and the idea of um, a magic door that pops up in the middle. If we're talking room scale, you know. Uh, of the room that you can sort of just clip through and then you know you can look back and see where you were but now you're in a new room the door whoosh, goes away and um, it, it made perfect sense to do stuff like that with the Rick and Morty game because we have the portal gun we you know yeah. Um, but yeah those guys are amazing uh, and and again that that all of that stuff came from that trip to Valve you know wow. and Chet and all those guys um, just being super super cool and supportive to somebody who is an outsider, who has never made a game. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there's so many people who are like, I want to make games, I want to do it. And um, I don't know. I don't know why they took me seriously. You know? like, well, I think they were really... fans of what you do. And obviously, you, were, you know, you had taken the time to meet everyone. And that's what's cool is like, you know, alchemy guys, I'm sure when Alex and those guys met, you know, it's like, oh, cool, Justin. I mean, I, I play, I, that was their, their, uh, their old uh, job sim first demo, the, the very first kitchen demo, yeah. you know, which is now the, the final is totally different, but yeah. that blew my mind. I, I was just like, yeah. and then I, uh, they were in town for VRLA uh, 2015. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah. And uh, I had been in touch with them, and I'm like, I was like, just come over, come over. So the whole team came over to my house, yeah. and they had builds for the, the convenience store, and the uh, office, right. and um, and yeah, they, they, they had them on a thumb drive, they, they put them on my computer, and we just drank and played VR all night, and it was the, and, we, and that's really where we became, like where, where I got to know them, and we became friends that night, yeah. and then um, we flew to Atlanta to pitch Lazo, Mike Lazo, the, the, who, who runs Adult Swim, on this game, he had never tried VR, so we threw him in the Vive, and he flipped out. I mean, he flipped out. And then he got out of the vibe, and we're like, so we want to do that, but with Rick and Morty. And he's like, green light. Yeah. <laughs> it was the easiest pitch <laughs> ever. I mean, it was like on the, on the backs of, you know, these amazing demos by yeah. Weaver and, and, and all these other amazing studios. And, of, co of course, Alchemy, you know, being a big, big part of that because we showed him a, a, a few of the, uh, the levels in um, Job Simulator. Oh, yeah. It's and, a brilliant, um, brilliant fit. It's so great. And... Um, yeah, and, and it's all really, like, my, my goal, I mean, obviously, this, the, the studio is a passion, you know, it's like this, is, like, this is my opportunity to be able to have fun and make experimental things, um, because VR is such an experimental format, so, or medium, and it's, it, and my goal is to, you know, have fun, make amazing things, but, but also, I want to do everything in my power to help the medium grow to help help it on the software side if I can yeah. um, you know if we do if we do uh, what we're hoping to do you know if everything goes smoothly <laughs> which it won't <laughs> which it would never does no. but like you know we, we hope to we hope to bring you know solid content uh, software to the medium uh, to the best of our ability you know uh, and, and also what I think is really cool about the studio is how you're set up Tanya like the the team is actually with Justin as he's working on mm -hmm. Rick and Morty, so it's like yep. they're involved, right? Yeah, we have um, the our the core studio is out in Burbank, so we actually have studios in two locations. I'm I'm located in Raleigh with our art team, um, and we're based out of downtown Raleigh. And then the rest of the the gameplay team is out in Burbank in the Rick and Morty offices. Awesome. So they've been super cool and like lending space to us as we kind of like grab more and more of it. Yeah. Um, and so when Justin is working on something, editing something, recording something, he can just pop in. I'm able to post season three and. Yeah. Work on the VR stuff. Yeah. yeah, we have an amazing team too. Like, oh my it's gosh. crazy. Yeah, we really got. I don't want to say lucky because it was it was it was hard legwork that Tanya put in, um, but we we just have such an incredible team, and the culture of the studio is just so so good and fun. Um, it's yeah, it's it's. I'm just really excited for the future of. I know you can't say a ton about it, but 
It's not a Rick and Morty game. It's like a new, new, new IP. World, new yeah. IP right? new IP, yeah. yeah. Uh, all the stuff we're doing is new, like new IP. At least right now, all, all the yeah. all the pitch decks we have and everything, it's all new IP. That's great. And when you look at you know the VR space now, obviously there's you know lots of platforms. You know there are things like room scale. There are things like mobile. When you think of you know the market and sort of where it's going to be and the type of games you want to build. Where are you trying to focus? Like, is this something where it's, you know, obviously room scale is amazing with Vive and, you know, incredibly compelling, but how are people really going to have that set up versus yeah. having, you know, a Gear VR? Or, it's tricky right now. Yeah. I think that's, that's part of the, that's one of the hurdles with VR is, is, is the hardware is so fragmented in what yeah. the experiences are. And I think the best experiences are built from the ground up to support whatever the hardware is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, as a studio, uh, I'm, I'm in love with every VR hardware, so I, I can find something to love about every one of them. The Daydream, Gear VR, Oculus, every, like all of them are amazing to me. Uh, PSVR, there, there's something to love about all of them. Um, so my approach has just been, you know, what amazing experience would I do with these constraints? Like, how can I use these constraints as an offer? Yeah. Um, and... and and it's been it's been really fun. It's been really fun. Uh, I mean, the funnest part, obviously, is like you know those early days of designing and like the spark and you, you know um, for me, it's all in my sketchbooks. So I'm like you know game design and story and character and like I'm thinking about all those things in concert. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, every, every we're, we're, we've got pitches that work for a seated gamepad. We've got pitches that work that that really are designed for a room scale. Well, mm-hmm. You kind of can't convert them to, you can't port right. them, you know, those, there's certain yeah. experiences you just can't really port over properly to, to the other. I think that the, you know, the thing that we talked about from the very beginning is no matter what the medium, it, one, like Justin said, designing for it, mm-hmm. um, bespoke for that platform is really important and taking advantage of what that platform has to offer, um, but also is the recreation of what makes VR special. You know, VR not just as a second screen on your face, you know, not a floating camera, not, you know, it's how do you put the player in the world, regardless of whether it's seated gamepad or, or room scale. And that's been the thing that we've been approaching for every yeah. single one of our pitches, regardless. Which, by the way, there's plenty of games that do, it, do, do right. the, the, the VR as a screen really yeah. well mm-hmm. that yes. I love. Yes. Uh, Hero Bound and, and uh, I mean, all the stuff Insomniac is doing, like yep. uh, Feral Rights and... and um, all, you know, they're the amazing experiences. But yeah, for us as a studio, mm-hmm. we want to transport the player so that they feel like they're actually in the world and they're, right. they're affecting the world and, and they're a part of it. They're a star. With a very low threshold of nausea. <laughs> as little nausea as possible. Yeah. That's the other thing. <laughs> uh, lots of comedy. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, thanks so much, guys, for uh, giving us a sneak peek. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Uh, Justin, good luck with season three. Thank on, you. On <laughs> You Thank you, and, guys. Uh, I think now we're moving on to the, uh, the next session. Ted and Jason are back there, but first, Mike Fisher. Hello. Thanks, guys. That was great. Awesome. Good job. So we're going to keep the focus on VR for a little while with a different perspective. Uh, we're going to have um, uh, Jason Rubin, who is now VP of content at Oculus, but prior to that was a founder of Naughty Dog, where he created Crash Bandicoot and Jack and Daxter. And speaking with him will be his uh, friend and developer, Ted Price. Ted Price is the founder of Insomniac, uh, creator of, uh, among other games, uh, Ratchet and Clank and Spyro. So basically, these are the two guys responsible for about half of this room buying their first PlayStation. And now they're devoting their time and attention to VR. I mean, I should point out, they've made a lot of games uh, other than that. Ted, in particular, has gone on to make a Resistance, Song of the Deep, Edge of Nowhere, and other VR projects. But I think it's interesting that these are the people who really kicked off the 3D console generation, now t- focusing their attention on VR. And VR is no longer the next big thing coming tomorrow. It's been out in the marketplace for almost a year with Vive and Oculus. I think, uh, hopefully, you guys have had a chance to try it on your own. But let's hear what it's like from people who are in the midst of making this happen now. Ted, Jason, come on out. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you for hanging out and being with us. So we're going to 
have a pretty frank discussion about where VR is and where we think it's going. Oh, you didn't tell me it was frank. I didn't know Sorry. it was going to be frank. All right. It'd we're be pretty being mean. frank today. Yeah, this okay. is my goal, is okay. to make, make you sweat. So, uh, th and there have been a lot of really good discussions online and just in general about VR because it's brand new. So I want to start off with one that's sure. not particularly easy. So as you've probably seen, there have been a couple articles this month that show a pretty wide gap between industry expectations originally and where VR is today. So what, how would you explain that gap and what's your honest assessment for VR sales to date? Right. Uh, well, first, I think you have to separate the promise of VR and VR year one sales. So when it comes to the promise of VR, uh, Oculus believes, and I think the industry believes, this is the next big thing. This is the next computing platform. We believe in it. We think it's going to happen. And we're unwavering in that belief. When it comes to year one sales, I think there was a disconnect between what the industry was saying. And I think we were pretty much all on the same page. I remember Mark Zuckerberg standing up on stage uh, at either F8 or OC3 and saying, this is a 10-year process. Uh, I've heard the same things from other hardware manufacturers. I don't remember anyone going out there and saying, this is going to be massive year one. There were others peripheral to the industry uh, that were following kind of the normal hype curve of technology where when before it's out, there's a giant hype for it, and then it comes out and it doesn't do your taxes, cure cancer, and everything else, immediately sell 100 million units. And we're now kind of in that uh, reality part of the curve, and that's going to last for a couple years now as we figure out how to get everything right. Uh, and then we believe as an industry, and certainly Oculus believes, that we hit that second uh, major tail, and we believe that this is going to be a massive part of the future of humanity. Well, then what specifically do you think is necessary to, to hit that curve, to make it really move forward in a way that everybody expected at the beginning? Right. Uh, so there's maybe a long answer here. So. Not everybody will agree with this, but the way I look at the world right now in VR, uh, think of a three-dimensional graph. When I talk about quality, I'm talking about the physicality of it, the lenses, the screens, uh, the refresh rate, everything down to the, the straps, the lightness, the weight, everything like that. Um, and then the third dimension of the graph is what I'll call content, but that also includes operating system, how quickly it works when you put it on, how easy it is to move in and out of it, uh, all of the things that a user feels and sees when they're in the device. If you look at the devices that are out there right now, I don't think any of them have project, uh, product market fit. Uh, let's start with Gear VR. Price-wise, spot on. At $99, everybody's very happy with it. It sold over 5 million units we've announced. It continues to sell. Uh, it's a fantastically quickly moving device for the first year. So you want to talk about first year? That's great. Uh, on the quality side, it's getting four out of five reviews. It's very well liked, but it's not driving the long-term retention and the excitement that we'd like to see to help us kick into that second part of the graph. I think, you know, the refresh rate isn't quite right. The battery issues, putting your own phone into a device. These are part of that quality bar that just isn't there yet. And then there's content, which we'll deal with in a second. If we look at Rift, I think quality-wise, we knocked it out of the park. When we show it at Best Buy, people say, this is awesome. I'm into VR. I'm going for VR. VR is in my future. And then we say, OK, what's the number one reason you're not buying today? And the number one reason, almost invariably, is price. So that one has the quality. It doesn't have that price that drives people to buy it. They're both, for different reasons, at the wrong part of the, uh, of the graph. And none of them have the content. None of them yet have the content that's going to drive people outside of early adopters to get into the business. Now, I want to be clear with all of this that it's a fantastic experience today. You know, I'm not dissuading people from getting into VR, but to hit the 10th millionth or 100 millionth or billionth person, we have to be a lot more than a great experience for an early adopter. So the question is, where do we go knowing this? And there are a lot of ways to attack this problem. From the mobile side, the way to do it is better processors, better screens, add positional tracking, make them lighter, and all of those other things. Easy to do, but not easy to do without changing price. So we don't want to lose the price advantage in mobile. Eventually, that moves up to the right part of the graph, you would think. How long will it take processors? I don't know. It'll take a while. You have the Rift. What do we do with the Rift? Well, I believe the Rift is in the right spot, but it's not in the right price spot. So by actively driving the price down to get people into VR, that's how we make the difference. So far, we've attacked the problem with the PC price. 
It's $1,000 to buy a PC that ran VR in March 28th when we launched less than a year ago. Those PCs are now $699. We work really hard on software to improve what any given graphic card uh, you know, or, or chipset can do. ASW is a big part of that. With ASW, you can get almost the full experience for a $499 entry price point. So we're driving price down there. We need to drive price down in other places, including with the hardware itself. So we, we understand that. Over time, price comes down. So both of these things will converge to the right spot, and simultaneously, we need to be working on content. And we spend a massive amount of our effort working on that content, making it faster when you put it on for it to come up and easier to get in and out of games, uh, adding social features, adding the things that we need to make it an ecosystem. A year ago, none of this existed. So it's going to take us a little while to get all of this right. And I think one or the other of those devices will converge in the right place at the time when we also have the software. Now, there are things we shouldn't do that come out of this, right? I, I think adding features to increase the price, which also resets content because the new features aren't supported in any of the current content, is moving in the wrong direction up in the price and maybe up in quality too, but never towards that price market fit. So we haven't been, been big proponents of, let's throw in eye tracking, let's throw in wireless, let's throw in these other things. They may be great, but they move us in the wrong direction. So our goal is to get one of those two devices to get to product market fit. So well, that's, that's interesting because you're describing Oculus's approach, right? But hardware manufacturers have taken very different approaches in terms of the hardware itself, the content, the ecosystem. Why, why is that, given that uh, at this point, we, we do know more about VR, and there have been a lot of people working on this problem for a long time. Yeah. Well, this is natural and healthy. If everybody went out with exactly the same product and exactly the same, same thought process, there'd be no competition making them drive to do anything better, and you wouldn't get a wide variety of ideas for people to look at, and the consumer eventually, and developers as well, to say, this is good, that's bad, this is good, that's bad. For example, we launched ATW, Asynchronous Time Warp. We thought that was vital for making a smooth and comfortable experience. There were a lot of people in the industry that disagreed with that. It's now part of almost all uh, you know, platforms. We believed on-ear headphones made things a lot better for the consumer. These are minor things, but to get to product market fit, you have to get it all right. It has to be the device everybody wants. Others are now picking up that on-ear headphone uh, or, or on-device headphones because they also agree that that's the right thing to do. Uh, with hand tracking, we wanted you know, real, the real feeling of having your hands and fingers in there. We waited a longer time, a disagreement we had with others in the industry and perhaps with some consumers. But I believe now we have the best hand tracking and the best controllers in the business. That's been, uh, you know, the, the journalists believe the same thing. I think our reviews have said the same thing. And now you see others say, okay, 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 we're going to relaunch our hand controllers because, yes, we need to get better at this. Uh, there are things that our competitors have done that we've adopted. So this is not a one-way street. I'm not saying that Oculus gets everything right. That's good. Disagreement is good. It drives us all to try things. Some of us will fail. Some of us will succeed. We'll succeed and fail at the same time on the same product. Uh, but it pushes things forward. So I, I think that's healthy. Well, actually, that's a, that leads to another question I think has been brought up a lot. Uh, I want to talk specifically about open platforms, right? Uh, what would it take for Oculus to be more open about having titles that it makes on other platforms. So this is actually a place where we agree with the industry more than most people think. We support an open standard. We're part of the Kronos initiative. We, I think we're going on stage at GDC. I may be wrong about that. There's a lot going on uh, in a panel about it. But we definitely support the Kronos initiative. If there was an open platform, we would be a big part of that open platform. An open platform is not created by one company and then thrown upon the industry. It never has all of the industry's needs. The right way to do this is through the open standard. In the meanwhile, let's look at where we really are today. Just this week, I played Dead and Buried online with Vive users. I can tell they're Vive users because their microphone doesn't work exactly right because the hack they're using uh, and some interplay with our software makes that mic not work. We have done absolutely nothing to stop this. And in fact, the team back right now at Menlo Park is working to try to fix the mic problem. So, we haven't spent a lot of resources right now to create and or join a standard that is not a true open standard. But we believe in the open standard. We want to get to the open standard. And ultimately, we, we will be part of that ecosystem with all that that implies.
I think from a developer's perspective, we applaud that. I mean, we want our games to be accessible by all, and uh, it's, a, it's a definitely a refreshing attitude. So we know that our games, for example, even though we put them out on Rift, are being played by Vive players yes. through eVive. And that's, that's really cool, because then we get more feedback on what works and what doesn't work. So that's great to hear, and I hope that everybody in the industry actually does eventually adopt that approach. Because yeah, we want what, everybody in the PC business to join an open standard that's created by all through a, a platform where everybody gets to say what's important to them. ASW, things that we think are vitally important, we've spent our resources on, instead of kludging in kind of uh, you know, an open platform today, uh, we're waiting for the open platform. We spend our resources on ASW, ATW, these things that are making our titles better, driving the price of VR down. That's where our focus is. So it's not that we don't support openness. It's that right now is not the time in our belief system. Do you think there will be a specific sort of tipping point where the hardware manufacturers are getting together and software and saying, okay, guys, we're ready to go? Well, we have a process now. That's the Kronos process, and we support that. So when that standard exists, we, we, you know, we've committed to join it. Okay, here to here. So uh, I want to turn a little bit to developers for a second mm -hmm. and talk about developers' experiences in VR, and in particular, indie developers who are self-funded. And while there have been some, I think, great successes, such as Job Simulator, right, which is a fantastic game, it's done very well, uh, other indie developers, other indie developers who have self-funded have not done so well, and there have actually been a couple stories about those who have bet the farm on VR and gone under as a result. So with that, how do you attract new developers to VR, given the risks are terribly high and the audience at this point is still growing, but relatively small? Right. Well, any time a developer goes out of business, that's a bad thing for, for humanity. It's a bad thing, certainly, for the VR business, and we don't want that to happen. Um, we've, again, been very careful uh, telling developers that this is going to be a long process. I believe that getting in early and learning about VR, which has an incredibly steep learning curve and is very different than anything, is extremely beneficial and that we will create Rovios, I've said this before, and companies like were created by mobile. Um, going all in on VR right now, unless you have a very good business plan, is not necessarily the right thing to do. And I think I would throw this back to you. Uh, you're a developer. I'm a producer these days. So I have the easy job. Um, as a developer, you haven't gone all in, even though you've gone significantly in. So what was your decision process, and how are your resources uh, split between the two? Yeah, I, we, we take the minority of our resources, minority of our resources, and put it towards VR, because uh, we do understand that it's a nascent business and that the audience is growing, but not, it's not at the point right now where we could make a giant title and expect to recoup. However, it's really important for us to be in early on a technology that we think is here to stay. And I get a lot of questions all the time about why do you think it's here to stay? And I'd say it's not just the games applications, but it's the applications beyond games that give me a lot of uh, hope for where VR is going and the participation of very large companies like Facebook, like Google, who see where VR can go in the future. So what we've chosen to do is keep one foot squarely planted in VR, learn the design lessons that we think are valuable to becoming better as a developer, and then have our other foot in more traditional game space where we've been for the last two decades. I think that's a good balance for us. We're very fortunate to be in a position where we can do that, where we have multiple teams. But if, I was, uh, if we were starting up as a new developer, I would probably temper my bets a little bit and make sure that whatever the scope is for our VR games is contained so that we're not, as you said, betting the farm right. on VR. So what, what have you learned? Now I'm, I'm Was that? gonna ask you more questions. What have you learned? You said you've learned a bunch of things and that's why you got into it. I think what have you learned with your first two titles, for example, which I, were gamepad titles and then uh, your last title has now been a, a touch title. So as, as Jason uh, references, our first two games were third third-person action games. Right. And this actually was partially grew out of a conversation we had about the challenge of making a third-person game in VR. And there really wasn't a whole lot of optimism that it could work. And so we took on that challenge, built two new IPs, Edge of Nowhere and Feral Rights, with third-person and, and had to wrestle with some pretty tough camera challenges. I mean, we learned very quickly that as soon as you take camera control uh, away from the player and he or she is not controlling it with his head, you cause instant discomfort. Yeah. And our first several experiments in both of those games were disasters. 
And even after uh, we figured it out and felt that we had a fairly comfortable game, we found that third person isn't, isn't the best fit necessarily for VR. So we then realized that we hadn't asked the most important question. And the most important question is, why VR? Why are we making a game that's for a VR platform if it doesn't have something that is unique to the medium? And that's where really Unspoken came in, which is a, a magic casting game where you really cannot play this game in any other way. On, yeah, any other way, because you're tracking your hands, you're creating fireballs and throwing them, you're doing all sorts of really cool stuff and, and being transported into this world where you are a magician because it's, it's you. You're actually in this space, in this VR space, playing against somebody else. Yeah. So I, my advice is, if you're starting out, you have to ask and answer that question, why VR, and feel very confident about the answer. Yeah, definitely, especially for early adopters, because they bought this platform specifically to play something they had never played before. I have my theories that in the long run, we'll get back to gamepad games, because it's such a great control mechanism, and people will say, okay, I don't want to stand up, it's been a long day at work, I'm, you know, I just want to sit here and do something more passive, and that gamepad is a great device, but right now, our consumers have been pretty clear. They want touch. They want yeah. to see their hands uh, in the space. Well, that's one of the things that does, in my opinion, separate VR from traditional games in general, is it's a different, uh, it's a different interface now. And as players, we are always looking for new ways to be immersed in our worlds, to be convinced that we are actually in this place doing this cool thing. And the more we can move away from, I think, move away from this and eventually to actually this without any controllers, right. That's, that's the tipping point that all of a sudden the world goes, wow, you've got something that's beyond a game. This is just, this is an experience that I never would have imagined could exist. And what excites me is watching you make these games, you're learning things about picking up and how the simple physics of moving things around works. And to Graham's point earlier, he said that the game industry, the game developer, this community, is going to drive VR, or in his case, AR forward. It's absolutely true in VR as well. Yeah. FTD will eventually make some floral arrangement thing where you order online, and picking up that rose, is gonna, it's gonna be a game engine, whether it's you know, Unity, Unreal, CryEngine, or it, whatever it is, it's going to be a game engine, and it's gonna take a game developer to create that rose and deal with the flopping of it and putting it in the container, and they will have learned that over the next few years building games, right? So games is not the end state of VR in any way, shape, or form, but games will blossom into everything that's in VR, and the community that DICE serves, this developer community, uh, and it's, this is beautiful, after watching 30 years of the game industry, this is our moment, right? This is our moment where we just take over the world uh, as creators. So Facebook and Oculus, are in, it's amazing the way that now what are developers interested in? What do developers want? That's, that's the tone at Facebook on the entire campus because we realize wherever the future goes, this group of people is the seed of that. This is the, these are the people that are going to launch us there. I, I agree. I think that's a, that's a great point about how outside of the games industry, they are looking at us to understand how we've wrestled with these challenges and, and beat them. Uh, I mean, I, and I'll, I have to go back to this because my transformative moment in VR was when you said, hey, come on by the Oculus booth and check out the Toy Box demo. This is a few years ago. And I, how many of you guys tried that out, the Toy Box demo for Oculus? Anybody? A few, yeah. A couple, yeah, right. That rocked, right? The, 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 I'd never experienced in, in games a situation where I was handing somebody in virtual space an object or throwing something using my hands and actually seeing that person's reaction in space. And it was one of those, those uh, there's those times where I realized I cannot get this in any other form of entertainment. And that's, for me, when I, real, I personally thought, okay, I can see where VR goes beyond games now. It's that social interaction that's made real in, in virtual space through these devices and, and through the software. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, I'll stop being a fanboy, because that was, that was super cool. So let me go back to something else you mentioned earlier. Um, you talked about the, about Gear VR and how Gear VR has five million yep. units out there. So if the mobile base is so much larger than the tethered VR space, uh, is there any reason why developers shouldn't be developing for mobile VR now? Oh, absolutely, there's no reason they shouldn't be. Like, they should be. Should be uh, mobile VR is, is a, a, a very busy business right now. There are a lot of people using it. There are a lot of people making uh, content for it, uh, it's a great space. I think if you go back to my 
uh, how to attack product market fit chart, you decide as a developer, do I want the now, but I can't experiment with the future because the technology is, for example, hampered by not having positional tracking, hampered by not having uh, you know, true hand presence, hampered, hampered in a certain sense by all these things, but that's where the audience is right now, or do I start up here where the price isn't necessarily right right now, but there's infinitely more potential to experiment with what the future of VR clearly is going to look like. And that's kind of the decision you're making right now. Uh, do you want to be in a space where the audience is there? Or do you want to be in a space where the technology is there? And again, at some point in the near future, that's going to come together. And deciding for yourself as a developer how you get there and what you think your edge is on the market and your strategy is the difference between developing uh, for those two platforms. Oculus splits its attention 50-50 between the two platforms because we fundamentally believe that both are vital to getting to the end state. We believe the end state is is untethered. We believe the end state is an all-in-one device. We believe, it, Mark has called it glasses at his upper end of the curve, which is out farther than 10 years, but you know that's where it's going. And a lot of that is gonna come from the mobile end. Yeah. At the same time, high-end PCs can drive the technical innovation uh, that's gonna lead to some of the more interesting discoveries in VR that creates the killer content. So there's, they're both very viable ways of attacking the market as a developer. So, well, with that in mind, if I'm a brand new developer to VR, or I'm thinking, I'm an established developer thinking about getting into VR, what specific advice would you give me or any developer who's ready to make that journey? Test, over and over and over again, test ideas. Do a lot of small throwaways uh, and the like. If, if I can apologize, what we didn't do with Edge of Nowhere and Feel Rights is we didn't do that. I said, Ted, please, we've been friends for years. I need content at or around launch. You don't have enough time, and I don't have a lot of dev kits for you. And our response to that, mutually, was to go from what we know. Uh, I yeah. think there's proof in the, the, the results that what we should have been doing is doing a lot, of more, a lot more research and a lot more trial and error to come across something that really worked. A, a perfect example of that is Super Hot. It's a first-person shooter. It's a relatively uh, inexpensive first-person shooter to make, but that developer got it right, yeah. absolutely right for VR for this moment. And I think had we mutually experimented, and again, I take a little blame here because I said, here's your deadline, here's your budget, go. Um, I think we would have done better with those first couple of titles. I think we fixed that with Unspoken. And I think going forward, developers should really small team prototype for as long as they can before they come upon that spark of an idea. Uh, Tilt Brush is another perfect example. Just came to the Oculus store yesterday. Tilt Brush is game changing, right? No one has ever done anything like that before. And that, de that developer, I know, uh, spent a lot of time experimenting in VR on various things before settling on Tilt Brush. Massive win for them. So follow that, um, you know, follow that path, and I think you're going to do better as well. Well, you know, actually, that's the, that is a conundrum, though, for most developers, because when you do that, you're funding Blue Sky teams, R&D teams, not necessarily with outside funding, so you've got to be in a position where you can do it yourself, or you have a partner who's willing to take the risk and fail with you as a partner, and that's, that's not easy to, to come across in this industry today. That's absolutely true, and that's why Oculus believes that spending $250 million as of OC3, when we announced that, spending another $250 million goes a long way towards providing that safety net. Unfortunately, with the size of the industry, we can't spread it wide enough, and that isn't enough money yeah. for everybody to have a safety net. So developers that uh, don't get funding from Oculus, we encourage uh, other hardware manufacturers to get involved in that investment business. Some of them have, some of them have not. Um, we think that's very healthy. Uh, and if a developer doesn't have access to that capital, I agree with you, small team, um, you know, one or two or three people can put together in a couple of months a lot of ideas and come up with a really good idea. Some of the best products we have on our shelf right now, uh, virtual shelf, have come from teams of under five people who have come up with something really special and then said, all right, how do we grab outsource and or other talent to build this into something a little bit larger? So I think there is a win state there. I think a lot of developers are succeeding, but you do have to take care if you don't have, uh, you know, you don't have fi financial wherewithal. And again, my plea to the industry is, uh, do what Facebook is doing, follow what Oculus is doing, spend more money on developers. And, and you're talking to third-party publishers as well, right? Not just hardware manufacturers. 
Well, third-party publishers are somewhat in the same position developers are in, because at the end of the day, they have bottom-line businesses that aren't driven by the success of VR. I think primarily right now, this should be coming from the hardware manufacturers, and, and that's why, you know, part of the reason I joined Facebook was that they believed in that. Uh, they, they were willing to spend that money to push the industry forward. Got it. We did, uh, let me, I, we did have one question that came in from Twitter, and, uh, and I'll try to keep it quick, but what was, what was the hardest part of making a VR game? That's a question that was for you, from absolutely. Benjamin I mean, Fritz. And that's, again, it's a developer question. So, I mean, we've talked about some of the challenges, yeah. but. I, I think the hardest part actually is, I mean, there's, there's the figuring out why VR. But then there's also understanding what VR is and ensuring that your team really gets it. And when your designers, your artists, your programmers, your sound engineers are all clear on what the medium brings to, to games. Because it's easy, I think you mentioned this before, to fall back on our traditional expertise and to design and program games the way we have been doing it forever and then realize after the game is almost done that it doesn't feel any different than that last uh, game we put out five years ago. So that's, that's the challenge. It's, it's a team, it's always yeah. a team effort making games, but everybody has to be thinking of this hardware in the same way. Otherwise, you get mixed results. Yeah, there's a huge challenge in finding the spark that makes you interesting to the consumer. That's the primary challenge. And that challenge can be overcome with small budgets and small teams. The second challenge is scaling that product to the point at which it's not a demo or just another wave yeah. shooter. And right now, that is an extremely hard part of the business for developers. Again, that's why Oculus uh, funds so many developers in so many ways. We don't publish how many titles are in our store and our competitor stores that have significant amounts of Oculus money behind them to get the scale we believe is kind of a minimum so that people don't dismiss great ideas without having the meat behind it to say that was a great experience. And I think we got caught here on feral rights too. There's a price point question. Yeah, that's you true. put all of this money into this game. You have to put it on the shelf. You want to recoup. You know the early adopter wants to play the games. You have to be very careful to take care of your community and take care of the consumer. And I think our launch price with Feral Rights was inappropriate. It wasn't the right, and I think, thank you to Insomniac, we got to the right place with that game. I also think
things. We consume stories. We talk about things in the form of stories, and we remember things in the form of stories. We start telling each other about stories before we could even write. You know, when you create an entertainment experience, when you create an art piece, you want it to be remembered. You want it to be told to more people. The best way to make people remember your game is to create a strong story. It stays in their memory longer and has bigger impact. So it is, it is almost the most important thing uh, when you think about making a video game. Games some years ago were really focused on mechanics exclusively and people just wanted to test their skills. And I think the more it goes, the more people need a reason to fight or to shoot. And, and the story is that reason. So um, it's also interesting to see that games with a good story, with good narrative in general, um, are the games that have the higher com completion rate. People want to know what's going to happen and, and they want to see the end of the story and that's what really keeps them um, playing until the end. I can remember uh, this rather profound moment when I was playing a bunch of games on the Amiga that I realized that for me personally, you know, storytelling uh, was going to be most perfectly realized in, in gaming and something that was interactive. But on the trajectory, once I was working, you know, Eco was another standout moment, mainly because there was this beautiful concept about, you know, a boy rescuing a girl. And at the core of the gameplay, that lives in this mechanic of, of literally holding her hand and pulling her through the environment. And so there was this realization then as well that gameplay can, can underwrite a narrative idea in a way that makes you understand it and feel it and respond to it in this much more living way. Uh, and so that was kind of profoundly influential. What excites me about telling stories in games is that added layer of interactivity. We could be making web shorts or comic books or you know maybe movies, but I think there's a lot of really cool ways to tell a story that you can only tell in a story now. And there's a bunch of stories now, that, at least the ones that I'm interested in telling, that can only take place in a game. I think one of the challenges uh, in our young medium in terms of storytelling is is kind of earning our narrative chops. You know, a lot of games fall into the trap of kind of doing and then storytelling, which is sort of something happens and something else happens and then and then and then and then. It's just a series of events, which isn't a story, right? A story, and this is sort of something I've, I've, I'm, I'm echoing from uh, the guys that work on South Park, right? Is this idea that it has to have therefores and buts, right? That idea that stories are about reversals and complications and consequences, not just about a series of, of plot events that occur. And so I think as we, as we mature as a medium, we're, we're finding our feet as storytellers and learning about how, you know, story and art is about surprise. It's about the unexpected, right? As opposed to feeling like, you know, you set up, set up a plot and it's gonna, you know, get a good step through the plot and end where you expect to end. It's all about that journey. And that's, if we do that right, ideally, this is the effect where people don't even wanna put the controller down because they have to see what happens next. Just like when you're sort of sitting on the edge of your seat in a film, you know, that's what we wanna do with these games. Story in game, isn't necessary. I think you can have a lot of games that work just fine without stories, but for the kinds of experiences that I'm personally interested in, I think stories uh, are a way to take the abstract world of a game, which, I mean, when you look under the hood, it's just a lot of, you know, collision volumes and physics and triangles and, you know, wave files and, and this very um, abstract computery thing and to make it something that sort of bridges the gap a little more uh, to the lived experiences that hopefully most of us have as human beings. The audience in the last 20 years I think has um, in many ways a lot of it is growing up um, because you have people who were playing games 20 years ago who are still playing games today. They've grown up and I think they're um, looking for a deeper experience, uh, yet at the same time hoping to have as much fun and relaxation and I just want to get stress out when I'm playing a game. 
but I'm looking for a deeper experience. On top of that, you have all the new players who are coming in who don't have that. So it gets to be, I think, as the industry continues, you're going to find that the games themselves are going to get more diverse because some of them are going to start catering to an older audience who's p perhaps looking for a little more. Um, and the others are still catering to the younger audience who wants to have a great experience as well that's more suited for them. Ano... まあ、映画と小説とは違ってゲームはインタラクティブなメディアなんで、えー、ストーリーテリングをいかにして、えー、プレイヤーからその、えー、と一緒に、えー、二人三脚でストーリーテリングするかっていうところは非常に難しいんですけどそこが一番面白いところでですね、えーとまあ、プレイヤーが、えー、感じながらそれをストーリーテリングと、えー、ゲームのプレイで。えー、並列に進んでいかないと、えー、ストーリーが先に行ってもダメですしプレイが先に行ってもダメなんでそこの整合性をうまく結びつけながら、えー、ストーリーの中にプレイヤーを飛び込ませることで他のメディアではない、えー、その没入感というのがそういうのができますんでそこに一番力を注いでゲームを作ってます。Knowing what your audience saw on the, on the screen. The, the, the camera would frame something, you would get exactly the thought that you have in your head and the words that were written on paper through to the, to, to the,、uh, to the audience. And at that point, it was only left to the audience to basically you know, realize whether or not they understood everything. In cinematic storytelling games, the interactivity changes all of that. You don't know how they're going to perceive. What you're writing because they might not interact、Head、the way the that you expected、okay. them to.、Uh, a, a scene might basically play out because it's a, it's, a, it's a scene that's happening basically right around the player.、Uh, they might just miss it because they might be looking at something else in the game world. And that's where like, the, the boundary is. I've seen a lot of people come from the cinematic, traditional cinematic side and not being able to kind of make that leap to the interactive side because they expect the player to do something just like they would expect the audience to do something. But oftentimes the, the player does something completely different. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always been incredibly passionate about storytelling in games. That's part of what I think drew me to game making versus just game playing. And,、uh, you know, when I think about sort of the games I first started playing,、uh, you know, Day of the Tentacle was one of my, my first、uh, sort of more story based games. And there were games like Myst. And I look at where we are today, particularly as you. Look at the indie game scene and VR and all of these opportunities. I think for telling story in different ways,、um, it's amazing. Like, I think it's really started to inspire game developers to think about narrative in the games、um, differently and also to, to sort of embrace it. I think before it was always、um, let's make sure the story doesn't get in the way of the game as opposed to thinking about how the story really amplifies the game experience. And today, there are A bunch of games out there that are just unapologetically narrative driven. And I think you see on the technology side sort of incredible advances in、uh, graphic fidelity and animation fidelity. And at the same time, you're seeing game developers really hone their craft as directors of, of performance. I've been making, working in games for like 10 years now, 11, 12, too long. <laughs>、um, but I.、Uh, Something I found that I think is really cool is that, at least over the past like three to five, this, I don't know, this chunk of time, the tool sets and just sort of like how to make a game has really flattened out. And you have like two person teams that don't have a dedicated coder making video games. You have 200 person teams that have obviously everything under the sun making games. But because the tool set is like standard ish now, you have a, like a more Like, diverse set of voices that feel like they can make a game. You have, again, like the one indie or the giant group and everything in between. And I think that's just a byproduct of like Unreal and Unity and tool sets just sort of being a solid paradigm. So once you learn one, you're like, oh, I can just do this now. Like, it's, it makes sense the same way like film got democratized with like digital cameras and non linear editors. You know, it's like, and I think that's really exciting. So, Whenever there's sort of a democratization of a medium, you get cool voices coming and talking in that. And、um, I think games is there now. And I think we're like at the dawn of it. I think it's like the most exciting time, like right now, actually.
Before we begin, there are a few things I need to make sure you understand. You see, no one can change what happened last year. The past is beyond our control. You have to accept this in order to move forward. But there is freedom in this revelation. Everything you do, every decision you make from now on will open doors to the future. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember this as you play your game. There's a significant difference, really, between, um, obviously, a, a game script um, and a film script. And the biggest difference, I think, is probably the interaction. The actual process of writing is, is fairly similar. The, the, the outline of a story we've kind of, we set up fairly early on. You have to have a good elevator pitch. You can't, you know, you, the story that you have has to be a strong story and it has to be, you have to be able to get it across quite quickly as a kind of a, a, a concept. Uh, so that's the same. We, um, we do lots of concept art. We, um, uh, we obviously, we work out a story. We don't go too far into the software side of it because that becomes expensive in the wrong route. So we try and, you know, test things out. Um, and then the, the first part of the green light doesn't have to be the entire green light. It can be like, okay, let's develop it to the next stage. So we, we kind of outline the story. Then the designers come in and they work out how the branches might work. And then, uh, as opposed to script, where the, that sort of just gets developed and developed, and, it's, and uh, with a script, it's kind of more like a, a layer on layer on layer on layer. This, this, this goes through stages in a, in a slightly different way. So once we get to kind of the, the basic layout, we start talking to the, the dialogue writers. Um, we're not uh, great dialogue writers. So that's not our, our forte. So we go to, to professionals <laughs> to do that for us. Um, but we need to have that structure in place first. But then they start writing on a, in final draft in the same way that they do on, in the movies. Um, however, we've developed a, a quite a sophisticated bit of software that really helps our um, our process go uh, through a, a very different route, which is that is you have to be able to play uh, a story, and that, and that interaction, that whole idea of using choices or doing stuff, needs to be part of the script as well as obviously just the what's going on. And that needs to be tested very, very early before you start spending thousands and thousands on, uh, on shooting and, and, you know, and all the stuff. Greetings, new fish. I'm Captain Quark. I, I don't believe it. You're here. I used to dream of being arrested by you. Now get out of here. The uh, the writing team will vary depending on the on the project. Um, so most projects it'll be one person. Sometimes the creative director will will actually be the writer. Um, on smaller projects, that that's often the case. Uh, for bigger projects, we'll we'll have one full time writer, sometimes a couple of writers, sometimes we'll have a, a dialogue writer in addition. Um, so it really depends on the, on the size of the project. The the bigger it is, the the more people are going to be involved. Especially when you consider all the ramifications of the story, how it's going to affect the environment. If you're doing performance capture, that's a huge, huge process, and so a lot of people are involved with the, the design of the characters and, and the modeling, the animation, every every aspect of it. We actually, in pre-production now, we'll, story is the first thing we think about, and that definitely didn't used to be the case. But we didn't really have a, the big picture story, I and mean, we'd do all the environments first. And, and now we, we do plan it, what, what's the story arc? And before we even get into what the, the environments are and what the missions are, we'll, we'll have a, a full story treatment of this is exactly you know, where it's going to go. And that way we know, we know the big beats, the big tentpole beats. These, these are things that must happen, and we can, we can build around that, and we know how it's going to end. And that's, that's the most important thing. Game play and story is the first thing that is in the mind. Or if the user is not able to connect the story, or if the user is not able to understand the story, or if the user is not able to いかない、あるいはそのモニターでチェックするんですけども、そういう場合は、あるいはプログラムで作れると思ってたシーンが作れなくなったりということがあって、その都度それ以降はディテールの部分ですけども、毎日そのゲームを作りながら若干ストーリ
、えー、撮影技法とか CG を入れるとかキャスティングで、えー、まあもう一回帰りますよねで撮影現場でシューティングのところでディテールがちょっと変わりますであとは編集だけなんですけどゲームはその後も、えー、ゲームを作りながら毎日、えー、微調整しながら、えー、変化を加えていくというかそういう作業になりますね Writing this stories the, the way I do it is、um, a crazy amount of time it takes me At least I would say 18 months. And on Detroit, the game I'm writing at the moment, it's much more than that. And it's incredibly long, it's very uh, uh, painful.、Um, because it's like when you're a writer, you want to be inspired. So you just want to, to have this instinct that, oh, this is a story that I, I need to tell. And I have that. But then you start thinking about the combinations and the variations and the gameplay and the consequences of everything. And then writing becomes a, a puzzle, and you need to connect things. And to, to, it's your left brain and your right brain, and, 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 you know, at the same time. And、um, you don't want to make any compromise on the story, you don't want to make any compromise on the, the bending aspect and the gameplay. And you just need to find a way they can talk to each other. And, uh, and uh, in, in a way that is consistent, and you know, they, you just want them to blend nicely. When we started on that story, we knew what we knew, and we also knew what we didn't know,、uh, which was that we knew how to make a game, we knew how to build the general arc, the character arc, but writing truly in the sense that it's not game writing, it's slightly outside of the bounds of game writing, we wanted to,、uh, to partner up with somebody that actually could really help on that front. And that person was Kirk Ellis. Kirk、uh, had worked on John Adams, the HBO miniseries, had won an Emmy Award for it, an unbelievable writer, but had never played a game, ever. And it was this moment where you find someone who's never played a game and you wonder, is that the right thing to do? Everyone all right? Yes. Percival, we've neutralized the threat on our side. Good. I managed to capture one of the half breeds. Rendezvous back at Regent. Acknowledge. Let's go. And we found kind of like this middle ground、uh, when we started writing where, where it was really easy, where he understood how each of these characters actually had to communicate to each other. But the beauty of it is that although two people really brought the script to life, it was really the work of a hundred odd people that actually made all those moments matter. We made it really organic, which made everything actually, I think, more. Uh, satisfying in so many ways. In the video games, it's all about an iterative approach and it's all about teamwork. I mean, it's not a process where one writer sits down and writes the story and that's what we're going to make in the video game because everything has to come into play the interactivity, the player choice,、um, gameplay, obviously, making it fun. With the first Assassin's Creed, we started out making a game about the Third Crusade. And、um, actually, it's interesting. When I was a kid, I read The Adventures of Marco Polo, and he comes across the assassins, and we started doing research. And, anyways, there's a lot of, you know, they're a real group that existed. But the other thing we were considering is it was our, an opportunity to create a franchise from scratch. And so often in games, you are working on a sequel, but it's something that was never meant to be a series. So you're kind of thinking, what do I do with this? Where do I take it? And it's tough for the teams. So we wanted to create something that if we were lucky enough to create a hit, there was an infrastructure and some thought into what the franchise would be and where it would go. What we created is kind of this meta story arc and a framework really for all the future games and, and other products. I mean, now it's becoming a movie and it's been books and all of those things. And basically, you know, by adding the present day and then creating a framework where it's all about pivotal moments in history and how the assassins and the Templars were behind that,、uh, that game gave us a framework where everyone can be creative and have their own creative sandbox. Oh, bravo! What an impressive display! A pity we could not let your father live to see it. As for your mother, once I've dealt with you, I promise I'll give her my full attention. 
initially I just, I need to be able to confidently talk about it. Uh, and to me is like figuring enough of the story. Usually it's index cards. It's like, right, like the simplest versions of story beats on index cards to see the arc, to know what the ending is, because the ending tells me what the story's about. Uh, once that's there, is working with um, the design team, the art team, to start developing what is the look of this thing, how does it play, and start creating assets, essentially, whether it's a gameplay prototype, a pre vis animation, some concept art of environments, but now you're starting to be able to visualize better the game in your head, and in talking to people, we're kind of playing the game in our heads. Um, at the same time, you know, the story's getting more fleshed out, still with index cards. I try to hold off as long as possible, putting words on a page because I don't want to get attached to anything yet. I want a lot of ideas that we could throw away and iterate on and find the best ideas. And then at some point, it's getting closer to where we have to start shooting scenes and casting people. And that's when the first scenes get written as casting sides. And those can be shared with the team and they, they reveal more of who these characters are. And then around this same time is when a pitch has come together where with all these visuals, with all these animations, we bring the, the team into uh, the uh, theater in the studio and walk them through the entire experience of the game with as, as much detail as we can. And sometimes it's between an hour and two hours of um, here's how the game starts, here are who these characters are, here's how you're playing them, here's their arc, here's a conflict, here's another emotional turn. And you're going like beat by beat by beat by beat um, through the entire game. That's recorded and saved onto the network. So people can constantly reference that again and again. Um, as much as we can, that tries to capture the tone of what we're after. Uh, and I find that's what helps guide the team the most is this presentation that goes over story, gameplay, aesthetics. As I think about Halo, I think about it as the game and the universe and all of the pieces around it. And it may be the case that there is someone in the household who's very familiar and plays the games all the time, and someone else in the, out, in the household who maybe was introduced to Halo through the gameplay, but maybe um, spends more of their time with the books or with a web series. I think there's a different level of approachability with sort of more traditional linear. deliberate about if you come in from here how do we lay interesting breadcrumbs that may take you to this it's part of sort of the exploration you explore in the game but hopefully you're also exploring um, across our, our transmedia efforts as well Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the DICE 2017 Face It Quake World Tournament. What's up, have, Dan? We have chairs now. This is great. I know. This is nice. I don't feel like sitting, though, do you? I was going to ask, can I sit in the chair? But I'm too excited. You can sit. OK. I'm going to sit. All right. Well, if you're sitting now, that's awkward. Hey, we're here for a tournament of gaming VIPs 
playing Quake, showing off their skills, acting like esports pros. So far, we've had one match today. It was pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, Kim, I mean, he made the finals last time. It actually, actually I, I thought that, again, we'd have that situation. The ringer comes in out of nowhere, replaces someone, and then he's just going to beat Min Kim. But it's close, but Min Kim managed to pull through. And it was a slower map. I think we're considering maybe switching to some faster maps later on. We'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah, decent stuff early on from Min Kim, I think. Yeah, and you know, we want to get right into these games because we, we have so many to play today. So let's take a look at our brackets really quick. You can see behind me here, we did have Min Kim play Gerard Block. Now we're going into the next match between John O'Connell and Tim Willits. And you can see all sorts of great names that we're going to be expecting to see here today. But what do you think we're going to see in this match, Dan? Well, I mean, <laughs> Tim Willits didn't make the map. <laughs> so I don't know, do I have to say anything more than that? Uh, I mean, he also made you know, every Quake game. Uh, you the advantage. I, yeah, I think it's, it's looking pretty good for Tim Willis. But that, but that said, I mean, he was saying earlier that he kind of looks like a bit of a, a D-bag if he actually like beats people on the, the map that he made. So, so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. I guess we will. And I think we have our players ready for an interview. So I'm going to send you on over to your side of the stage. I'm going to go over here and talk to John. John is getting ready with his game. John, how confident are you feeling going into this match? I think uh, if I was to put my money on it, it might be Tim, but we'll see what happens. There's been a lot of there's been a lot of modesty in this tournament so far, and that worked really well for Min Kim. So are you just are you just being modest? What are we going to see that's that's your play style? What are you really good at in this game? My expertise is in the fighting genre, so I'm here to really gain knowledge and insight in terms of what's happening. Like uh, I'm excited just to get in the match. And who are you here representing? Which company is going to expect your pride here? Uh, tier one and a company called Versus. Awesome. Well, wish you best of luck. And Dan, how are we feeling over there? All right, Tim, so as I said, you've made the map. So, I mean, can you be humble at this point, or how does it work? Um, well, just so you know, I, didn't, I wasn't the sole designer on the map. I just want to like, clear that up. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different Quake games, and, of course, I'm focused on our newest Quake champions. So uh, it's difficult to go back and play some Quake World, and, uh, and I know that uh, there's going to be a lot of great competition. So I'm going to do my best. So I have a question for you. I mean, you've, you've been present throughout all the, the generation of the genesis of all the Quake games. So is there a favorite one? Does this one have, have any, you know, particular meaning for you? Uh, well, Quake is, of course, you know, really dear to my heart because it, it changed the industry so much. And uh, we did so many things that, you know, really um, resonate even to today. Um, and uh, Quake 3, of course, is, is, is awesome. Uh, but yeah, they're all, they're all very special to me. Even the new one is extra special. Okay, so last question then. How do you how do you feel your chances? How do you feel about your chances in this matchup then? Uh, well, I'm kind of in this no-win situation because if I win, people are like, well, "You're supposed to win," and if I lose, people are like, "I can't believe you lost." Uh, so I'll just I'm just gonna have fun and uh, do my best. Loose loose situation. Sounds good. Um, all right. So I think uh, Tim Tim looks ready to play. I think uh, everyone's ready. John, you ready? Tim's ready. All right. Let's get right into the match. Dan, take us away. All right, so I'm going to step backstage as the countdown begins, and we will get into this. Okay, so back on DM6, Tim Willits. Can, can he win? He made the map. It's a very, very weird position to be in. I'm not sure if uh, anyone has ever been in this, quite in this position before, as Tim Willits finds himself, but he already will be finding the red armor. No surprises there. The intimate knowledge of the map is what he has to play with. And uh, you know, we'll be seeing him taking some good positioning early on. On the high ground, it's generally a pretty good place to, uh, to be. And you can throw down the rockets. You have good vantage points to get that cheeky damage in. And again, the rockets move so quickly that the travel time is so fast in this game, unlike many other games where the rockets are much slower. It's, uh, it's a very, very versatile weapon, actually. And it can be the, every, the, the answer to every situation. So we'll see how well that goes for him. Or you can see John coming up to the jump pad there, just running into Tim Willis. Tim Willis, very precarious position there on the jump pad, falling down and away from the engagement. Did get some good uh, damage out of that, though. You can see John has actually lost all of his armor, which is very, very problematic. He's going to have to try to pick something up. The question is, how is his knowledge of the map? Does he realize the safe pass to grab some armor? Does he realize that Tim Willis will be on that red armor pretty relentlessly, I should think. I mean, I did hear that Tim has had some, uh, some coaching from Zero uh, Four. He, he, you know, some of you may not know who that is, but he's, he was one of the greatest Quake 3 jewelers of all time. So, so he might have a somewhat of an advantage in that perspective as well. And you can already see, once again, Tim Willis holding that high ground above the red armor. He has plenty of rockets to work with, plenty of uh, shaft ammunition as well, lightning gun ammunition. 
uh, shaft as it's referred to by the uh, by the community. And I think the community name, well, uh, gave it that name actually refers to it because of you know, back in the old days when you'd get a frag, you get all these console messages, and that was uh, one of the messages when you lightning gun somebody. It would say that uh, you know you have shafted your opponent, which is you know nice little bit of uh, humour thrown in there by the developers initially. And uh, once again, we're going to see that eight battle just taking place by this mega, uh, what is the mega health area in Quake 3. But here we can see it is just the place of death for John. First frag made by Tim Willits. And now all he has to do is just grab some armor, get himself stacked up again. Of course, in this uh, mode that we have, the players are spawning with everything, which kind of gives you... Uh, somewhat of an advantage. It's a slight comeback mechanic in a sense uh, for John O'Connell because he doesn't have to look for any ammunition or any health or armor. He can just go straight for the fight and try to quickly trade back the frag before <coughs> Tim has had the ability to just find himself some armor to stack himself back up after that fight which he just had. So it's like John is not going to be able to find Tim just yet and capitalize on that window which he uh, would be able to get an easy frag. Which is very unfortunate for John, but perhaps he can get some good shots off there. He's going to see Tim in center map once again, looking for the engagements. Up the jump pad, John goes. He knocked straight back down, straight back up again. Oh my god, it's, it's, it's not Super Mario Brothers. And as you can see, John is just trying to uh, jump on Tim with his head there. But it will be Tim with another frag. Easily done. He's got loads of armor and health left as well. And we are indeed starting to see that Tim is fairly comfortable right now on this map. And there's no surprises there. So four minutes actually it remain for Tim's opponent, John, to get back into this one. But again, it does look rather bleak at this point. I'm sure uh, Tim is doing 0-4 proud, but maybe uh, maybe the winning conditions for some pride there from 0-4 is actually just to win the tournament. And Tim definitely has some good chances. He's definitely one of the uh, the top contenders, I would say, uh, in the brackets that we have. There are a few, uh, a few interesting names, which we will be uh, seeing later on as well. We're actually going to be doing a few matches back to back uh, after this one, we have uh, three more schedules, so there's no uh, uh, no breaks, really. And you can see John getting spotted in the center map once again. And he is just being, well, he's been taken for a ride there by Tim Willis Rockets. A lot of damage there. Tim Willis tried to follow up there to just finish off the frag, but in doing so, actually allowed himself into a position where he could receive some uh, follow-up damage from his opponent, John, which is going to be going through there. But as we can see once more, Tim knows how to position himself to get you know, rejuvenated, to revitalize himself on the mega pickup, the armor that's around the map as well. As uh, John, he looks like, like, I mean, he's in pretty good stead himself. He's got 200 armor on the red. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> rocket straight to the face. Tim Willits. Pretty savage stuff right there. Two rockets straight to John Connell, direct. That is a lot of damage, 220 damage in a moment, just in a single moment, and that will be enough for another frag there. Three to zero, a very dominant scoreline that we are seeing, at least for this map, which does appear to be quite a bit slower than uh, the previous map that we used. And you can see once again, Tim trying to run the map there, cycling those items, picking up the red again, and making sure that uh, he is ready for the next engagement. The question really is for Tim, and the difficulty is that it's hard to know where your opponent is, especially on a map like this, which is quite large. And we can see that Tim is looking for the obvious spots. The yellow armor spawned. He knows that John is likely going to be trying to position himself around the armors. However, John was not there this time. Instead, he will be found center map and another good rocket by Tim Willis. He was very eager to uh, get himself set up very early to make sure that his sensitivity was on point. And you can definitely see some of his practices been paying off here in his engagements. Looking pretty on point on the, uh, on the aim so far. I haven't seen much, uh, too much lightning gun usage. Just relying on those rockets, stuck in a corner, but it's not going to make a difference. John O'Connell is actually going to shoot himself in the face there, and that is a minus one, big fat minus one for him on the scoreboard. And uh, a fun bit of trivia as well for, uh, for those of you uh, who may have played Quake World a very long time ago. In the community, if you actually shoot yourself with a rocket launcher and you, you do enough self-damage to actually cause a suicide, then, again, the community calls that boring. And the reason why they did that is because, again, in the console messages, when you, fry, when, when you do that, it would say, uh, player one is bored by life. And so the, I think this came from the, the Scandinavian community. And they just ran with that. And so then bored then became synonymous to, to killing yourself with a rocket. So random bit of trivia there. Very weird stuff from the Quake community, but it's... A uh, beloved piece of trivia, I think. Either way, John Connell is going to be finding himself an engagement once again in center map. 
trying to take refuge here with a high ground. It's a good idea as well to position yourself up there when you're expecting your opponent to chase <laughs> off the jump pad, get some easy shots as they go for the choke point. But it looks like Tim is smarter than that. Actually, he won't follow up on the engagement, falls back and away. Does allow John to stack back up, but with only 30 seconds left to try to reclaim a bunch of kills here. It is going to be very, very tough for John and not an impossible. Just so little time left in the matchup. And we're going to see that Tim Willis will make a pass like ships in the nights. Tim Willis and John there. And it looks like Tim has got this one in the bag. And uh, this control on the map has been pretty phenomenal from Tim. I'm going to be quite curious to see how he fares in this tournament. This is very scary stuff. And there you go. Three to minus one. Tim Willits with the win. A fantastic job to both of our players. Congratulations on a well-fought match. And Tim, step forward here with me for a second. We have to get your thoughts on that match. What was the highlight for you? Uh, as soon as I figured out how to get the volume to work, uh, my earphones weren't working at first, so I was a little off. But uh, yeah, it was fun. It was good. So you won even with a little bit of a handicap, is what you're saying? Well, he was good. Yes. I mean, he had some good, uh, good rocket hits, and uh, he played the map well. What does it mean to you to be able to, to play Quake on a stage like this? Uh, you know, it's really, it's, a, it's really an honor because the game has been around for so long and it's, and it's had such an impact on everyone that, um, so I'm very, very proud of it. And you kind of got to step into the esports player's shoes here and experience what it would like to, what it would be like to be a pro. If you were an esports player, what do you think would be some of your defining characteristics, like your handle, your play style, your antics? Would you be one of those media darlings? You know, what would you be like? Uh, I'd be too aggressive. So the uh, the esports guys that play against me, you know, tell me that I don't I don't disengage enough, and that I get into the fight and I stay there too long. So I would be an aggressive. E would you be like a, like a keyboard breaker, bad boy kind of guy? Uh, probably not. But I, I do stay in the fight longer than I should. <laughs> Great. Well, is there anyone that you're kind of representing here that you're trying to to honor in the tournament? Anyone you want to give a shout out to? Uh, really just the guys back at id Software. Uh, it's exciting to, uh, to, you know, be working on a new Quake game. It's exciting to be here playing uh, the original Quake. Well, thank you very much. Congratulations on your win. We'll see you moving forward in the tournament. Go ahead and head backstage. Thank you so much. And Dan, you're back. Awesome. Do we have our, our next two players? Oh, thank you so much. Another hand for John O'Connell. Thank you very much, everyone. All yeah, right, Dan. I, think, uh, I think we've got our next players coming up. Again, we've got the back-to-back -back matches here. I think we have a bit of a tighter schedule than we did uh, previously last year, but we've also been upgraded to the stage, so I can't, can't complain too much. Yeah. But, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, actually, to see, see the likes of Tim Willis there. I mean, yeah. that was a bit scary, actually. He looked a bit too good. <laughs> Do you think he's going to be moving forward way into the, the depths of the bracket? I think so. I think, <laughs> I think he's going to make a pretty deep run here. It's, uh, again, like he... I mean, when, when the player comes in, he's like, here's, I've got my mouse, I've got some coaching, you know, is there early to set up? You know that, that they, they'll probably go quite far. They're, they're prepared, and Tim Willis, he definitely did quite well. He impressed me there. That's awesome. And we do have our bracket that we can check out behind us here. The next match is going to be really interesting. You want to tell us a little bit about our next match, Dan? Well, my hands are a little bit tight here because... Um, <laughs> yeah, you kind of have guy... to say a certain set of words about our next match, don't you? Yeah, so one of the, the players is my uh, is the CEO uh, of the company that I work for. So I don't know what to do, Anna. What should I do? Yeah. Should, I, should, I, should I root for him? You know, I've got to be careful here. I don't want to, you know, I want, I want to raise this year. Well, uh, either way, I think we should send you to talk to him, to talk okay, to Nick. So go ahead that. and head on over there. I'm going to go speak to his challenger, Matt. Are you guys, you guys ready to chat a little bit over here? All right, come on and stand up with me over here in the light. We have to see your beautiful face. Now tell me a little bit about who you are and who you're representing here today. Uh, I'm Matt Fyroar. I'm the game director at ZeniMax Online Studios. So worked on uh, Elder Scrolls Online is our current title. And on a scale of scrub to pro, how good are you at Quake? Old. <laughs> is that good or bad? I'm not sure with Quake. Also hungover. <laughs> okay, so, so maybe some challenges, but sounds like you're pretty familiar with the game. Any, uh, any things you know that you do really well in this game? Uh, I die a lot, but uh, I, seriously, I played the hell out of it in 1997, so I haven't played since. So uh, it's going to be uh, an amusing uh, experience. Do you know anything about your opponent? Anything uh, that might give you pause or anything that makes you feel encouraged? Uh, I know nothing about him, uh, so, but I'm sure I'll find out in the next 10 minutes. I'm sure you will. Go ahead and set up your game. Thanks so much. Dan, how's it going for Nick over there? 
All right, Nick. So again, I don't want to get fired, so just just going to throw it out that straight away. So I'll probably be quite nice to you, but uh, I mean, you didn't get into esports until you started to when you had the idea to to work in you know the, the tech industry, basically. So how is this like a familiar experience for you, or is it just a bit out there? It's actually the first time. I mean, I got into esports thanks to Quake. Uh, I had never played an esports game before, and uh, probably thanks to my co-founders, that's how I started. For for me, it's sort of fun to be in this position because I've always been behind the scene. So in that sense, you know, being brought into it only a few years ago with Quake, I mean, you were kind of a normal person, I guess, you know, less, less of a nerd than the rest of us potentially, you know, you didn't grow up playing video games. So how did it affect you? Like, what, what was your impression of the idea of competitive gaming and getting into it? Like, because I mean, I've seen you in the office, like, you're pretty, you're pretty into it. Yeah, I got into it. I think uh, once you start getting competitive, you, and you get the essence of it, it totally changes the way you play. It's uh, way more engaging, it's uh, way more fun, you have an objective, you have a goal. It's, uh, it's fun. I'm not at the level where I can compete, but uh, even at my level I can have fun. Okay, so you know, talking about you know, fun, you did have a, a little bit of coaching from, from Sturmy, who's our resident Quake expert, a resident professional gamer. So you know, do you feel prepared for this? Uh, relatively, I think he trained me on the wrong map. So that's my only issue, but it's, it's gonna be fine. Nice, okay, so just, uh, just don't break anything, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've seen Nick break some stuff in, in the office floor when he loses, so hopefully it doesn't happen. All right, I think, uh, are you ready, Nick? Uh, sorry? Are you ready to go? Uh, almost. Okay, so we're almost ready to go, Anna. I think we have some time to chat while these players get ready, Dan, and I'm, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the last match and what you think might be different in this match. How do you think this match will be characterized? Well, I think, I think Nick is, uh, is, is going to be an aggressive player. I don't think he's going to you know, concern himself too much with uh, the classic ways to get ahead in the game, like positioning and you know, efficiency. I think he's just going to go like, straight in there, just you know, full out aggression. That's what I expect from Nick. So I, I don't know about uh, Mr. Ferrara over there. He, he, he did come in a little bit uh, like he's underestimating himself. So I think, that, again, like you said, a lot of players are very humble. So I, I'm not sure you know, what's going to be going on over there, but Nick is just going to go straight in. So. I've heard a lot of stories today backstage about the, the very real possibility of us seeing some keyboard breakage on that side of the stage. Is this from a, a story in real life, or is this, you know, what, where does this come from? He just likes to break stuff, I think. I, I don't know, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I've heard this. He just gets really into it. Has, has he broken a keyboard before? Is there a story you can tell us? I think it's usually mice. <laughs> the, it's usually the mice that gets the, the slam. Uh, the pound, the slam there. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Well, we are going to be going into this match. We're going to be playing all of today and tomorrow. Last year, we, we did the same thing out in the hallway and actually didn't get to stream so this year we're kind of stepping it up a notch how has this year been different so far from from the face it side for you well last year i couldn't come into this room so it's, uh, it's a big improvement i feel much more important which is great and on the stage now it's, it's lovely stuff i brought my jacket just you know to suit the occasion so uh yeah no it's, it's really cool actually i mean dice is a uh, is a uh, very I mean, whenever anybody asks me about it, it always feels like a, very a much more intimate vibe to, compared to a lot of events. So I feel like every it's a much more family-oriented environment. Everyone's here, has been playing these games. I mean, one of the reasons why we have Quake here, you know, one of the decisions behind that is because all these guys have played it, they kind of grew up on it, and so there's a lot of history behind everything. And I think that really connects people in a way which is uh, pretty special. So, so it's, it's a very cool and somewhat unique and in, un, oh, untang unintangible vibe. Is that a word? I don't know. <laughs> Wording, yeah. wording is hard. Yeah, words are diff very difficult, I would say. You know, we're, we're coming into this, though. We are seeing that family atmosphere around Quake. You mentioned the, the culture of Quake that you've kind of been a part of coming up, QuakeCon, uh, Quake leading you into eSports. We're seeing a lot of people this year, I think, recognizing Quake right off the bat, being ready to play it, whereas in the past, video games have maybe been, you know, they were, they were available, then they were unavailable, and they were kind of lost in, in history, but now we're able to, to play them again. Tell us a little bit about what goes into taking a game like Quake and making it playable now on a stage like this. Uh, from an esports perspective? Yeah. Um, a, game, a game like Quake World or a yeah. more modern one. Um, well, the thing is with Quake World is that there's a lot of challenges because, I mean, <laughs> You know, if, you run, if you're running an esports tournament, you like the, the term active development for a game. And Quake is, I don't think it had any development really except from the community you know, for many years. So even though there's a lot of functionality for, for the game to, to be you know, esports ready, to be you know, to put, up, put on stage as it were, as it is now, um, it's, it's more tailored for the hardcore community. There's actually a lot of settings and commands and so on that we are really racking our brains to, to try to, 
to understand and to get. Like for example, you know, there's a setting to force everyone to ready up at once that you know we take for granted in other games. But we just can't find that setting. There's like there's a lot of like stuff like that. It's just a bit weird, like problems that you don't expect because it's it's so old. But it's uh, the thing is, is that, that the engine for Quake 1 was an engine that was used and modified for so many different games. I mean, the Half-Life 1 engine was a modified Quake engine. The Source engine, which you know, Counter-Strike Global Offensive runs on, was a modified version of that. And the Call of Duty uh, original engines were based off of the, the id tech as well. So, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, a cl it's I don't know, it's a classic experience. It's difficult, but, but you, you learn to love it. Yeah, it's fun to give it an homage. Now, I want to check in and make sure it looks like our players are both in game. Are we ready, players? Ready on that side? Looks like, do we have a ready from this side? I'll go, I'll go poke I'll him. wait to get the OK from production before we move forward, but I think it looks Good. like we're all ready. I'm ready whenever you All right, ready. players are ready, so we can now get into the game. Let's do it, Dan. All right, so I'm going to go and step back into my little casting cove uh, backstage uh, whilst the countdown begins. Here we are, so seven minutes on DM6, Q3, DM6, Quake 3, DM6, that is. It's been ported back in time, back into the original Quake here. So Niccolo Maisto, let's see what he can do here. It's gonna be uh, a pretty interesting experience for me because I've heard he's been training in, in the office with uh, one of our, the, with the other employees of the, the, the company, one of the co-founders actually, uh, Sturmy, who was a uh, very prolific Quake professional gamer and still does try to play professionally when he has the time. So Nick already you know, doing much as we saw from Tim Willis, trying to occupy that high ground, trying to main maintain control of these good vantage points to make sure you can get off those you know, really effective engagements. Because you can see here, you can throw some rockets down, you don't have to be aggressive, you can like, fall back, get another position, cut off your opponent with the rockets perhaps, and that's going to be you know, a good way to set yourself up to then try to close the fight down for the kill later on. But it can often be about that, just trying to set yourself up for the kill later, especially in a slower map like this, it can come down to more of a war of attrition than it can necessarily come down to any one particular isolated engagement, perhaps. So we're seeing Nick just trying to work out where his opponent is and once again just keeping those good positions uh, available to himself to make sure that he can have the advantage in the upper hand when his opponent does appear. But as I also said it in the previous match, as we can now see Nick does actually find Matt Perot. That's some good damage there. Plus out the lightning gun to, to try to follow up. This is great work here so far from uh, Niccolo Maisto and he will get the first frag. Beautiful finish there actually and you can indeed see the practice and the familiarity uh, that he has with the game after you know, some, some additional training. He's a very competitive guy. I know that firsthand, and uh, so he's going to be happy with that one. But it's uh, about holding on to lead now. I want to see if Matt can do any damage here to Nick's lead. He's got five minutes to try to find an equalizing situation, and he's going to catch Nick just <laughs> running around, minding his own business. The, the, uh, the countryside stroll there from Nick as he runs by, but he finally turns his attention to take the fight with Matt. And it looks like there are potential problems here. Matt taking a lot of damage right now, a little bit flustered in this engagement, and he will go down, respawning instantly into the same area. But that's... Later on thinking that this could be one of the guys that he could be up against deep into the tournament because Nick's looking quite good. Matt at the moment trying to find his bearings on the map. And once again, you can see Nick is just, uh, Nick Lowe is in a great position to just keep the damage up and also allows himself to, to disengage quite easily from positions like this. High ground is kind of universally a great tool uh, in, in FPS games. Just collecting some ammunition. This tends to be somewhat of the struggle, actually. Uh, if you're alive for a prolonged period of time, you've taken those engagements. Uh, in in Niccolo's position, you can see that he's he has uh, nine rockets and 12 lightning gun cells. And he's actually the first player that we've actually seen so far really trying to be cognizant of using that lightning gun. It does so much damage. It has a lot of knockback as well to it as well because uh, the knockback works uh, respected to the damage that you deal. And that's actually some pretty scary lightning gun aim right there from Nick. That is just on point. And he's got three and a half minutes left. He's already got three frags. So it is indeed looking like perhaps a bit of a countryside stroll for him at the moment. We'll have to see if uh, Matt Farrar can uh, summon the powers of, of being old to, uh, to try to get back into this one. I, I'm not sure when he said on stage in the interview um, that it, if being old was actually a thing that was something he could use or not uh, to his advantage. So, so far it's not looking too great for him. And again, you can see Nick is just sitting on the jump pad there. 
And for good reason, he, he doesn't have a, an opponent to worry about in the vicinity, but he might get that information. And you can see him running past the, the items there to just take the engagement. This is really smart, actually, because he can take the engagement, and by leaving the items up, he knows that they're up. He can, oh my god, Matt, for all. He's actually the first victim of a crater. He has cratered to his death. And uh, actually, cratering is uh, another kind of a bit of terminology in the Quake series, actually, which I believe... I'm not sure if it was uh, if, if it first came into being in Quake 1, but it certainly uh, came into being in Quake 3. So if you fall to your death, that is known as a crater. If you're unfamiliar, uninitiated in the Quake series, and that is exactly what's happened there. So minus one on the scoreboard for Matt Farore. And this is the early stages of the tournament. This is the, uh, the round of 16 that we're playing out at the moment. So early days, although it is single elimination, so... The winner goes forwards and the loser, he only has this one chance. One chance for that beautiful trophy that we handed out to Sean Dunn last year at uh, DICE 2016. And uh, it is a trophy to dream about. Let's see if anything can be going in the way for Mr. Matt here. Perhaps he can get some kind of redeeming engagement at least, get a nice frag to demand some respect at the very least from uh, Niccolo. There's a minute and a half left right now, and you can see uh, Nick is just running around trying to find Matt. He knows he's got an advantage on the health and armor, and he's got a nice lick of damage at the LG. Goes for the rocket jump. <laughs> Again, you can see he's been practicing those. We talked about it earlier. Tries to cut off Matt Farrow. It doesn't work out, but actually Matt Farrow double backs into it and gives Niccolo an easy kill. It's four to minus one. This is uh, one of the most dominating scorelines we've seen so far. And there's all the ammunition here as well. Actually, uh, one thing that happens in, also in Quake 1 is that you have backpacks that uh, your opponent will drop. Their, their, uh, if they had a weapon that they just shot, but if they haven't reloaded to kind of put the weapon away yet, that weapon can be, can be dropped in the pack when they die, as well as any ammunition that they were carrying as well. So in getting that frag, you, you can see that uh, Nick was able to stack back up on the lightning gun ammunition as well as the rockets. So he's sitting on a 98 and 98 respectively on both, which is pretty nice. Nothing to worry about, really, uh, for him in this situation. Another engagement perhaps haphazardly taken by Matt somewhat of a, 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 an intrepid approach there from him, I would say, as uh, Nick is just going to easily bat him away and find himself back into good position, back into a spot where he can close this one down with a very tidy scoreline. So let's see if there's uh, any more engagements here to be had. Looks like he will be found. Matt lurking in the distance, trying to bring the fight to Nick, but there he is on top of the jump pack. Great position to defend from. Pulls up lightning gun there. A lot of knockback, very disorientating, and that will be another frag for Niccolo. That is five to minus one as we go into the dying breath of this one. Five seconds left. And there it is, Niccolo Maisto. Five frags for him, minus one for Matt Farore. Congratulations to both of our players. Very well fought. Thank you so much, Matt. You can go ahead and exit the stage, but let's give him one warm round of applause and congratulations for a great match. Niccolo, come on up and join me. You won that match pretty handily. You've been practicing, right? Uh, not much, but uh, apparently my co-founder did a good job. Yeah, you, you pulled off some really impressive moves. What do you think was your favorite moment? If you were to make a highlight reel of that match, what would you want people to see? Uh, probably the first frag. Just because until then I wasn't sure I was actually going to get any. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel confident now that you're going to be able to move forward in this bracket, maybe even win the whole thing? Uh, maybe, let's see. I was told that I can't win, so I'd love to prove them wrong. Well, that sounds great to me. Any, uh, any words for Dan? He got to interview you earlier. He said he was a little concerned about getting fired. Is his job safe now that you won and everything? Uh, yeah, I won, so, so far, yes. Okay, that's good. Good to hear. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations again, Niccolo. And now, Dan, I believe we get to go right into our next match. Is that right? I believe so, yes. And I we have our bracket we can check out right here. We just saw Niccolo Maisto face off against Matt Fryroar. And now we get to see Jeffrey Kaplan and Steve Elmore. Anything that you uh, know about this match, Dan? Well, this is an interesting one because, I mean, I have the expectation that, uh, that uh, Jeff is going to do a pretty good job, actually, in this one. It's hard to say. Again, you know, we always err on the side of caution with this, with these predictions. But, I mean, you know, Jeff, he's, uh, he's a pretty big deal in the, in the FPS scene at the moment. You know, 
with Overwatch and so on. So one would imagine that he's got some skills and, and the background. And you know, we'll ask him some questions when he comes up to find out a little bit more about his background. If he if it does span so far back as you know twenty you know, two decades uh, with Quake One. So it's uh, it's interesting. I know nothing about Steve Elmore though, really. So. Yeah, well, we'll find out soon. And it looks like the winner of that match will go on to face Nicola. So they've gotten to kind of scout out their future opponent, depending on who comes out ahead. So let's spend some time interviewing our players. I think it looks like Steve is ready and Jeffrey is getting ready. So I'm going to head over there and have some words with him. We'll be right back. Jeffrey, can we chat for just a moment? Come on and stand up here in the light. Now, uh, we were mentioning you probably have some FPS skill. How do you feel going into a Quake match? I'm extremely nervous right now. <laughs> I hope I don't make a fool of myself. Well, you know, most of us don't spend a lot of time currently playing Quake, so there's not a whole lot on the line, but who are you here representing? Who are you here hoping to honor with your win in the tournament? I hope uh, we have a fantastic community of FPS shooters, and they're going to think I'm terrible if I don't at least get a couple frags. I'm not saying I'm going to win even a round, but as long as I don't end up with a negative score, I think I'll be happy. Well, that sounds good to me. Have you done any practicing, or are there any things that you are really good at that's like your signature move that we should watch for? I like the shotgun, which is unconventional for Quake. It really should be about the rocket launcher and the lightning gun, but I actually really like the shotgun, so I feel comfortable with it, so I'm going to look for that. And i uh, been playing with my wife. Uh, we've been playing Quake Live, though, and Quake World's a little bit different, so we'll see how I end up. Well, you got to use what works for you, right? Maybe this is your, your signature that'll take you to the top. Good luck. Thank you so much. Go ahead and get ready in the game. And Dan, over to you. Yes, I'm here with Steve. So how do you feel about this one, Steve? I mean, you know, Jeff, I think, again, we see, we see this time and time again. People are very humble. Yeah, uh, my, my Quake is pretty rusty at this point. Uh, I used to be a, an avid player back when I started in the industry, like 20 years ago. And uh, so uh, hoping it's like riding a bike and hoping those skills will come right back to me. So would you say there is, is there some level of pride online? Because, I mean, as Jeff said, there's a lot of people that are probably looking, looking to him for, they, they expect some legitimacy for him to like, really be good at FPS. Is there pride online? You know, do you have you know, people watching at home? Uh, I mean, I used to play Quake a lot, so I'm hoping to hold up the, uh, the expectations of the people I used to play with. So are you familiar with the map, and did you prepare uh, much for this one? I prepared a little bit. I played single player, but that, that's about it. But, uh, you know, I, I feel pretty confident about, you know, strafing and jumping and rocket, uh, especially like head-to-head -head rocket launcher play. So we'll see how I do. I might wipe out immediately. <laughs> I actually have a pretty good feeling about this. I feel like you're holding back a little bit here. So, so Jeff uh, might have uh, quite, quite some, something on his hands right here, Anna. Well, let's go ahead and chat just a little bit as these players get ready, Dan. You know, it's interesting. I know that uh, there is a lot on the line pride-wise when you play video games in front of a crowd, and all of these people are established gamers. They spent lots of time playing video games, but we're in a best-of-one format. As someone who knows esports really well, what can we know about a, a best-of-one format that may kind of alleviate the pressure on these guys? I guess, I guess with best of ones, it, it has like that caveat where it's like you can always say, oh, you know, it's the best of one. I didn't get, you know, all that time to kind of allow my skill to even it out, you know, the variance and, you know, all those things. But, but it sucks. Sometimes, you know, losing can just, you know, ruin your day. So yeah. sometimes, have, have you ever had that? Like sometimes you lose a match, it just ruins your entire day. Oh, totally. And I, I think with best of ones, it's always easiest for me to come up with an excuse. Like, oh, if, if we had gone to a second game, I, I would have figured that out and I would have done better the next time. So I always feel like a best of one is a little bit better in, in that case, if you're really trying not to embarrass yourself, for me. Yeah, actually, that's a good point, because then if it's the best of three, you, you, don't, you don't have an excuse. So you, then you, you really you, you, lost. You just suck at that point. So Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that, that's, I, I can see where you're, where you're going with this one. But I, I feel like uh, Mr. Elmore over there, I, I, I feel like he is very prepared for this, and he has a very good chance of actually crushing Jeff. I, that's the kind of vibe that I was getting. Oh, I don't wow. know if, if you have the same vibe. But so that's, that's where I was over there. Well, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring for Jeff then. I think I, I'm rooting for him and believing in him. So we'll see who comes it is, out it is on Vegas. top. I mean, yeah. should, we should probably bet on this. I mean, that's <laughs> well, guys, what the guys in the audience can do, I guess. I don't know if there's like a kind of betting ring set up somewhere, but that, that, should, that should happen. Someone should sort that out. Yeah, go to the, there's special rooms for that here for, you know, sports ball, right? I have no idea. I should, I don't gamble at all, so, <laughs> so I have no idea. I'm We're out of our league, Dan. We're out of our league. Let's get back into video games and let's start the game right now. Alrighty, so our players are going to be kicking things off. The countdown has begun, which means I will disappear from the stage.
Alrighty, so back onto the M6. Familiar territory at this point. Oh my god, already Jeffrey getting two very nice ruckus onto Steve. Elmore taking a lot of damage at Steve, but he still wants to fight actually. This would be a great point for him to actually back away as he can get a clean path to that red armor. But worryingly for me actually, we heard that Jeffrey really likes the shotgun. And in Quake Live, it's, it's good situationally, quite good. In Quake World, it sucks. It, it is absolutely terrible. It does very little damage. Uh, it's, I believe, four damage per pellet. So very minimal damage compared to the rockets. And you can see, indeed, Jeffrey will actually be pulling out the good old-fashioned, tried and tested rocket launcher. 110 damage if you manage to connect that thing direct. So that's going to work out for him. Steve was fairly unlucky, I would say, right at the start. The initial spawns did work out in a way that his opponent, Jeff, was able to get a, a quick and easy drop on him with an easy rocket. I think Steve still could have fallen back to the Red Armor at that point, but either way, the fight continues here. This is the Railgun area in Quake 3, but here is actually where the Lightning Gun spawns, although our players will be spawning with all the weapons, so they're not too overly concerned with that area. And Steve, after a, a casual exchange of rockets, will be coming out fairly well there, actually. 121 armor left over and 181 health. And the Mega is actually up there on the pillars, but you can see Steve is more concerned with trying to discover where his opponent is hiding. You can see Jeff is currently less stacked than his opponent in Steve. So Jeff does have to be careful. He's also sneaking around on the mid levels and the lower areas, which means that he is quite susceptible to taking a nasty rocket if, if uh, Steve is lurking above. That is positioning we saw, you know, a Niccolo earlier abusing quite well, using those rockets to, to have a good vantage, or rather using the, the high ground to have a good vantage point to get the info, maybe get a good rocket, and if you do connect the rocket, you can follow it up. But speaking of follow-ups here, it's very strong engagement here. Three direct rockets from Jeff, very nicely done, and that is a decisive frag for him. Two to zero, very early on into this one. There's just under five minutes left here for a comeback attempt to be mounted. And perhaps my... Uh, my gut feeling was off about Steve right now because he is definitely suffering. Jeff is looking very, very strong. All that practice in quick life with his wife is paying off, perhaps. Here is another engagement, though, and there it is. Steve off the spawn, able to capitalize in that window of vulnerability that Jeff was in after that previous engagement that had left him low. He did not have the sufficient time to you know, stack back up to be healthy, so instead it will be Steve able to trade back one. But still the situation remains that there is an advantage here for Jeff in one frag, but it is very recoverable at this point, especially with four minutes on the clock to go with. Oh, nasty rocket taken there from the back from Steve. Jeff finding him and trying to close down the frag. You can see the panic setting in here from Steve, unable to find his way through the doorway to potential safety. And instead, Jeff is going to follow it up three to one. And that window of opportunity we, we talked about Steve capitalizing upon, we saw just then Jeff doing exactly the same. Steve there, he will just spot Jeff wandering around. And again, Jeff needs to get himself into a position where he can get some armor. He's still quite weak, I think, from the previous fight that he had. There is a yellow and mega up in this position where Steve is. And Steve needs to go up the jump pad to try to get the interception. But it looks as though he will instead be missing out on an engagement. And I believe that Jeff is probably quite stacked up. And at this point, Jeff should have been able to grab the red armor. Not sure if that's the case, but Steve is going to be once again caught out by Jeff. Jeff finding the fights first. Good rockets there coming in from Steve. Two directs, and that's going to bat away Jeff for the time being. Jeff realizes that he's had more than he can chew, so he's going to just disengage. That said, he does pick up the green, and the green is deceptive. It says 100, but it doesn't offer you almost any protection. I think you can only use about 25 of it with 100 health. And indeed, he's going to back away a little bit. Trying to re-engage back onto the red armor. Nice connections coming in. Jeff showing quite some proficiency with that rocket launcher aim. And that is what Quake World really comes down to. We did see, actually, a great display on the lightning gun from Niccolo. And I'm curious if we'll see more lightning gun shenanigans from other players. Because it's the other weapon that's very, very strong. Especially if you can connect a good string of, of, of cells. It's highly damaging. Much more uh, DPS than the rocket launcher, in fact but you need the accuracy. And once again, we see that battle over the high ground, and it will be Jeff trying to re-engage it, going back up here. He wants some more. However, one rocket, actually, one bad rocket, it would take him down, so he's got to be quite careful here. Still pursuing the frag. He feels like there's blood in the water right now, as though his opponent's very weak. That is the case, but so was he. And it's going to be a mutual frag there. 
And of course, that is going to be very beneficial for Jeff because he's going to actually st uh, spawn stacked up again. And now he finds the engagement once again, catching Steve by the red armor. That red armor pickup could make, make the difference in this battle. Still up right there. Both players can use this to try to win this engagement. But instead, we're going to have Steve disengaging and Jeff is going to try to pursue here. He doesn't want that red. He realizes he's still pretty strong after that fight and that he's in a better position to close down a kill by going for the pursuit instead of going back for the stack. But... Unfortunately for him, he's guessed wrong, and he hasn't found his opponent just yet. But there it is, Steve coming in to the fight on his terms. You can see just how damaging that lightning gun can be as Jeff is set, tail between legs, trying to escape here, pulls out the boomstick. That's one of the weakest weapons that he Able to outmaneuver Steve and ultimately close down the kill once again. So, Jeff with five, Steve with two. Looking really bad now for Steve with only what, 40 seconds on the clock. I don't know if that's enough time at this point. You can see Steve looking on the lower levels. He's actually going to find Jeff, catch him off guard by the green armor. And once again, we're going to have the, uh, the suicide kill there with the rockets. Rockets are so damaging. The splash is the radius and the splash is absolutely enormous in this game. So it's very, very easy to kill yourself with it. And it looks like a 5-1 scoreline now for Jeff. So perhaps we do have some of that FPS legitimacy there from Mr. Jeff Kaplan himself. Back in for another engagement. Wants to make it one more frag. It won't be the case though. 5-2. to two. Steve winning one back. And at least there is perhaps some, uh, some redemption in that. Small consolation. A frag right at the end. Steve gets to have the last word in the match. But it's Jeff that wins it. 5-2. to two. Congratulations to both of our players. Let's hear it especially for Steve as he exits the stage. Thank you so much, Steve. A great game. And Jeffrey, come on and join me again in the light. You said you were, you were nervous. You were worried about letting down that FPS community. But you, you didn't. Are you feeling pretty good now? I did okay. I think it was a little spazzy. I had some mistakes. Steve did great, so it was an honor to play against him. And did your, your favorite techniques pan out the way you hoped so? I totally lied and didn't use a shotgun at all, and I just stuck to the rocket launcher the entire time. Well, you know, you got to go with what feels right in the moment, right? So do you have uh, any messages after your game for, for that FPS community? Well, I got to meet Tim Willits after backstage, and um, I was in just complete awe and honor to, to be in his presence, so that was pretty amazing. That's awesome, and you know who you're going to face next. It's going to be Niccolo, and he just came up here and, and put on a pretty good fight. Do you know him? Are you looking forward to that match? I, I'm not looking forward to that match at all. I think I'll be embarrassed quite heartily there. Well, you put up some good points this time, so uh, I don't know. I think your modesty may be a little unfounded, but as an esports player now, as a pro, what do you think your uh, your play style or your persona is? We're trying to kind of get a, a feel for who your fans would be. Oh God, I have no idea. I think anybody who's desperate enough to root for me is pretty much who my fan base is at this point. Awesome. So people who like humility, I think, is what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Congratulations again. Go ahead and head backstage. Dan, what's up next, buddy? So we've got Sean, who is uh, going to be coming up next, and he was uh, a previous winner. He won last year, so he's, got some, he's already got the belt. He's got to maintain that. And already, I think this year, we're seeing quite some competition. I think, I mean, Jeff looks pretty good. We saw Nick looks pretty good, and that's going to be a really interesting match. I have no idea what's going to happen there. I think I'd give Nick the slight edge. We'll have to see. But yeah, Sean, he's got some competition, real competition here, to challenge his trophy. And it is a very sexy trophy. It is. I saw it backstage. It looks pretty good. It has the face it. Uh, it's a, I was calling it a check mark, but it's actually a bird, I've been told. It's, it's, a, it's a pheasant. A pheasant? Yeah, you have to. I mean, I have no real. <laughs> I, I can't really explain that to you. I mean, it's. it's I mean, people look at it. It's, it's kind of like a weird, almost triangle star. It, it actually reminds me of, um, you know, Star Trek. They have the, uh, the little. Um, a little Star Trek logo, where they have the little communicators. That's what it, it reminds me of. That, but it's just one key. I like. I the do work. work for this company. I'm probably getting fired <laughs> pretty pretty soon. But uh, well, let's get into the video game before we uh, say anything else that might get us fired. So let's let's okay, talk to our, our competitors now. Let's head over, and I'm going to speak to Sean, who is no stranger to this stage. Sean, you want to come up and actually join me here? 
get to see you a little bit better. Tell the people at home uh, who you are and, and your experience in the past on this stage. So uh, my name is Sean Dunn. Um, I work at Sparky Pants Studios. And uh, last year, there was an opening in the tournament. Someone didn't show up, show up and I uh, played a lot of Quake in the past. So I stepped up and got in. I had no expectations of doing well, but uh, got lucky and took the trophy. You sure did. And now you're pursuing another trophy. Are you feeling confident this time around? Not at all. I'm super nervous. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get uh, wiped out in the first round. And uh, yeah, I lost in, uh, in go-karting and lost at Magic last night. So I'm going for the trifecta. <laughs> you know, this is a pretty common theme. Almost everyone we interview says, oh, no, I'm going to lose. I'm not very good. Is this a, is this a humility thing? Is it a, do we need to worry about the self-esteem of all of our gaming VIPs? How should we react to this? Yeah, I think it's just abject terror, you know, playing against Willits or Kaplan, all these guys, it's, um, it's a little bit daunting. So I, I hope I do well, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just fun to play. Well, we wish you the best. Go ahead and set up your game now, and we'll head over to Dan. All right, so I'm here with uh, Shaker. So you're from Wargaming, right? So that's tanks. I mean, the rocket launcher is, is pretty strong. It's kind of like firing a tank gun, I imagine. But uh, are you familiar with Quake? I, I am. I, uh, I, I played all of them as they were coming out. Uh, we'll see. I've gotten so used to playing World of Tanks now for a few years that uh, uh, we'll see if I can keep up with the pace. It'll be interesting. Yeah, that's, that's what I would mention. The pace is, is kind of nuts. And, you know, Sean, he won last year. I mean, he's been, I imagine, I would, I would like to think that he's been practicing, you know, to try to, you know, just keep that trophy. Uh, have you been practicing at all? I mean, DM6 is a, is a classic Quake 3 match, so you, you'll know it. Yeah, uh, if you count 45 minutes last week practicing, sure, I practiced. <laughs> so are you playing anything else other than World of Tanks or tank-related? Well, I guess that's the only tank game you're allowed to play, so... Uh, yeah, so uh, let's see. Uh, it, was, it was really exciting to get to watch the Overwatch keynote this morning because I'm a huge fan, and, and you know, pretty much anything that comes out on console nowadays is my bag. Okay, so I have to ask you, having played all the Quakes, is there a favorite one, and which one would it be and why? Uh, I think I had the most fun with three, and I don't, know, I don't know if I could pinpoint any one thing, but just the package, the total experience was just awesome. I'm, I'm with you there. That's, that's, the, that's the, the quake that I like the most as well. So uh, are, you, are you ready? Is everything set up? Are you good to go? Yeah, well, we made a deal backstage that we're going to try to go for a 0-0 tie here so we can both say we're the losers, so we'll see how that goes. All right, <laughs> great. Good uh, competitive spirit over here, uh, Anna. So it looks like our players are pretty much ready to go and kick this one off. This match is going to be interesting. I mean, there is something to be said for the luck of someone coming in without expectations that we saw from Sean last year, but he is also the reigning champion, so we have some expectations of him there. What do you think we're going to see? I think Sean is going to be very good. I, I seem to recall last year that it was, uh, it was kind of weird how good he was and how comfortable he felt kind of aiming, and that was actually a big advantage that he had over a lot of the other competitors, because like a lot of them have said, you know, it's been so long since they've stepped into Quake that even if they have, you know, experience playing other FPS games, aiming is not quite, quite the same, so you expect some degree of, of uh, you know, problems there to be had, but Sean seemed like, you know, fish in water, so... Yeah, and it's interesting to talk to a lot of these people who they work in video games, they spend all their time focused on video games, but as a trade-off, sometimes that means you don't have a lot of time to play video games, right? Yes, <laughs> that is the, the deep and uh, very, very uh, horrible irony of the whole situation, that you don't get to play as much. Because I, I if I had a choice, I would be competing again myself. So It looks like they're very oh. eager to actually play those video games, so let's get right into the match. All right, let's do it. So... Who's going to be able to take this one? Sean, he was pretty damn good last year, but will that continue? It is a different map to start things off in the round of 16, as we've already seen a slower pace. Now Shaker is going to be sitting up there on that that's a rocket launch area in the high ground. He's found himself the mega side of the map. And again, he will be familiar with Quake 3, so he knows this map. Shake has got the nail gun in hand. One thing that uh, is very problematic in this situation is that na the nail gun is really quite a terrible weapon here. You can see that Sean is having a pretty easy time just bouncing around with the rockets. So Shake is going to have to find that rocket launcher pretty soon if he wants to be able to have any decent engagements in this situation. And so far, it looks as though it will not be the case. Shake is still back onto the nail gun. And of course, they do spawn with all the guns. So. Perhaps it's a situation, as we saw with Jeff. Because what worried me with Jeff Kaplan is that he was talking about his, his love for the, the shotgun, but it's kind of like, uh, well, you have, you have the Ferrari there, and you know, you're choosing 
she choosing to drive like a, a Peugeot 106 or something. That's essentially the choice in Quake World between a rocket launcher and a, and a boomstick. So I was, I was pretty happy to see that he used the, the, the right tool for the job overall. But right now the nail gun, it is, it is a tool, but I'm not sure it's going to get much done in this situation. But Sean is just once again dancing around him with the rockets. And, and as I mentioned last year, Sean was just showing great comfort with the weapons. And that's generally where his where his you know, expertise really uh, was actually. I mean, that's something that you know some players you know found hard to deal with because you can have the good position, you can have the cycle on the items around the map to restock yourself. But you've got a guy coming in and just hitting four rockets straight away in your face. That is a big problem. So. It's looking good for Sean so far. 2-0 for him, the defending champion of the FACIC Quake World tournament here, here at DICE Summit. Now, I mean, we know that Shake is likely good with tanks so far. I mean, we haven't seen uh, all too much with his rockets. There we go, he got the rockets out now, that's perfect. Let's see if he can get some good shots off there. Got Sean going for the pursuit there, finding himself a very, very good engagement there. And again, you can see quite how scary Sean is in these situations. Looks pretty uh, comfortable with how you manage the splash damage as well. Because again, one thing that is, I guess, fairly... I suppose it's a sense of the game that you're know, playing Quake, that you know, original people, that the, you know, when people originally played Quake, you started to understand and learn was that when you lose a rocket launcher, it's very different to other guns. You've got the prediction element, but uh, you have that splash damage to work with as well. So you have to aim at the ground uh, that your opponent's you know, standing on. So that's, I remember, you know, way back when, when I was learning initially, that that in of itself was such a different dynamic. So if you're someone that's not uh, too used to that, it will definitely be quite quite difficult to get to grips with it immediately. That said, you know, Shaker said he's played uh, every edition of Quake, so he should be somewhat comfortable with that concept and idea. Sean is uh, very, very stacked at the moment, looking to just hold on to this lead very handily. Again, he's got that good positioning, falls back down onto the red armor. And again, you know, in uh, competitive uh, one versus one in Quake, it's all about, you know, running those items, having good positioning, winning the War of Attrition, or just winning the straight-up fight, which is what could happen here. Great lightning gun work again, you can see how much damage it's doing. Very hard to try to hit when the opponent is bouncing all over the place like that, but it was a good effort by Shaker there with the lightning gun. If he gets another couple engagements like that, it's going to look very, very good indeed for his chances to try to bring himself back into this one. But despite getting the follow-up of the spawn there, we can see Sean, he's going to spawn straight in the face of his opponent. That's some bad news here for Shaker. Able to get out of the situation though with good usage of the rockets locking Sean away from the choke points which otherwise would have allowed him entry to close down the frag but instead he was unable to do so thanks to those very nice rockets. Speaking of which, Sean is very low on the ammo. He did just pick up a five pack of rockets so he's got six now to work with but he doesn't have much in the way of lightning gun cells as well. So we could see a little bit of a turn here in the next engagements. Sean really needs those resources in so far as the ammunition is concerned. Here he goes looking to continue the pursuit there. That works out quite well for him. Not only picking up a nice a few forward rocket connections and the frag, he falls down, glides down almost effortlessly onto the red armor. Very graceful stuff there from Sean. I wonder if he planned that, because that's it kind of looked like he planned it. I don't I don't know if I want to give him that credit, but it looks very nice. Sean very smooth at the moment on the map. Just under two minutes left here for a comeback attempt to be made. And so far it is not looking too amazing for Shaker. We'll see if he can get himself into a position here to have a good engagement. But Sean is in a bunch of spots where he can deny that. If he just keeps, you know, keeps himself to the high ground, he can always have sort of an early warning system and uh, the way to back it off easily from the fights if he doesn't like the look of them. Speaking of which, we've got a pretty good fight for Sean here. Connects some good rockets there. He's definitely ahead in the health and armor situation. And that's going to cause his opponent to have to back away. Sean there catches a glimpse. Oh, and actually more than a glimpse, Shaker comes back in. And that's going to be the frag again for Sean. So six to one now. And I feel like we're really, you know, starting to weed out the uh, the men from the boys in this uh, Quakes tournament in the round of 16. Seeing some good stuff here out of Sean. Axe comes out for just a moment there from Shaker. The Axe, I believe, actually does like uh, either 25 or 50 damage. I don't remember which one it is. I'm assuming it's 25. But either way, it is not going to be sufficient, even if it was 50, to do a march to hit your opponent. 
It's quite fun hitting people with the axe in this game, though. It's, it's, it's kind of weird, to be honest, and the sound effects that it makes. But, and that's something that uh, it's, it's hard to uh, not feel nostalgic about immediately, is when you hear the sounds in this game. Looks like uh, Shaker able to get some redemption here. A couple of rockets will land successfully to give himself the fright, but again, we talked about that window of opportunity. When you win that fight and you're left weak, if your opponent spawns near you, you have a lot of issues. You've got to back away, you've got to restack, and there's just no time to do that there for Shaker. So it's going to be Sean here looking pretty handy with this uh, with DM6 with Quake World. 8 to 2 scoreline for him, and he will breeze through this round and straight on to the next one. Thank you both players for such a fantastic game. Let's get a warm round of applause. Thank you so much for playing. And Sean, please join me up here. We have to hear what you're thinking after that match. You, you said you weren't sure how you were going to perform, but that was a pretty compelling performance. How do you feel? Uh, I, f I feel good, but uh, my aim was pretty bad. Um, but, uh, you know, he played great, and uh, I, I know I need to step up my game to beat any of the other guys in the tournament. So. <laughs> what do you think you're going to do? Are you going to you know, spend any time practicing? Are you just going to meditate on it? What are you going to do to stay in the game? Usually the more I practice, the worse I play, so I think I'm just going to wait until the next match and see how it goes. I think your thing is kind of coming in unprepared and just tearing down the competition, right? Uh, it's worked well so far, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there's a good, there's a good wall in uh, several people here. Um, I'm sure Randy wants revenge after last year. Uh, he lost that game in the last 10 seconds, and uh, that was close, and I know that's going to be a tough one, but hopefully he gets through and we can get that rematch in. That will be fun for us to watch that rivalry. Thanks so much, Sean. Congratulations again. Let's get another warm round of applause, and you can go ahead and head backstage. Thank you, Sean. Dan, that's been an amazing round of matches. Any highlights for you that were really fun to watch? I think, I think Sean just you know, showed people that he's, he's once again here to play. And again, you know, he's, he says he's unprepared. But maybe he's just one of those like, really talented people that we all hate. You know? That's like they just stroll up. They, they got drunk the night before, like maybe got a couple hours of sleep, just turn up, you know, with all the shades on, and then they just destroy everybody and play perfectly and win the tournament. I, I think he's one of those types that I've come to hate over the years. <laughs> I think so, maybe too. But we will have more Quake, and we'll see the determining kind of next matches as we, we go and weed out some of these champions will be moving forward in the competition starting again at 3 p.m. We're going to take a brief break right now, but don't miss us when we come back at 3. But for now, we're going to bring Mike back on stage, so we'll see you in a little bit. Thank you all. Hi, everybody. Thanks. So I hope you guys got to catch some of that action. I felt really bad for the guy coming up against Sean Dunn because we knew it was going to be a bloodbath, and uh, they weren't kidding. So I hope you'll uh, continue to watch the, uh, the subsequent rounds as we go along and start heading into the uh, elimination matches tomorrow. But first, we want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the challenges of running an indie dev studio. It is hard enough to make a great game with a big studio and lots of resources. It's even unbelievably harder to do that when you're dealing with the challenges of a small team, limited dev resources. And yet, every year, there are a few studios that manage to overcome those obstacles and make really, really great games outside of the major studios. And we have a few folks who've been able to break through with that success and talk about some of their challenges and how they were able to overcome their obstacles. We have Simon Anderson, uh, the art director from D-Pad Studio, the creator of Owlboy. Sean Vanneman, CEO of Campo Santo, the creators of Firewatch. And uh, moderating will be Rami Ishmael from Vlambeer, who created both uh, Nuclear Throne and Ridiculous Fishing. We're really blessed to have such incredible um, uh, creators here to share their insights on their craft. So gentlemen, please come out. Rami, thank you. Oh, I'm in the middle. Okay. Um, this way. So hi there. Uh, we're all really glad to be here. And uh, like uh, just announced, we're going to be talking about how we make some of our games. Uh, I am Rami Ismail. I'm one half of a Dutch independent studio named Vlambeer. Uh, we're the creators of Nuclear Throne. Uh, I'm Sean Vanneman. Um, I'm the co-founder of Campo Santo and the writer of Firewatch, which came out a year ago. And I'm Simon Stavsen Sandersen. I am the art director and sort of CEO and pixel artist of d Studio. We made a game project for about nine years called Owlboy. Nine years. Nine years. <laughs> yeah. That is incredible. 
incredible. You, that is incredible. You started work on that one before I joined the industry, I think. That is terrifying to think about. That really is, is absolutely incredible. <laughs> um, the world, I mean, you, uh, so we're talking about world building. Um, like, do you remember nine years ago when you said, I want to make a world <laughs> that is like, that is the world of Owlboy? Or, like, how did that even come to be? Well, it was, um, I think I was going to school at the time, and we were, uh, we were getting, like, general 3D projects. But at that time, the Wii had just been announced, and everyone was like, yeah, it's going to be the new revolution, and 3D games are going to be great. And I had just taught myself how to do pixel art, and I was really sad because everyone's saying pixel art was dying and all that. Oh, yeah, I remember that. So uh, I, I got this brilliant idea in my head that I, thought, oh, I was going to make this, this project that was going to revitalize the uh, idea of pixel art and show how good it was and all of that. And um, of course, I couldn't do that at the time. I just went straight into advertising, uh, which, spoiler, I didn't enjoy all that much. <laughs> so uh, roughly a year of that, and then I finally decided that uh, this little group that I met online, we were making a, a different project. We just said, OK, we're, we're going to do this full time. I'm going to go in for freelancing, going to do art on the side, and then I'm going to work on this project. Yeah. I mean, uh, Nuclear Throne, Flambeer, my studio, very similarly started back in school uh, with the two of us actually dropping out, uh, me and my co-founder. And we've been sort of making strange games ever since, like weird arcade action games. You, you have a different background. Yes. I was at Telltale and worked on The Walking Dead and decided it was time to try to like hang my own shingle and just then had to come up with an idea. <laughs> like literally sat down and said, well, we have to make a game. And it needs to come out in about 28 months because that's when things are going to get really dark financially. Mm -hmm. And uh, Firewatch came out of like my bedroom, basically. Yeah, and we're nine. You said you did yours with five people? Five people, yeah. Five people over nine years. Five people over. That's yeah, I, like, think, I think it's roughly the, the same number throughout all of the years. Yeah, yeah, it was five amazing. people. And you guys are two. We are two with a number of freelancers. Uh, the total team on Nuclear Throne was five. Uh, plus an, uh, a marketing artist. It was, it's interesting because Nuclear Throne is uh, such a um, compact game at its heart. So it's a, it's a top-down roguelike. It's an action game. It's a, it's a shooter. It doesn't really have world building in the traditional sense of, of the world. It's more of a, a war building, really. It's creating the, the universe behind it. But it allowed us to move with a really small team with just two people and create the procedural generation and the basic content and then build the world around that as we went. Yeah, you guys are actually, I always find myself jealous of two, like even smaller studios because, and especially with your background, the way you guys started, because you guys just never really worked for anyone else. Yeah. But like, we, when we started at Campo Santo, um, we had been on a team, Jake and I had been on a team, or a Telltale that was, you know, 75, 80 at its peak. So when we thought we sat down and think like what's a video game and what can we, how can we what can we make with less than ten people, are like just that part of my brain didn't work. The part of my brain that said how okay well we're gonna need like seven animators, <laughs> you know we had one, you know and um, Firewatch is a first person like world exploration game set in the woods of Wyoming. Um, it doesn't look like nine or ten people made it, um, but. Uh, yeah, I always, it's like, our ambitions are like, still, we still think we're like a, we're like a, like, we're like a, this is a basketball reference, like Isaiah Thomas, who thinks he's like seven feet tall yeah. and scores 35 points a game. Mm. We still think we're like a 70 person team and we have ideas like that and then it's figuring out like processes and methodologies to like accomplish it at all. Because it sounds like your team stayed pretty much stable, like Owlboy came out recently? Yeah, it actually came out in November last year. And it is a, it's a two-day action platformer, would that be the yeah. best way of describing it? Yeah, you can, it's, it's basically a 2D dungeon explorer, but you have the ability to fly in addition to just walking on the ground. Did, did that world, when you started in this game, did it, like, was there, 
did you have all of that figured out? Did you have the sort of the process figured out? You were learning as you go. I well, assume. that is the, the strange thing because at the time we'd never made a commercial project. So we just kind of messed around with, with small kinds of things. And then um, that was also our approach when we started. It was just find as many good ideas as you could and then start figuring out what that is. Um, so what we ended up doing was um, we, we had this base of a game just kind of shangle somewhere. And then I'd drawn all these assets that we had for the backgrounds and everything. And I started looking around the background going, what does that mean? What is that symbol that's in there? Uh, why are there a bunch of owls flying around? How does this make any sense? Um, and that's how we built our lore. I don't think we actually figured out our story until maybe the last two years of development. So it's, it's like a retroactive fitting into yeah, actually, the, the way I've compared it on, in other spaces is um, it's interpreting your own abstract work. And I've actually recommended this to a lot of people when they make um, like programmer art and that sort of thing. You can even do that with small boxes. Like, say, you have one box that goes into another box. You can actually, this sounds silly, but you can actually sit there and, and say to yourself, what is the motivation of this box going into the other one? And just the process of doing that will give you some sort of uh, story that you can base the rest of your game on. Yeah, we, we started with a... The problem was that we couldn't figure out how to make the, how to stop the player from running to the exit straight away. Oh. Right? So we had this triangle guy who was like the god of guns, and he was supposed to kill everything in the room and then go to the next level, but we couldn't figure out how to do that. So we just kind of dropped it. And then five years later, we figured out that if you just can't go to the next room until you kill all the enemies and there is no exit, the exit appears where you kill the last enemy, then we solved that problem, and then we picked up the project again. Hmm. But the first thing that was made for this new version of the game was actually, uh, in many ways, was a song. And we asked our musician, to, to Yuki Okalio, uh, we asked him to make a song that would fit like sort of a, a post-apocalyptic sci-fi world, but not one of those dystopian ones. It's just like all humans are dead, right? Like it's just gone, it's over, there's nobody going to space to save us, like it's over. And we asked him to do that, and we kind of expected like sort of like a techno-ish sci-fi thing, and instead he came with a Western song. So we drew our characters at a campfire, and that sort of started our world, yeah. right? Like just these characters sitting around a campfire with this one song behind it. And I think that's like the, the biggest advantage of being a small team in trying to like compete with everything that comes out every year, is that like you can just make a decision you have one thing and you go. You're not like, you didn't focus test that. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I think like, that's something that we found was like, an, like a ridiculous competitive advantage for trying to make a big, like how do you create a big world um, when you know like down the street is 300 people making the next, you know, this is gonna, a game is gonna blow the doors off in terms of the world that they build. But we can just make decisions and go. Like, what, what I find interesting about, about Firewatch is I think a lot of the world in Firewatch is our world is this world, sure. the, the, but the, the world of the game is between characters. Yeah, I mean, the, the theme of the game is like, um, two characters are talking the entire time. That's like the core mechanic of the game. Um, but it takes place, and this is actually a decision that we made that I think, um, again, you're always looking for things that give you like really high yield in terms of like creative output, in terms of like the weight and tone of the game. So I knew, from the beginning, it's like, okay, we only have this long time, to, time and money to make the game. I'm from Wyoming. I'm gonna set it in the woods of Wyoming, which is a place that I know really well, in an era that I find interesting. And then, gosh, like, other than like, our art director, Ali Moss, did all of, like, the 2D concepts for the game, but when it came down to like, what does a walkie-talkie look like? What does a baseball look like in this world? We just had the art style and we had like, the world that which we occupy to drive it. So we didn't have to sit around thinking about how do we make this world from scratch? How do we bend and crimp the armature of this amazing fantasy space? 
It was like, no, we can just go because it's real. But is there an appeal to doing something, to you personally, uh, of doing something in the real world? Because a, a lot of the arguments that you get when you make you know, fantasy stuff is that you have like, a completely clean slate. Of course, you draw inspiration from things in the real world, but um, usually you can just kind of make up something if it doesn't fit. So is there something appealing to you about? Oh, yeah. It's like a huge, it's just, I mean, it's just being able to start with a palette, you know, I mean, our hope is to be able to make, you know, we have like a number of games we'd like to make as a studio, and being able to just like say, okay, this game takes place in this location on Earth at this time means that we kind of just, I get a go. I can start writing really early. I don't know how you do it. Like, I'm literally <laughs> just in awe of Owlboy. I started playing the game, and it opens kind of similarly to like, like a, a Zelda game or something. You're just like a regular owl boy, and an owl like, and everything had to be invented. You had to make it all from scratch. <laughs> like I was like, why does he? Why are the buildings looking like this? Why is the city like this? I mean, I don't have to think about that. I'm like, this is what the woods looks like. You know, like our next game, if we have a, if we have a level in a city, I'm like, I'll start at Wikipedia, <laughs> and then you know, like Claire, who's our now our art director, and I will like, she'll start drawing, and we'll go back and forth, but. The, yeah, I think there's a. Um, I actually hear this from a lot of people that some people just don't enjoy just dragging something out of out of thin air, sort of. And sometimes that's a that's a skill you have to acquire. Um, though, uh, for me, it's I'm always in the pursuit of having something that feels like its own thing. Sure. I, I used to make this example, but now they've done the remake. But I used to call it the the Ghostbusters principle where uh, when you watch that movie, it is that movie. You're not comparing it to all, all the, these other movies. It's just, right. It feels like its own thing. And um, uh, I just apply that to basically every facet of the game that I can. So when it's like you have a character that flies, okay, what have I not seen before? Well, I haven't seen a guy that looks partially like an owl that has a cloak that turns into wings. I haven't seen that before. Um, what else haven't I seen? Well, I haven't seen him carry around a giant robot pirate before. So it's, it's that sort of thing where <laughs> you, you kind of just go for interesting elements and then uh, the rest of that can be like interpretive shape language. Like, is he like a giant pear? Yes, I'll draw that. It's, it's funny because Nuclear Throne is basically entirely based on, on existing fictional stuff. Right? The, the world of Nuclear Throne is this a uh, post-apocalyptic world in which humanity has gone completely extinct and now these mutants sort of rule, rule the planet and it's full of dangers and radioactive toxics. Uh, so one, like one of our main char characters is a fish that can roll and he has a guitar and he plays sad songs at a campfire. One of them is a crystal and one of them is a, a, some person whose entire skin is continuously melting, like that guy in Indiana Jones. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. When he opens the ark and... Oh, like if you drank from the wrong grail cup or something? Kind of that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah just they that's melt. Horrific. And that's just <laughs> continuously that. their existence. That's yeah. the character you want to play. So when you but get... Like, like, all of that comes from uh, bad sci-fi books, really. Like, we had such a lore to draw on and to sort of, like, reuse and re rebend as you use the word, in, into a universe, so. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, all work is based on, on previous work. That's, that's just something you kind of have to admit to yourself. Um, it's the, the challenge is to make it feel like you're not just dragging something straight out of a page. And I feel like that we all sort of have that same approach, it's just that in, in different ways. It's funny because I, I literally, we literally grabbed the guy from Indiana Jones and just kind of put him in our game. He didn't like, have we a didn't hat, Right, but I mean, he comes through like a, he, he goes through like the, the Vlambeer machine. The, yeah, the you art know, style. And I think that's something that I think, like if you look at all three games, and this is something that I think if you're a small team trying to figure out, or even if you're a big team and you're just trying to like be more efficient, something that like we have, a, that we do very, very concretely is, and I think all three of us probably do it, is you're thinking about the game as a product from the consumer perspective the whole time. So when we did it, when we like launched our first website for the game, 
it was, in, it was like we were inventing the look of a product that we wanted to make. Sort of like the first time I saw, actually, you know, the first time I saw screenshots of The Witness, I was like, God damn it, I was so mad. I was so <laughs> mad. I was like, I want to make that game. That's the game I want to make. I want to make that game. So we will generate work as fast as possible that's like aspirational for ourselves, whether it's like a trailer or like literally 30 seconds of the game where you're like, that's what it feels like. And we don't like, we don't try to be, we don't like hand ring over every decision. We're totally designing with like tone and with our guts. And when we have it, we like put it on screen. And sometimes we like, with Firewatch, we just showed everyone. We just made a trailer for a game that we wanted to make and went, oh God, now we have to do that. But it, in terms of communicating creative direction, it's like incredibly efficient because yep. you know where you're, you have this, this product target. And I think like all three games seem like games that like when I look at them um, from afar, it seems like they've always existed or something. Well, for like, Nuclear Throne, you're... that's actually true. Like Nuclear Throne originally was created as a prototype in two days. It was a game jam. And it, that game is still the exact game, just more polished, more content. But we developed it openly, so we live streamed our development every Tuesday, every Thursday. People could literally watch us make the game for like six hours. And then every Saturday, Sunday, we would release what we made that week and then see how the community responded and then do a new live stream that showed how we were making Nuclear Throne and ask for the community to explain to us what they liked, what they didn't like, what they uh, were excited about. But the one thing that wasn't too affected by that is actually the world. The lore was very much a, a product very early on in our game uh, that was this 20-page this document of just how the, there's like a timeline that spans 2,000 years of history in our Dropbox folder, and it's entirely, there's no way from the game to know that. It was just an internal tool sure, yeah, for us to create this world. Um, but it was fascinating that we basically worked on a game that was already out for two years. Yeah, that's years. interesting, yeah. The, the strange thing is that when, when we did our uh, first initial thing, so. Initially, when we um, sort of announced Owlboy, uh, we came out with a demo, and we were really prepared that that was the year we were going to release. That was in? Uh, when was that? I think that was maybe five, six years ago. Okay. So quite some time. We were, I mean, we were complete amateurs. I, I'll fully admit that. Um, Amazing, though. Oh. But the, uh, the thing was that because we came out with that demo, on one hand, it set an expectation. A lot of people were saying, uh, wow, this looks fantastic. That means it has to have this and this and this in it. Which, of course, since we didn't know any better, we felt, okay, then we need to have this and this and this in it. Uh, which we actually made, and then realized it was really boring, so we took that out. Um, and the other thing was, uh, we, uh, as we were expanding the game, uh, we realized kind of what the game was supposed to be for ourselves. Um, it feels strange to say this kind of on stage, but outside influence hasn't had that much to say on what actually goes into the game for us. We figure that sort of out ourselves, like this is what it has to be, and then uh, let's present that in the best possible way for others to find out. So a lot of our game development has been um, making ways for people to interpret what our, uh, what our actual official sort of story is. So. Um, it, it's all about leaving clues for that. And of course, our community has been very good at that, but because we never really give straight answers to direct questions, uh, people sort of keep generating their own ideas for what that could be. Now, there's, there's a lot of stuff that they have found out that we haven't told them, and then there's a lot of things that I have very much overlooked, um, which I'm just sitting there waiting, like, just read the thing. And then, yeah. I think that's the smart, I mean, that, again, like, it's the best way to build a world are those, like, lingering things, because, like, you could spend another nine years making Owlboy, and your, like, your ability to create is dwarfed by any one player's imagination space. Yeah. They look at a, a you, you give them a gap, and then they fill it with infinite possibility, and, like, that's something that we totally lean on really heavily at Campo, 
where like Firewatch has got so many loose ends and false starts and left turns and red herrings in the story and in the world that um, it just makes it just sparks your imagination when you're playing it, and we like trade on that constantly. And I think like that's something that like a lot of games actually don't do. Like I think a lot of games world building like when people are doing traditional AAA world building, they're like answering all the questions and they're 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 building in every every detail and not leaving. Um, Supplying more. Yeah. It's interesting because we, we actually had that backfire on us once with, a, oh, with really? an earlier game called Lufthrausers, which was this dogfighting game that was drawing very strongly from declassified files from like the Cold War and the Second World War of these fears that the Allied forces had of like Soviet and, and German super weapons. Mm -hmm. We thought it would be really cool if you controlled those super weapons. So we basically made a game in which you are a, a fighter pilot on the side of not the Allies. Hmm. fighting in super weapons. And then a lot of people, since there is iconography that is sort of Nazi-inspired... I totally sort of forgot that you made it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I remember. There was a, <laughs> there's a guy I know that was working on a concept similar to yours, and then you came up with that, and he was Oops. like, shit. Uh, but, but since that iconography was there, uh, a lot of people interpreted that as you are playing a Nazi in the game. Right. So um, we, we just hadn't considered that between the two lines, that we wrote, there was the space to interpret it that way. You just drew all the like negative space of a swastika. <laughs> and then that's what a lot of people, a lot of people read it that way, and it was it was for us it was uh, it was a warning that if we were going to leave space empty, to at least consider what you could fill into sure. that space. So for Nuclear Throne, we actually um, we actually at points in the game looked at things and went like, okay, this could have there is a possible interpretation here that is very much not what we want, so we would close it off in some way. Sometimes even by just adding a loading tip to the game. You know, while the game is loading, it'll have like a little message and just basically say, that's, that's not true. But you could in have had one of the browsers that said, you are not a Nazi. Uh, I, honestly, if we would have started the game with like <laughs> 1963, which was in an early prototype, uh -huh. we would have, nobody would have had that interpretation. But yeah. interesting. we just thought, well, we'll leave it open so that everybody can interpret. But there's a, uh, we, we sort of had a similar situation that is, technically ongoing, um, that we ended up with, with kind of a, a strange um, opposite of what we wanted. So uh, Owlboy is a game about very certain topics that we wanted to cover, and we wanted people to sort of experience that and see how they felt about it. Um, but one thing that we actually did kind of deliberately was that we didn't really have any sort of romantic relationships in the game. That was a deliberate choice. Even my, my designs for, for female characters and all that, I didn't really uh, give them any signifiers and all of that stuff because it wasn't really interesting in terms of the story. Now, if you look at all the fan art and the stuff that people have written about the game, that's literally all it is. Like relationships and what people are, are talking about amongst themselves and that sort of thing. And uh, I realize it sounds like I'm very negative about that, but that's actually kind of incredible, is that something that we absolutely didn't intend for and didn't even plan for is what came out of this entire process and what people felt was important after this. And it's something that we couldn't have prepared for in, uh, when we started. It's, um, it's interesting. It sounds like in, in all of these stories, in all of these worlds, in all of these games, a lot of the decisions that ended up being made were made either very early or as a response to very early decisions, would you say? Yeah, I mean, the, we used to have this like, like ongoing joke from the day we started the studio, um, December of 2013, that was like, days since a like catastrophic F up, where it's like, okay, we haven't made the decision that will sink us in the future, <laughs> yet we don't think. <laughs> that ended up being true-ish, like obviously we're still around, but um, yeah, yeah, That's... I think, I mean, I don't remember not having the name Firewatch. Like, I don't remember, I found a document where like Henry and Delilah are the main characters, had different names, and it was like very distressing for me. Yeah. It was like, yeah, it was like finding out like one of your parents has a secret girlfriend or boyfriend or something. You're like, oh my God, like this, everything I know is wrong. It was really distressing. But um, yeah, I mean, when you're small, or a small studio, you can't sit, like, actually, here's, this is, I guess, an anecdote. Oh, we're working on a new game, 
and uh, we have this art director, Claire Hummel, who's amazing, really, really incredible. And uh, we're working on the main character, and just sort of like telling her stories about the main character, what her background is, we're kind of like talking about like, act, like actors, like comps for who the main character could be. And she draws this woman, and I was like, yeah, that, you got it, that's it, we're done. And like, it was the first, and she's like, she had worked at Microsoft, and <laughs> she was just like, what do you mean? I'm like, we're good, we nailed it. Uh, that's it. That's it, mm. let's move on. Like we have, we're burning, <laughs> burning daylight, let's go. And she was like, I think I should do more. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 it's good. We play with live ammo here, we're fine. That'll be the main character, she'll be on the poster. <laughs> you know, and she's like, ah, like crippled. But like, man, the, be, the ability to be able to do that yeah. is just like a staggering like, like um, benefit to being small. It's amazing, it's so efficient. It's really funny because I know that Nuclear Throne didn't start as Nuclear Throne. Nuclear Throne originally started as Wasteland Kings. Uh, and it was a game about these mutants in this waste. Oh, it's called what? Wasteland? Wasteland Kings. Wasteland Kings. Wasteland Kings. It was this game about these mutants in the wasteland that wanted to rule the wasteland, mm -hmm. right? And that was the narrative that we were working from. And uh, then we got an email from Brian Fargo. <laughs> I bet he was really excited that you called your game Wasteland. He something. wasn't, because he was kickstarting Wasteland 2 at that time. Right. So he sent us an email with, listen, can you, can you please change that? And I was like, I don't know who the hell this is. <laughs> So I, I looked at, I, I was like, what, who does he think he is that he can tell us to change the name of our game? So I Googled Wasteland because I never played that when I was a kid. It was made in the same year I was born. So I was like, okay, you know what? You, 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 you got this. You we'll, write that in his email we'll, back, did you? We will, we, will, we will change the name, no problem. So uh, we started looking for a name and after like three months we came up with Nuclear Throne. Yeah. But actually the Nuclear Throne, since it was now the title, we had to put something in the game that explained what a nuclear throne was. So actually our story just entirely flipped at that point. That's we went from uh, Wasteland Kings to Nuclear Throne, but that also turned the final boss of the game into a nuclear throne. And then we rewrote a large part of our lore based oh, on that. I actually thought that was the plan all along. Nope. You got me fooled. <laughs> yeah. But like you, you probably ran into to weird issues with time as well, because you say you released your your, your sort of like trader, your gold trader back in 2011. Mm -hmm. Like by the time the game was done, people were thinking of that trader through nostalgia classes. Yeah. How do you deal with that? In what sense? Every sense. Like <laughs> that sounds terrifying to me to have people already romanticize. Like normally when people see a world, a game for the first time, they dream about all the possibilities of the game. Yeah. And now they're dreaming about their dreams about all the possibilities of their game. Like. Yeah, it is very strange to hold lectures at schools where they say like, oh yeah, I saw your game when I was still in diapers. It's, it's a very strange thing. Um, um. <laughs> so do you guys have to battle, I mean, we had to do that with Firewatch, because Firewatch is like, there's not a lot of games like it. You have to like, the first trailer was very like evocative, it was just tone. Mm. And then everyone in the world starts like creating their idea of what the game is. So did you have to like walk that, that did you, at any point before you release the final version of the game, like go, okay, we're gonna do a let's play, we're gonna do something that says this is exactly what's in here and what's not, or did you just say, be free? Well, it was, um, it, it's difficult to pinpoint just one idea because everyone in our team comes up with different inputs, but uh, sort of the, the pitch that I came up with at least was that we tried to show as little as possible that was definitive. Um, we needed to define, you know, the core mechanics of it. Like, uh, you fly, you carry people, and you explore dungeons. That's, that's the stuff that everyone can kind of understand. But exactly how that works and all that, it was, um, it, it was a very difficult time when we came to uh, the point where we had to do, like, the press demo and all that, because it was the, the whole start of the game, which was what we were trying to keep secret for a while. Now, for those of you that haven't played the game before, the game starts out, surprisingly dark when a lot of people just think it's a, like a very upbeat kids game. So it starts with a, a very intense nightmare and I've actually had a lot of kids that got scared because of that. Oh no. Um, good thing we didn't do focus testing. Uh, <laughs> so uh, because of that, it was like we were, we were showing this game uh, and I felt like, oh, we're, we're spoiling everything. We, we, can't, we can't show this. But, some things had to be sacrificed for the greater parts later on. Um, it, it's sort of, I feel like the people's minds are better than whatever we can show them. So if we sure. were, 
if we ended up at a point where we were like, okay, these are all the things that are in the game for you to buy it, then we haven't done our job right. It's interesting because we have none of those problems, right? Like Nuclear Throne was playable. Right. People could see us make the game. For us, the biggest, um, the biggest uh, problem that we run into was actually with the world building, where people were curious about the world and curious about whether we were going to put in more world, whether we were going to put in more story, more characters, more uh, bosses, places to go. And so it was a lot of content, which for a while was very good for us because we could just create stuff. We could just go and say, like, well, we need an underwater world. Let's make an underwater world. And then you know, three weeks later, there was an underwater world. But when it came to like, the larger structure of this world and how it worked, it was actually quite often a fight with the community. And um, very often, they would like, decompile the executable and find things that we were already working on. Oh. Right? So at some point, we started just putting fake stuff in there. We just created a fake character in this put it in there, and then there would be three months of, of speculation about the character, and then you go oh, like, we should eh, have done that. just remove the sprite again. Right. Um, That's so different than how we worked. I mean... You worked it completely off. Yeah, man, yeah. We put out a trailer for Firewatch at PAX 2014 that was like the promise to ourselves of what we are making. And then at E3 2015, we had our like in-engine gameplay, like real trailer-ish. Um, in the Sony presser at E3. And then from that day forward, I guess probably, you know, GDC era 2015, we like, I stood in front of a whiteboard and said, nobody knows what this game is. We've only like promised like something beautiful and tonal. Like we had like, it's not gone home. And then we had, it's not a survival sim. Like we have to communicate these two things somehow. Yeah. Did you and then start if you a trailer do it with... that way, you actually have a problem to solve now. As opposed to like, how do we communicate about our game? Like, that's too big of a problem. Like, it's, it's impossible. But when you go, we need to communicate that it's not this and it's not this. Like, we were able to like, sit down and have actionable items. We were able to creative direct the next trailer. We were able to like, know when we were going to get people hands-on with the game. And when they did have hands-on, what it was going to be, uh, it drove like, all of our press outreach stuff, like what we were gonna do when we sat down with IGN, what we were gonna do when we went to Giant Bomb and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, never did we have to do anything like what you're talking about, because ours is so secret. It, it sounds like a lot of, I don't know if this is true for you too, but for us, a lot of the world building was intentionally kind of marketing, because we just don't, we don't have the resources. Of course, it has to be. That, like we, this, was, this world had to be interesting enough to sh show yeah. and sell itself, because if not, then we're kind of screwed. Yep. But what's interesting is that we, we ran into some of those same issues um, with other games where the, the fact that the world sells itself also backfires. It means that most of your marketing is communicating what, your what the player's imagination is that this could be that it isn't. Mm -hmm. So you get this weird this boomerang almost of like, yeah. this will sell for us, this will do the marketing for us if, we just, if we're just clever about it. They end up having to counter market your marketing. Yeah, the, the strange thing about, about Owlboy, I kind of mentioned that earlier, but uh, it was that it didn't really start out as a story game. So we made a ton of stuff that, that eventually we ended up cutting because it just wasn't interesting. Um, so it became a lot more story driven as we went along. Um, but then, when we started to, to show off the game and do the marketing and all that, um, we did that a lot through streaming because it just ended up being convenient that way. But the problem with that is that streaming isn't necessarily very friendly to story-driven stuff. Now, of course, it depends on what kind of game you have, but in Albus Boy's case, it was, it, it was difficult to balance that. So we actually had to go in and do a lot of changes just to make sure that the gameplay was interesting enough to get to a certain point in it. Um, we sort of had this, uh, this joke at the office that if we can get them through the first two dungeons, then they will finish the game. That was the idea. Um, so, uh, Did that end up being true? That ended up being true. Nice. We, we managed to, uh, to just do slight adjustments every time. I don't even think anyone noticed. So every time someone would, would play the game, we would either foreshorten a sentence here and there, we would make something a little easier or something a little harder just to make sure they kept people's interest. Um, but it's a, it's a very different form of um, 
gameplay than, than we had anticipated. Not to mention that because it ended up being so story heavy, um, we hadn't really planned for what was going to happen with all the assets once people started digging into the code. So you had people that would go into like really hardcore story stuff. Um, they would go into the code and find characters that we just cut out because we didn't need them. And then speculate how that fit oh, yeah. into the world. So, yeah, we, we ran into that one as well. Uh, but then we put those fake characters in on purpose. So that was kind of fun. It, if there's, if there's for, for Nuclear Throne, one of the weird things is now that we've made so many games based on lore, one of the things we really want to do is, is make a game based on more narrative, a bit more you know, explicit world in there. Mm -hmm. um, we have no idea how to do that. Like, is there easy. anything? Oh, it's easy? Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. What, just, what? just write it and you'll be fine. Just, just put all just the words in order and it'll Is there, it'll is there anything you would, you, you would be able to give me as like a... Like, a don't do this, we did that, don't do it, or... Yeah, don't make a Unity game with 10 million trees in it in oh. 2015. <laughs> don't do that. Not then try to put it on console. <laughs> don't do that. Computers um. hate trees. Um, no, I mean, I think, like, the... I mean, you do... I mean, I think the thing that you do now, you just apply it to, like, a different piece of entertainment, which is, like, you said it yourself, like, this level has to be good enough to, like, market the game. And like, I think the, the smart thing about world building in running a small studio is that in marketing your game is they're just like all the same thing. So as you're building the world, you're building something that like you know people you want that you want to show people that you want to show people in the trailer. You want to show people as soon as you like on Twitch as soon as you can. And then I mean, in, I think from a narrative perspective, it's the same thing. Like. What do I want players to have happen? And like, what do I want to happen to these characters? And then because it's a game, you get to say, well, maybe it's these five things and only one of them happens per player or something. Or maybe it's these 50 things or whatever. And I think, um, like, we think of all that stuff as the same thing. Like, world building, storytelling, and marketing are just like, our job is to be, a, we're an entertainment company. We just want to, like, if we have your eyes for five seconds, we want you to go, oh man, and be surprised and delighted or whatever. And I think you just do that, you know. I think the, the best advice that I, I read somewhere is just write the beginning and the end of your game. Do that. I didn't do that on Firewatch. It's the first time I'd ever done it. So I wrote the beginning and end of Walking Dead. Fine. Wrote the beginning of Firewatch and eh, not fine. <laughs> <laughs> game two, I already have the beginning and end. Yes. Yeah, if you, if you have that idea in place, then everything else can kind of be, be filled in. And eventually, by the time you're done with the game, your ending will be different. It ended up with us, too. I mean, we had a very clear idea what our ending was going to be, but it ended up changing because of the stuff we put in the middle. But because we had that beginning, uh, beginning and end, uh, we could kind of just mishmash everything that was in there, and it influenced everything. For nine years. Yes. Nice. Unfortunately. Nine Tom, years. Simon, thanks so much. Thank yeah, guys. Thanks so much. That's, uh, that's our time. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. All right, guys, we're going to have a break that's going to involve some multitasking choices for you. Um, the face of tournament will continue with the last uh, bracket uh, for today. Uh, that includes a grudge match from Kate Edwards of the IGDA and a Randy Pitchford from Gearbox who battled last year. Randy came out ahead, but I hear Kate's been practicing. Um, also in the Dice Arcade, we have the speaker and attendee networking event, so if you wanted to ask a question to one of the speakers, that's an opportunity for that. At 3.45, um, after we conclude the, the tournament here, we're going to go on to the round tables. So the round tables will take place in the Banyan Room, which is across the hallway from the arcade. And don't forget two more things tonight. We have the, uh, the opening party hosted by Streamline Studios. And again, I'm going to remind you more than once, but tomorrow morning we start early at 9 a.m. Uh, don't miss it. So I will uh, let the tournament begin and uh, see uh, some of the rest of you at the ISM uh, speaker networking event. Thank you. Welcome back. We're here with more of our Quake World Tournament from Face It here at DICE 2017. I'm Anna Prosser Robinson, if you haven't met me before. And this is my co-host, Dan Capadia. And I like that the chairs are still here. 
Well, shall we have a seat? That? Yes, let's do Should that. Should we chill for a second? Yeah, because it's about to get pretty intense. So it I is. I think this works. We need to relax, compose ourselves, get ready. Competition already has been fantastic, especially compared to last year. Last year was the first time we did a tournament like this. We had gaming VIPs here to face off in Quake. Now this year, same thing, but I think everyone kind of knows what to expect. I think we've had a little more practice this year. I think people are coming a little bit more prepared, and we had some awesome matches earlier today. Yeah, people, I think, are starting to take it a little bit seriously, which is great. We love that. We really love that. I mean, we had um, a Nick from Face It who has been under the tutelage of Sturmy in a professional game room, Quake. I mean, we, we've had so many coaches helping people out. You know, we'll see Randy Pitchford in the match that follows this one, who had coaching last year from Fatality. I don't know if he's still getting coached by Fatality. I can only imagine that surely he is. He seems like a pretty serious, serious guy when it comes to competition. So, yes, it's looking uh, really good. I think as we get quite deep into this tournament, I think it's going to be actually quite exciting. I mean, this tournament is in most ways just for fun, but I'm already hearing words like alliance and rivalry and grudge match. I mean, we're seeing some rematches coming right up. So actually, let's take a look at our bracket and check out who's going to be playing who as we go into this next section. We already have a few advancing. We had Min Kim, Tim Willits, Niccolo Maisto, and Jeffrey Kaplan moving forward out of that lower bracket you see there. And now moving up to the top, we're going to see a lot of awesome matches. We already saw Sean Dunn also and shake our face off. Sean Dunn being our returning champion, so he's going to be moving forward in the bracket. We'll see how far he gets. And now our next match is going to be Fergus Urquhart versus Patrick Hudson. Do you know anything about this match? Any expectations? I think uh, you know, Fergus and Patrick kind of middle of the pack last time, so we'll see if they've been putting in any additional practice. Again, like the, the players had you know, all the opportunity to get some practice in. We told, we told them the maps. Actually, uh, I believe we're going to be switching up one of the maps as well. We're going to be going into... We played Quake 3's DM6, but Quake 1 also has its own DM6 as well, so I think we might be going to that, so we'll see in a moment. But I do believe that uh, this could be a pretty close one, actually. We've seen, we've seen some, you know, one-sided-ish kind of matches so far, which does make our, you know, our, our follow-up matches very interesting indeed. We've got a lot of good ones, but I think this one will be pretty close. That's my prediction, but it, my predictions have sucked so far, so, <laughs> so you shouldn't really ask me. Well, let's go ask the players themselves. Let's get some insight from these guys before they go into the match. I'm going to trot over and talk to Fergus over here. Fergus, do you mind standing up with me over here? Stand here and get a little bit of an interview from you. I know you're getting ready for your match, but you've done this before. Yes. Do you feel prepared now with your knowledge of what it was like last time? Uh, prepared to get killed again? Yes, I think so. I, I think I'm prepared for that. How was your performance last time? Uh, I did okay the first time, which I thought was fairly random because it had been a long time since I played Quake. Uh, but the second match, I was pretty prepared to what was going to happen, and that's what happened. <laughs> What's your relationship like with Quake? Is it nostalgic for you? Have you played it much recently? Well, so, I mean, I'm, you know, a pretty old gamer. So, so Quake and, you know, Doom, starting with Doom, uh, and then Quake was, you know, I played a ton of when I was, all the way back when I was in QA in the early 90s, and then as Quake 2 and Quake 3 came out. So I played a lot then. Um, lately, I, you know, I'm a role-playing guy, so I play mostly role-playing stuff. So I still get in in Call of Duty and other stuff like that. So, uh, but Quake is a little bit different than what I play a lot now. Speaking of what you do now, who are you here representing, organization-wise, or anyone that's rooting you on? Oh, gotcha. Well, uh, organization-wise, um, uh, for me, it's Obsidian. That's I, I run Obsidian, and so uh, hopefully they won't be too. Uh, think what I've done is too horrible. <laughs> well, best of luck. We'll let you get situated in the game. Thank you, Fergus and Dan. Over to you. All right. So Patrick, you know, we saw you here last year. Um, we had a Quake tournament. I mean, that's that's kind of a, a cool thing coming back. The game is so old. I mean. Has that kind of revitalized that spark, that competitive spark for you? Have you been practicing hard for this? I've uh, not put as much training into this as I probably should have, so results should be pretty similar to last year, which were less than stellar. I mean, that's, I think you're selling yourself a bit short, but I don't trust you there because we're getting a lot of this, this you know, humble business, and I'm not necessarily a fan of that. But you know, we'll see how, how it pans out for you. But uh, as far as your opponent goes, you know, Fergus, I think you know, he was kind of middle of the pack as well, so I think your chances are pretty good. How does, how does this uh, match up? Do you think it will fare initially? I think it should be a competitive match. Um, if, if Fergus is belittling himself as much as I am, then, uh, then we should be equally uh, on solid footing here. All right, so are you ready to go? Are you all set up? All right, so looks like we're ready over here, Anna. We can kick this one off soon. Yeah, let's do it. Dan, uh, I think, like you said, this is going to be an interesting match. We have a lot of experience on both sides. Now, let's make sure that our players are ready. Fergus, are you ready to get into the game? Awesome. Can we have confirmation over here as well? Com ready to get in? Okay, awesome. Let's get right into the game. Dan will be commentating. Take us away. All right, so again, back into my commentary dungeon behind stage. 
as uh, we I take you through this one. We are going to be still on Quake 3 DM6 as we are still in the first round of play, the round of 16. So, got Fergus on camera at the moment. All eyes on Fergus. Let's see how he does. Now, I've got to say, actually, uh, I'm very familiar with a lot of the RPGs that he's had, had a hand in creating, but I'm not so sure about his, uh, his prowess with a rocket launcher in hand. We'll have a, have a look soon. We've got Patrick on screen now. We can see that he's actually uh, fairly close to Fergus's position. In fact, I think for just a, just a glimpse there of Fergus, but Fergus will fire off some rockets, but Patrick still uh, doesn't seem to be too aware exactly of where Fergus is shooting those rockets from. And that is some really good information from Fergus at the moment, because again, there's no running sounds. And because there's no running sounds, it makes it quite difficult to discern where your opponent actually is as you don't have that constant reminder, that pitter-patter, giving you that uh, positional awareness. But it looks like that will not be required here because we've got the fight over the jump pad. Fergus goes in, very nice. Wow, two good rockets coming in from Patrick there. Despite not looking uh, too prepared for the fight, he comes off very well there indeed. And Fergus has to go back into the doldrums, find himself some more armor and health whilst we see Patrick do the same. But because he's got the biggest stack, he can reward himself with the juiciest of armors, that red armor. 200 armor for you if you pick it up, and a 75% protection. In fact, to use all of the armor, you only need 50 health to do that, so that is, uh, that's, that's a very strong situation to be in, having that red. And right now, that's initially what we saw. We saw that engagement take place. There was no frag, but Patrick's come off ahead here because his armor and his health situation, even if he's uh, equal in the numbers, Fergus is not going to be as protected because he's going to be sitting on that yellow at the moment. So Patrick doing a smart thing here, trying to fight on top of the red, but it's actually Fergus who displaces him, able to take a lot of damage in there, but the uh, lightning gun switch there does the, the work for Patrick. It's a great switch up. That really, really hurt Fergus. He's going to go down, and he's going to be caught off the spawn here, but this is good for Fergus, actually, because Patrick was still a little bit weak here. He took a bit of damage from that last fight, but still, Patrick has a very good amount of damage output there, and despite going down, despite Fergus equalizing, Fergus is in a lot of trouble here. He's got to find himself a way to stack back up before he is found by his opponents, before Patrick gets himself in on top of him with those rockets, which are very, very deadly. And the rockets are fairly forgiving again in this game because the, the splash damage is so, so crazy. It allows you, you know, if you don't have the best precision in the world, you just have to catch your, I mean, you can be smart. You can make up for it. You can mitigate that by being intelligent, having a, a good position, catching your opponent in a choke point, knowing how they're going to move in the map. Then, you know, you don't have to have good aim at that point. You just have to, you've restricted their options so much that the aiming does itself for you. So see if uh, Fergus can find something here. He has managed to stack himself back up fairly sufficiently. Again, he's on that yellow. So even if he... Uh, even if he takes a fight with somewhat even numbers on the health and armor, if his opponent has that red, which Patrick does, he is quite a bit stronger in this fight. And Patrick has shown some good work with the lightning gun too, so this is quite dangerous. You can see Fergus locking him out of this choke point at the moment. And you can see that Patrick taking a lot of damage. Fergus actually trying to take the fight through the choke point, thinks that he smells weakness, but instead the lightning gun switch proves too strong. Very nicely done from Patrick. That lightning gun so deadly if you walk into a stream. We get a frag straight back here. And this is actually looking pretty good for uh, Fergus ultimately. I feel as though he's come back a little bit. He was very far behind on the health and the armor, but now he's equalized. All he needs to just even the field completely is get himself a red armor. But this is great, great killer instinct here from Patrick. Just going in before there's a chance for Fergus to really get himself back together again as far as the stack is concerned, which really does put Fergus in a very poor position currently. And it's going to take quite some wizardry to get himself back into a position where he can even entertain the idea of an engagement. We'll have to see if Patrick can find him. The, the clock is really on in that sense. Patrick has that window. Trying to use the sounds as best as they can. The sounds won't be required there. The positioning does it in center map. Patrick will catch a glimpse of Fergus there. And once again, by the lower levels, now Patrick has to guess which way is his opponent going to go because you also want to make sure you guess correctly there because if you try to cut your opponent off and you leave, let's say, a path clear to the red armor when it's spawning, then of course you give that armor away and you've actually allowed your, your opponent to come back into it and even things up. 
It does appear that Fergus uh, is going to take the fight here in the centre map and taking some rockets in, but once again the lightning gun, very powerful, and, and it's something we haven't seen used too, too much just yet, but it's so good. Lightning gun switch comes in, great aim coming in from Patrick as well. That's very strong damage, and he's going to net himself another kill. That's beautiful stuff from Patrick. Now he's in that, that kind of dangerous window where he's very low, but it's all on his opponent to catch him in this position, and Fergus, he's desperately going to be trying to do so, but... And it looks like Patrick might bring the fight to him. That's beautiful stuff for Fergus. If only he could just get one rocket to connect, he may have gotten a kill there. He really needs to get this frag immediately. He can't allow Patrick to stack back up, and there it is. Gets the frag straight back. But we have to look at the scoreboard here. Four to three. That is still a frag advantage there for uh, Mr. Patrick. So it's going to be a situation where Fergus is now fairly behind. It's been pretty close affair so far, but Patrick is looking pretty good to take this one. If he can just keep Fergus at arm's length and not take some nasty rockets to the face, he should be good for this one, but it's still very on here for Fergus. One thing that has been quite encouraging from my perspective about Patrick's play is that use of the lightning gun. It, it just put, it knocks you around so much, it does so much damage, and here it is, the lightning gun, a good vantage point for that. It can be quite difficult to aim, just you know, when you're aiming with that verticality, trying to hit the players below you, trying to track can be quite difficult in those circumstances, and it doesn't really matter too much for Patrick, all he has to do is just stay alive, keep his opponent in a spot where he's taking so much damage all the time that he's never in a position to close a fight where he can actually win that fight. And he's going to be put into a position eventually where he's going to have to take a very bad fight for himself because it's, there's no time left. The time becomes the issue. And that's kind of where Patrick's at right now as far as the game plan is concerned. And that's it. Here we go. Fergus gets a great damage in there. This is very problematic. If Fergus is able to get the kill in the next 30 seconds and then force overtime, he actually has... That's a big reset button for him. If he can get that, there is a really a chance here for a comeback. You see Patrick trying to escape there. He's got 20 seconds to try to get out of harm's way. Oh my god, it's looking really close here. Fergus is getting very close now. And it looks like we get the Dukes here from his opponent, Patrick, managing to find a way to safety. 10 seconds for Fergus to try to find Patrick. Where on earth has he gotten to? Oh, just spotted for a glimpse there. Looks like he's going to give up his position, trying to actually do damage. And Patrick just needs to survive, but in the last second, we're going to get the overtime here. Four to four. And Fergus has hit that reset button. He does need the red armor, but oh, not being able to pick this up, that's a very big deal. Good drop coming in from Patrick, and he will finish Fergus off. That was so critical to drop in on the red at that point. If he was not able to do that, we had a really realistic spot for Fergus for uh, to actually take the lead for the first time in perhaps, I think, the entire match. I think he's always been a little bit behind, actually, so that could have been the moment, but instead it will not be. Alas, it will be... For Patrick, he's looking quite good, standing strong here in the high ground. Not able to get too much from that engagement, but as he maintains this position high up, he's still able to have a good position to drop onto the red, although he will ignore the red. Perhaps he does not deem it necessary. The green armor cannot be picked up because he's already got too much armor. Again, the green armor really sucks. It doesn't give you almost any protection. So it's almost worthless anyway, which is uh, fine. But it looks like Fergus actually pushing the issue there, finding a couple good rockets and then realizing that he could push the issue close down the kill. Five to five, and now we're in an interesting situation here because Fergus could very legitimately, after having a very bad start, actually bring himself back into this one. Patrick trying to resort to the lightning gun. It's been so good to him previously. Pulls out the super nail gun, the quick switch there to the rockets will do the damage there to claim the kill, and Patrick takes the lead once again, but we can't count Fergus out just yet. He's got himself that full stack off the spawning. Going back in here with those rockets, trying to find himself. Patrick, oh, great connection. Good chunky bit of damage there, enough to finish off Patrick, who was in a weakened state. And Patrick would have loved to have done a lot more damage in that situation, actually, to leave Fergus much weaker than he is. Fergus can quite easily stack himself back up from this position and bring himself again into that, sp that spot where maybe he can actually be playing from ahead. And again, he has just a little bit too much red armor to be able to pick up the yellow. If you are confused as to why he can't grab that yellow, the mega he could have grabbed, but again, he already has quite a lot of health, so doesn't need it necessarily just yet. Although he's leaving that up potentially for Patrick to take. Now Patrick's kind of in a uh, bad position here. He can't easily get out of this area. Fergus, though, doesn't look too interested in taking the fight. He's going to go back to the uh, red path. No. Back to the green there, seeing if he can find something more. And again, we have Patrick now just completely silent on the map. <coughs> which really leaves Fergus in the dark. Where is Patrick? And Patrick's in a spot as well where, again, 
he can essentially just run the clock down, get another overtime in there. If he doesn't feel like he can take an engagement, <coughs> that's a very good strategy to go for. <coughs> Again, it's kind of, it can be somewhat of a reset button, getting <coughs> that extra time, not being pressured <coughs> to have to force an engagement which you're not equipped to have to, uh, to deal with is a very a good position to be, uh, or to find yourself uh, in after being in such a terrible spot. And that looks like it might be the case. He's, he's even stacked up a decent amount. So Patrick could even try to take a fight, but at this point, again, it's, there is risk involved because his opponent is likely quite stacked as well. And look at this, Patrick even gonna be able to steal away a red. That's beautiful work. And now he's likely in an advantage on the health and the armor. So these next rockets could really set the tone or even be, decisive as to who is going to win this one. Whoever can connect, have a better uh, engagement with these rockets in LG. Izzy Patrick has been going to a much more than Fergus. Great defensive rockets coming in though. Fergus able to keep Patrick at arm's length for the time being. And in fact, trying to go in for the finishing blows there. Lovely stuff in fact. Fergus able to understand just how much damage he's done. And that's another thing about this game. You've got to have a really good sense for how much stack your opponents on because it really informs your decisions as to whether you want to push in for the engagement or, or whether you want to back off and whether you're too at risk if you take that engagement whether you can get a better one later on in the line it looks as though we might we have a really good situation for Fergus he's actually taking the lead here this is kind of crazy finally it's only taken him a couple over times but he's getting there let's see if uh, Patrick can bring himself back into this one it's going to be quite tough indeed Fergus is sitting on a 200-200 stack that red armor is so, so awesome. Once again, seeing if those sound cues can give away some positioning here. And it looks like Patrick's gonna find Fergus in the lower level once again. Great rockets from Fergus. It's as though he was born with a rocket launcher in his hands. That is just three direct rockets. That looks pretty insane, actually, to be honest. And Fergus is going to decisively take the advantage here. Picks up a red as well as he fades back and away. But, uh, Patrick is trying to get something done here, but it's very difficult considering the amount of stack that Fergus has. And you can see that Patrick, the desperation setting in there. He knew he had to make something work, but trying to force the engagement in that spot allowed Fergus some easy rockets. He closed it down. And I think we're seeing some clutch play here from Fergus. I mean, he was down in regular time, managed to bring it into an overtime, just barely survived, just barely long enough to bring himself into a good engagement to take the lead. And here we are, nine to six, he has three frags on Patrick. There's one minute to find those three frags here, that's uh, to recover that deficit for Patrick. And this is engagement where it all starts. Good first rocket there to open up the engagement, goes close quarters with this one. Very nicely done for Patrick, but he's in a spot where the time is really on. 40 seconds to get two more kills, and he has to, once again, just land flawless rockets, as we saw Fergus do, to actually give himself this advantage of these two frags that we're seeing currently. And Looks like Fergus is evading him for the time being, actually bringing the fight to Patrick, actually. Fergus could try to set his lead. I like, I respect that he's getting a bit aggressive here, trying to take the fight to Patrick, trying to push him out of position. In fact, uh, dropping down, Patrick will, in fact, be able to be successful in this pursuit, catching Fergus by the green, and that's going to be the frag for him, but he's got 10 seconds to find the last one to equalize, and he doesn't have any health or armor to really do it with. That green, again, is fairly worthless, and Fergus is just sitting on the top of the map, and he is looking really, he must be so happy right now, Nine to eight, Fergus somehow steals this one away. Let's hear it one more time for both our competitors. Congratulations, Patrick. Thank you for a great match. If you guys want to shake hands, you are welcome to. <laughs> and then, Fergus, if we can bring you up here for an interview really quick. If you join me back up here, Fergus, come on and hang out with me. We got to ask you a little bit about your match. Patrick, thank you so much. You're welcome to head backstage. Now, uh, you know, a lot of fans of competitive gameplay or even sports will say, oh, that was a good match because it was very close. It was fun to watch. Yeah. But as a competitor, I would think a good match is one that's a little less close. How did you feel about that? Was it a good match? No, it was a good match. No, I mean, when they're close, that's when it's fun. I mean, even I think when you're, when you're playing a game, if it's too far away, it's not fun. <laughs> so, yeah. So, no, it was a lot of, I'm very surprised that I won. So, I think it was, it was a lot more luck in there than skill. What was as you expected in that match and what surprised you in that match? Uh, I was actually surprised that, uh, well, I was pretty surprised that I got that, that last kill on the one second thing to keep it going. But, um, but other than that, no, I, I, would, I think just I did better this year knowing where armor was and all that kind of stuff. I was, I was, last year I wasn't, I wasn't understanding the map at all, so I think I did that better this year. So are you going into the next round with a little more confidence, you think? Uh, well, so yes, other than I, I, the people in the next round are 
are much better than me. Is there anyone you're particularly, you know, looking at as someone you're you're afraid to face or someone you're excited to play? Well, I, actually, I was I was hoping that Matt Fryer would make it to the second round so that I could kill him, but he, he lost out. So. <laughs> Too bad. Well, you will move forward. Thanks again, Fergus. Go ahead and head backstage. And Dan, we're ready to get into our next match. Who are we going to see now? So we have Jeff Kaplan coming up. Sorry, Jeff Kaplan. That's not right. We've got Randy Pitchford and Kate Edwards coming up very shortly to uh, face off. And that's actually a rematch, uh, interestingly. And uh, I think last time it was actually fairly close. I think Kate did actually very, very well. And uh, so I'm curious to see if she's going to come back with some, you know, some, some fires, you know, been practicing really hard. Again, there has been ample opportunity for these uh, the contestants to practice. So it's cool to see, you know, those who have been putting the time in. I mean, as Fergus said, he looked pretty comfortable with the map there, which is a good improvement for him. Definitely. And I'm actually, I'm being told in my ear that we don't have Randy backstage. So Randy. Andy, if you're listening, it's time for you to come play. Kate is ready, so go ahead. Ah, oh, there he is. We've found him. Congratulations, us. All right, awesome. Well, as Randy takes the stage, as you mentioned, this is a rematch. Those are always fun. I don't know if we could go so far as to call it a grudge match, but I was talking to Kate backstage. She was saying, you know, it wasn't a stomp last time. I was almost coming back at the end, but I didn't quite make it, so maybe this is her redemption story. Absolutely, and, and one question for me is actually, how much help is Randy be getting from Fatality this time? Right, because last time, I know Fatality was giving him some, uh, some pointers, and it definitely you know, helped him out. And I think that may have been what probably made the difference, because it was otherwise fairly close. So I'm looking forward to seeing you know, if Randy's going to be coming into, like, into this with pretty insane shape. Mm -hmm. Because we've already saw you know, Niccolo Maisto, he had the help from Sturmey. Clearly, that was quite helpful, because he looked pretty, pretty damn good. He might be uh, a guy that might go all the way to the end. We'll have to see. So I'm hoping that we'll see from Randy potentially that you know, he might be looking in the shape that he could actually maybe win because we have a very good field of competitors this time. It looks a lot more competitive than last year. Yeah, speaking of that field of competitors, before we get into interviews with the players, let's take one more look at the bracket as we're going into this next match. As you can see, we are going to see Randy Pitchford against Kate Edwards. The winner of that will go on to face the winner between Ted Price and David Wood. We have yet to see that match. But in that same round, they're going to be facing up against Sean Dunn and Fergus Urquhart, both very formidable opponents, as we've seen. Yeah, I, th I think Sean is going to be able to make it through. And, and that's the, kind of the storyline that I want for this because, of course, you know, he has the trophy. It's no fun if he goes, goes out too early. So we need to see, you know, get, get the most out of Sean as we can. And, uh, but I think, like, the bottom side is really where things look kind of insane for me. And we've got, we've got Tim, Min Kim, you know, Nick versus, um, versus Jeff. So it's going to be absolutely nuts, I think. But it looks like I think uh, the players are ready. I think they, are they starting already or...? It looks like we, uh, I think we have time for an interview. So let's okay, go cool. chat with them Good really stuff. quick before we get started. I'm going to go over here and talk to Randy, who has a very stage appropriate shirt. I love that sparkle. If you, uh, are you busy? Can you come join me over here for an interview real quick? You, uh, you actually were known backstage. Someone was saying, I remember he was wearing a really cool shirt last time. That I'd was like me, to get by a the shirt way. like Randy. Are you kind of the fashion icon of the tournament, would you say? My wife dresses me, so it's whatever, whatever she says. It looks very nice on stage. Give her my compliments. A little bit of little bit of bling action going exactly on. well tell us a little bit about how you're feeling about competing in this tournament how's your quake well i i love uh first person shooters and i love playing games and i love competition i haven't played quake since last year <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how this goes i just noticed that we're playing a map that I, I, it looks to me like a quake 3 map yep. but it's being it's been ported to quake 1 i guess so or quake world so this will be a lot of fun Surprise, here we go. <laughs> Let's so do this. did you, you haven't done any special practicing. Uh, Dan was asking if you had had any coaching or anything like that. I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the worst? <laughs> Jobs always getting in the way of video games. That's right, that's right. <laughs> well, we'll let you get uh, prepared for your game. Thank you very much, Randy. Over to you, Dan. Okay, so, I mean, you played Randy last time. I feel like, I feel like you, you should have won that one. I mean, how do you feel about it? You, you have essentially the rematch. Well, of course I should have won that one. That's a given, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, like Randy, I've not played since last year, so it's going to be rusty, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I'm also an FPS fan, so uh, it's kind of my genre, but uh, we'll see, we'll see how it works out. I mean, I'm not much of a Quake person, but we'll see how it works. So you comfortable with the map then? Are you familiar with it? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Okay, so you're not a Quake person, so what, what, are, what kind of person are you from an FPS perspective then? Uh, definitely Halo. Yeah, I worked on three of the Halo games, I'm a Halo geek, I've played countless days of Halo multiplayer, so yeah. That's my game. Awesome. Well, I think uh, I, I feel good. I feel good about this one for you. I think uh, I think Randy. I mean, we, we have this humble thing going on again and again, but I'm, I'm liking your chances better. Although I said that about the last person on this side of the stage, so maybe this side of the stage is cursed. I don't know. I hope not for your sake. But uh, thank you very much. You feeling ready? I'm ready. Yep, I'm good. 
All right, Anna, let's, uh, let's get this one started. Let's do it. All right. Well, uh, Dan, I'll meet you in the center of the stage. We have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about this match while our players get ready. We'll get confirmation from them. But, you know, you mentioned that side of the stage hasn't been doing very well. I'm not, gonna, I'm not calling any kind of shenanigans, but maybe there is some unluckiness going on over there? It could be. The only time we had you know, very decent success was you know, Tim Willis. But, again, it almost looks like Tim Willis rigged this. I don't, you know, I don't know if that's... I don't know anything, right? But, but we got his map. It's... As you know, Randy said, he, he had some confusion there. It's, it's DM6, but from a different Quake. So <laughs> it's, a, it's quite an interesting dynamic that we have going on here. I mean, we're trying to like, stick to the nostalgia, stick to the classics, and you know, give that kind of authentic, nostalgic Quake, quake feeling. And I think it's been working so far, but hopefully th there are no curses. Mm -hmm. It's early days. Yeah, well, tell us a little bit about that for people who maybe aren't as familiar with Quake. When you say, you know, I, this map and that map, or this is from this game, or it's the port, blah, blah, blah. you know, if someone's unfamiliar with all of that terminology, tell them what that means, that we've changed this map and that we're using this map. So again, essentially for the, the true nostalgic feeling to be as nostalgic as possible, and to have as Quake a feeling as possible, one of the quintessential Quake 3 maps, of course this is Quake 1, but one of the quintessential Quake 3 maps, which is really where you know, eSports, I think, really uh, came into to being known, I think, from an FPS situation, you had you know, Counter-Strike and Quake. Those are the two classics from an FPS perspective. Um, this is Quake 3, a Quake 3 map. We took it back into Quake 1, because we wanted to make it as, you know, to feel as old as possible, because all these guys grew up playing Quake 1, but we wanted to have that eSports feel. So we gave, we put you know, Quake 3 in there. So we took Quake 3 from, Quake, well, uh, Quake 3 map from Quake 3, put it into Quake 1. It's basically what a port is. Pretty, pretty simple stuff. I think people are liking it so far. And I think these two are going to like it. They look pretty ready, look like they're ready to get into the game. So will Kate be able to break the curse of stage left? We will find out. Let's get right into the game now, Dan. All right, so let's have our players ready up, and we'll kick this one off, and I will disappear once again. OK, so the countdown has begun. And can Kate get revenge? That's the storyline. That's the question for me. Has Randy been practicing as well? That's the question for me. I mean, he said he hasn't, but you never know with these guys, right? Might be sandbagging a little bit. We'll have to see if any of that uh, business goes on. But already we can see... Uh, oh, okay. Kate's going to get Randy just dropping straight in on top. And that's going to be an escape made by Randy. He's going to get out of there trying to escape the damage, but it's not working out too well. Realizes finally he should probably shoot some rockets back and does do some decent damage here to Kate, who is hot on pursuit, but it does look as though Randy will escape. And I respect that. He worked really hard to try to escape there. Eventually got away from the clutches of Kate, and that's going to be a little bit annoying for Kate. I mean, she had a good, uh, a good chance to get some serious damage there. But to be honest, she did give herself a good spot to have good positioning for the next red armor. It was really important. She did enough damage to sort of disincentivize Randy in wanting to take an engagement, which gave Kate the ability to, to pick and choose her position on the map. And speaking of which, we have a better positioning here coming in from Randy, just bouncing Kate with the rockets. And that is a very savage finish there from, from Randy. And that is going to put Kate behind one frag. So Randy with an early lead now. And it all looks so good at the start for Kate. And unfortunately for her, even though she starts uh, at the red armor, Again, you spawn with the full red and the full mega, so you don't need, to, you can't pick it up just yet. But it is good to know about because you can kind of position yourself around that f uh, during the next fight and try to pick it up in the middle of the fight and kind of effectively raising your your health and armor situation to better your chances in winning that fight and, and ultimately, in case situation, bring us you know, one step closer to to coming back, one step closer to getting revenge on Randy. And this is a much slower map than the one we had last year, which was Aerowalk, which is another kind of you know, classic, qu uh, quintessential one versus one Quake 3 map, even though it did, uh, I think its inception was actually in uh, Quake 1. So we've got just a silence here right, right now as we have both players trying to figure out exactly what's going on. And Quake is a battle of deduction in many senses. You see so much on the map, you see a lack of certain things on the map, like armors that have been taken or armors that have been left up, and it gives you all this information as to how to find your opponent and how to position around them to try to get that best fight going for yourself to get that frag. And just a glimpse, I think, spotted there of Randy. Let's see if uh, Kate notices that. Randy is fairly close, but likewise, will Randy spot Kate here? And it's interesting, you know, the position of Kate's taking it's just more unconventional positions, but it, it kind of works, actually, because Randy's going to have a full stack right now, and so does Kate, meaning that Kate is going to be able to 
take more unconventional spots because there's no reason for her to try to go and take items or have position on items because she already has everything. That said, looks like a good position for Randy. He's fighting on the red arm. We talked about this is very good, but it does come down to hitting the rockets and it's going to be Randy hitting himself with a rocket and that's going to be a very close fight. That's going to equalize, but Kate is in a, a real trouble here because the red's not spawning for a little while. It was just taken in the middle of that fight and she's going to be very low and Randy's going to just drop in and take Kate down there with just one rocket. Again, she was very weak after that last fight. And so now Randy is uh, going to have a decisive position to work his lead from. That 1-0, he's got the Mega as well. So where is Kate? That's the question now. And the way that she's been moving around the map as well, that's something that you know, Randy has to understand over time. You know, what kind of player is Kate? You know, how does she want to maneuver herself you know, around the map? And what kind of positions does she like to take around the map to try to get those fights happening? You can see right now Randy's just trying to occupy center map. And it's a good position to have. We saw other players trying to use that spot. And that spot is really good to allow you to basically get to everywhere on the map quite quickly. And of course, you have the ability to see the most as well. And you have quick access to the high ground. Generally, that makes it a good position to maintain. And you can see once again, Randy just cycling around the red arm. And <laughs> once again, where is Kate? The question. That, does, that is the question. Where is Kate? And he has the lead right now. So the, Randy doesn't really have to do anything necessarily. He just has to hold his lead. That's you know, one perfectly uh, operational strategy. And here he goes. Finds Kate pushing into the red arm. Great rockets connected here from Randy. Trying to keep the pressure up. Just st like sticking to his position here. I like this from Randy. Just holding his ground. Allowing Kate to come back to him. The rockets do the job. And that is a 2 0 lead there for Randy. So he's looking really good at the moment. And Kate is going to have uh, quite some problems bringing himself back into this one. Just to bust out all the Halo skills. If she wants to take Randy down. And <laughs> Randy's going to be able to just knock her around there by the pillars. And that will be a suicide as well. So another minus one. I've seen quite a few minus ones. And again, as I explained previously, the Rockets do so much splash damage in this game. You can't, you can't even blame anybody for, for the suicides. I mean, in a lot of other games, it can be sort of like a humiliation type factor. But in Quake World, I mean, the Rockets just do so much splash damage. It's, uh, no, no one really cares too much. It's not really that embarrassing, I wouldn't say. Either way, what could be embarrassing potentially for Kate is is uh, losing to Randy because it look, she looked pretty confident there going into this one that she could do better than last year. And so far, Randy has looked very confident in just running the map at the moment. And Kate has not been taking too many engagements. And this does allow Randy a lot of time to stack back up and to try to create a situation where he gets that efficient engagement and kind of gets to pick and choose where he wants to fight and how he wants to do it. And that allows him to be in the driving seat, which is not where Kate wants him to be at the moment, of course. <coughs> I love the classic jump, pound, p jump pad sounds that we had. The kind of lift, the air lift, even. There's another red armor there for Randy, looking good on the stack. There's a minute left to play for. And Randy's looking quite strong, and in quite a strong position to actually just take this one. And again, the loser will be eliminated. It is single elimination, best of one. And there's 55 seconds left on the clock here for Kate to get herself some frags, some redemption perhaps. And this used to be the area in Quake 3 where there was a rocket, uh, uh, rather a railgun. And uh, there is no railgun. There's no kind of long-range hit scan type weapon in Quake World. You have the rockets, you have the, the lightning gun, and that's, that's your lot. As far as highly impactful weapons go, that is by far the most effective couple choices you have. A prediction weapon. And I mean, to be fair, the, the rocket launcher... It is so fast how, how quick the, the rockets travel through the air in this game. It's almost as though it, is, it could be a railgun at certain points. But it does look like Randy can't quite find Kate here, but it's fine. Again, all he needs to do is hold on to his lead, and that's exactly what he's doing. Ten seconds left. It does look as though Randy is going to close this one down, and he will be moving forwards in the tournament as we count down the dying seconds. And there it is. Two to minus one. Randy is going to be taking it. Congratulations to both our competitors. A well-fought rematch. Thank you so much, Kate. We appreciate you coming. Go ahead and step backstage. And Randy, if you don't mind, join me right here. We're going to hear your thoughts on that match.
How do you feel? You came in, you said you hadn't really practiced much. You seem to do pretty well. Is your new strategy don't practice or? Well, the only thing I was relying on was just old school twitch skill. Like I, and even that I was, I wasn't the best performance, but I was able to get a couple of good juggles in there. And, and uh, it was a really interesting match because uh, it wasn't a very kinetic match. We were spending most of the time, I was spending most of the time basically kind of paying attention to the environment and basically trying to avoid combat. I was just trying to run away as much as possible. <laughs> well, you've been in this position before. You've moved forward in our tournament before. And we do have some of the players from last year who performed very well also in the bracket. Is there anyone that you're kind of like setting your sights on? If I can beat them, I can move forward? Well, I have no hope of winning the tournament. But, uh, I mean, Tim Willits is in the house. I mean, he, he works at id Software. He's, you know, one of the founders of the first-person shooter genre working on, on Quake. So... Uh, it's uh, it's gonna be. I, ho I hope I get a chance to play with Tim. Uh, Tim's awesome. You guys are so funny. Every single person on the stage. Oh, I'm not that good. I'm not gonna do very well. This modesty thing. Can you explain this modesty modesty strategy that we're seeing? I, I think it's sincere. I mean, every uh, one of the cool things about Dice is like all the people in this tournament are these, these are the heads of state of game development, and uh, you know all of us live our lives around games, but we spend a lot of time creating games, and some of us have kind of let go of the competition and celebrate uh, creativity and. Uh, so not all of us are spending a lot of time playing competitive games. And Quake, I mean, I, I, I spent, I can't even imagine how many uncountable hours playing Quake back in the day, but it's been a long time. We're all playing the latest, greatest, newest stuff right now, so. Well, it's fun to watch you guys take this return yeah. to the competitive, and we wish you best of luck as you move forward in the tournament. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you. And uh, Dan, what's up next? So we have uh, Ted Price and David Wood coming up next, and that's going to be the last of the round of 16 matches, I do believe. We've come a, come a long way today, actually. We certainly have. We've been flying by, and it is interesting to see, actually, you know, Randy's performance here, because, I mean, again, he's, he's pretty good. Again, he, as he said, he's relying on the, the Twitch aim, but I, I liked what he described there as well, just you know, trying to listen to his environment. I like that idea, because you know, as, a, as a gamer, when, you're, when things are, it's not always about the high-octane action. Sometimes it's about kind of dialing into the intensity that is the silence and not knowing like where the hell your opponent is and just thinking that they could be around any other corner and just listening for that first sound cue to like give you the mark to kind of go to that direction. So, so it's, you know, that's another facet which is, which is awesome, I think. It's been really fun to watch. And speaking of who's up next, I'm actually just being told we do have a sub. We have someone coming ah. in. So let's take a look at our bracket right now. It looks like our final match in this round is going to be Ted Price versus Claudio Tapia. Now... Do you know anything about Claudio? I do not, but I suppose we'll find out very shortly. We certainly will. Let's, uh, let's see if we can have a little chat with our competitors right now. I'm going to go over here and talk to Ted. Ted, do you have a moment to speak to me over here? Oh, sure. Awesome. Come on and join me. Looks like you're getting your settings all ready. Now, uh, Ted, coming into this competition, how familiar are you with Quake? How well do you think you're going to perform? I think I'm going to win everything, pretty much. Yes, that's what I like to hear. See, I've been I looking for this you, trash talk. I heard you talking to Randy earlier, and he was saying how it, uh, you were saying how it's strange how developers are so humble. I think I'm going to win it. Great. I'm, awesome. I'm just kidding. I'm terrible. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I played, I played a ton a uh, long time ago, back when my company, Insomniac, was working next door to Naughty Dog. And uh, one of my good friends is Jason Rubin, who, who's here. We just did a talk earlier today. And we were reminiscing about how at night we would shut down all the PCs, other than the PCs we were playing Quake on. We would go different rooms and play against each other as companies. So Quake was always our go-to game. However, that was uh, 15 years ago, so my fingers don't move as fast anymore. And are you representing your company now? Are they cheering you on? That's a good question, I hope. Hey, Insomniac, if you're out there, I'm representing you. So I better, better not, I better not lose, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So what's going to be your strategy? What, what are you leaning on in terms of skill? What's your thing that you can maybe rely on? Skill, let's see. How about use the rocket launcher as much as possible and uh, get the armor? From what I can tell, that's a really good strategy. Yeah, I've, I've watched a few people play, and that's what they do. <laughs> Winners do that. Yeah. All right, well, we'll let you get ready for your match. Thank, Thank you very much. And over to you, Dan. I'm here with Claudio. So, uh, again, you're the stand-in. You're our hero in time of need. Yeah. And uh, you know, why don't you introduce uh, yourself to, to people? And uh, also, I want to know, when did you last play Quake? Um, I last played Quake in the 90s, unfortunately. Uh, but I played other Quake Engine games. I'm representing the Academy. I'm the project manager for the Academy and uh, stepping in. All right, well, it's, it's great to see that you're here. Uh, again, I'm ready to you know, answer the call. Uh, is, is Quake a game is, or a series that uh, you've been following for a long time or is you more of a, is, is, are other games you know, more important for you in the FPS genre? 
No, I definitely like the series. I uh, watch QuakeCon every year. It's something that's important to me. Awesome. Do you follow the competition in QuakeCon? Yeah, I do. Do you have a favorite player? Um, I couldn't say I have a favorite one. I don't follow it at all throughout the year, so I don't, I'm not that familiar with all the players, but uh, during the tournament, I do watch. That's awesome to hear. So Quake fans, always welcome, of course, and I hope you're, you're going to be doing well. Do you feel prepared for this? Uh, no, not quite. <laughs> As a stand-in, I didn't have much of a chance to prepare. Well, we, we had that from Sean Dunn last time, and he won. So I'll, I'll let you get, uh, get to it, get to your station, and uh, get set up. And uh, again, Anna, we, we never really know, do we? <laughs> we never really know. <laughs> well, it looks like Ted is pretty close to ready. Claudio is working on getting ready, so we'll wait for the signal from him. But as soon as we do, we can get right into this match. And as we move forward, we have more matches tomorrow, right? Tell me a little bit about what's going on then. So tomorrow we have, uh, of course, all, as you guys can see behind us, you know, those of you in the audience, we have the wonderful brackets. And this is when things get really serious. I mean, we've got, I mean just to go over the, some of the matchups we have, starting from the bottom, because I think that's, for me, where it's, it's uh, particularly interesting. We've got Jeffrey Kaplan versus Nicolo Maisto. So or, already, I think those are two of the strongest players. And then and right above them, we've got Tim Willits. Again, he kind of a big deal when it comes to Quake, as already highlighted. And he's going to be playing against Min Kim. And then, again, just that, that lower bracket alone for me is quite exciting. And we're going to be going through for basically everything. Like, we're going to go right to the end. We're going to crown another champion. Will Sean be able to defend his title? Will someone be stealing it away? I think, I think that's uh, the latter, and there's a good chance for that. Well, it looks like we have both players ready now. Can I get a thumbs up? Thumbs up and thumbs up. All right, it looks like both our players are ready. Dan, take us into the game. Excellent. So we'll get uh, everybody readied up, and I will disappear once again to the back, where I will commentate the game and take you through some Quake World. Excellent. So here we go. Seven minutes of DM6. Quake 3 DM6, no less. There is a DM6 of Quake 1, I can't stress that enough. Also, <laughs> classic Quake 1 dual map, but we won't get into that just yet. We have Ted Price's perspective currently on screen. Let's see who gets those, uh, those good rockets off to begin with, because that can really set the tone of how things go. Claudio there in the distance, as we can see. There's some uh, good damage there. We can see it can be quite annoying to deal with those pillars. And Claudio, wow, I don't think he expected Ted Price to come in, but he turns around and smacks Ted Price down with his rockets. That is a big problem here for, well actually, for Claudia to some extent. Again, there's that window of time where he's just on the green armor. He's gotta be careful, gotta make sure that Ted doesn't get the drop on him. But if he can do that and he's in the right area to do so, then he will be in good stead. And once again, you know, you never know where these stand is. And already I'm, I'm seeing some, you know, good movement here from, from Claudio in some of these fights. He really wants that red armor. You can see he was waiting for it as well, which shows some map awareness. And again, from a stand in, it's uh, pretty good to see because he didn't ha necessarily have the preparation time. But as uh, Claudia said, you know, he watches uh, uh, the, the QuakeCon tournaments every year. So that does give him some familiarity with uh, not only esports, but how to play some of these classic maps. And Quake 3 DM6 is uh, one of the most classic Quake 3 matches. And Quake 3 has been the, uh, the tournament of choice for forever at, at QuakeCon's almost at this point, well over a decade. So, so let's see if... Uh, we can get the advantage held on to by Claudio, whether Ted Price will be able to seal it away. Ted Price is in a fairly good position as far as his stack is concerned, just has to find a good position to get the fight started from. And already both players have exchanged good, well, like engagements as far as the accuracies are concerned. When the rockets are flying, we see some decent accuracy. Speaking of which, Ted Price opening things up with a fantastic initial shot. And Claudio's in trouble here, kind of just trying to desperately scramble his way out of there and is able to do so, but took so much damage. And that's exactly what Ted Price needs to do to try to get back into this one. Let's see if Ted can actually catch uh, Claudio, though. He's, he's going to be trying to just scramble to get that armor and health over by the other side of the map. And he knows it's up there at the moment. So Ted Price, can he work out exactly how to get to his opponent? That's the question. So far, that's not going to be the case. And one thing actually that we haven't seen yet is uh, in that center map area, you can actually effectively use rocket jumps to intercept your opponents. And that's uh, one thing we might start to see later into the competition. More usage of the rocket jumps, but for now we get engaged by center map. Claudio coming in, taking some very good rockets actually. Looks very problematic here for Ted. He's taking so much damage down to five and finished off with a nail gun no less. I think that might be the first nail gun frag we've had from our stand-in. Claudio, I respect that. Finishing off with the nails. And one thing, of course, uh, on, the, on the nail gun packs, you can see the, the Nine Inch Nails uh, logo, which is awesome. Again, Quake always had amazing music. 
So once again, a little bit quiet as both players try to work out exactly where everyone's coming from. Oh my goodness, that is a fact. Again, these rockets from Claudia just opening these fights up with the first rocket is so incredibly important. And you can see that, that that sends Ted into a position where he has to just fall all the way back and he can't take the engagement anymore, which really puts Claudio into the driving seat and, and allows him to basically, basically stand on the map wherever he wants, which means he gets his choice of next item, which, which is going to be the strongest one. Or he can choose to try to cut his opponent off. Maybe his opponent, assuming that he's going for the stronger item, because that gives Claudio the opportunity to cut him off. But instead, we have the fight over the red armor. And Ted, he didn't get the yellow. He's very, very low at this point. Claudio just needs one, one rocket. Doesn't even have to be that good. One rocket's all that, that will do it. The boomstick comes out here from Ted, and he's actually getting some good connections. But again, it doesn't do very much damage. He had lightning gun, but he didn't switch to it. And that could have been a the difference there for Ted is instead going to be Claudio with three to zero. And again, these stand-ins, you just don't know. It's looking really nice right now for Claudio. It's going to be pretty tough for Ted to work his way back into this one. He's got three minutes to do it, though, which is ample time to do so. But we'll see if uh, he's going to be able to deliver the goods. And looks like uh, they will just maybe discover each other. I mean, we saw a glimpse there of Ted. It looks like Claudio is not going to, to uh, notice him in any any respect there, just going to allow him to sit by the, uh, the yellow and the mega health and allow Ted to do his thing. But Ted is coming, and there he is with the rockets. Lightning gun comes out momentarily here from Claudio. Looks a little bit indecisive as to which weapon he wants to use. Speaking of which, same for Ted. The mouse scroll comes in as the lightning gun will find its way onto Claudio. There's so much damage, a prolonged engagement here. Axes coming out, boomsticks, shotguns, nail guns, everything is coming out in this one. And finally, once again, it is the nail gun that makes another appearance and the frag is had by Ted. So it's going to be possible now for Ted. If he's able to get, again, a fast engagement on this next one, he actually has a really realistic opportunity to make this work. Rockets come out. Claudio, unreturned damage here. Claudio needs to get something out of this. If this is a clean kill, that is very, very bad for Claudio indeed. And he will go down, but he did enough damage in the end. So it looks as though there is maybe a window here for Ted, but it's going to be really tough. You can see Claudio is in the vicinity as well. So here it is, just jumping about, trying to find the fight, and that's exactly what's going to happen here for Claudio. He cuts down Ted just in the nick of time before Ted can get to grips with the next armor, before he can get that health that he so desperately needed. And now Claudio looks like he's in a good position to actually take this one. A minute and a half is what remains, and we have a situation where the lightning gun comes out for Ted, but is it too little too late? A minute and a half to go here for the return kills to come into play for the return damage to just try to take control of the map, get the uh, armors. Can Claudio get there in time? Just barely getting the red in time. It's going to be looking quite good for him now as Ted Price is starting to run out of health and armor. And this is going to be pretty tense when that lightning gun comes up. Can't quite find the finishing blows there with that. Lightning gun back in for another chance of it, but Claudio denies. Five to three, looking like a very tough and potentially insurmountable uh, lead right now. We'll have to see whether that can be the case or not, as we have Ted looking to try anything at this point to get himself back in on top of his opponent, to get those kills coming in as quickly as possible, because there's only 35 seconds on the clock, and it's looking very, very tough indeed. 30 seconds now, and there's a very limited sign of the opponent. Can it happen here? Claudio just looking to hold on to this, gets himself the red armor, very, very important. And now that's going to be a very tough spot for his opponent to capitalize. Ted needs to get it done in 20 seconds. Two frags in 20 seconds. I don't know if that's going to be happening right now. We'll have to see whether or not that is going to be the case. But 10 seconds to go, and Claudio looks like he is going to be safe. And once again, despite Ted coming in at the last second here, might just get the frag, but there's no time for the follow-up. Holding the spawn, Claudio standing wins five to four. A big thank you to both of our players. A fantastic last match of the day. Claudio, come on up and join me. And thank you so much, Ted. It's been our pleasure. <laughs> now, Claudio, you, you came in. You, you didn't even know you were going to compete today, and now you've performed really well. To what do you attribute your success? Um, probably just a lot of history with the genre. Yeah, and what was your, your signature move? If you were to make a highlight reel of this match, what would have to be in it? Probably jumping when I shouldn't have jumped into damage. Well, you know, we've been joking about how this side of the stage is kind of the cursed side. There haven't been many winners on this side, so... You know, are you like usually a lucky person or do you think you can just overcome it with your skill? What, what, what made you the one that was able to overcome the curse? Maybe I'm the curse. 
Oh, that could be. Well, we'll see if you move forward in the bracket, moving forward. Is there anyone that you see up there that you're particularly nervous or excited to face? Well, the champ from last year and Tom Willits, of course. All right, well, I'm sorry. yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, let's uh, look forward to seeing you move forward in that uh, bracket. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your win. You can head backstage. And guys, that's going to wrap it up for us today. We have seen so many great matches, and don't worry, it's not over. We're going to have even more tomorrow. Don't forget to join us starting at 11 right here in this ballroom and on that stream. And we'll see you again very, very soon. Thank you so much for joining us and for watching. And now I'm handing it back over to Mike. Let's hear it for Mike, everyone. Hey guys, wow, what a crowded room. So, uh, round table start right now uh, in the Banyan Room across from the Dice Arcade. Don't forget the party tonight, uh, hosted by Streamline Studios, and tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. Look forward to seeing you there. Thank you.